attention of the Senate to material enclosed in a document entitled Royal Commissions and Omissions, what was left out of the report on the death of John Pat. The document was prepared by Ms Janine Purdy, who was employed as an investigations officer for the Royal Commission. The death of 16-year-old John Pat on the 28th of September 1983 in Roburn in Western Australia, more than any other, forced authorities to order the Royal Commission. Ms Purdy's document asks questions the Royal Commission failed to ask, presents evidence the Commission report failed to acknowledge and addresses the essential dilemma of Aboriginal people in relation to white colonial law. The report is a damning critique which highlights serious shortcomings of the Royal Commission and its failure to address the cry for justice from Aboriginal people who have been dying at the hands of lawful authorities and institutions for over 200 years. It is it has, yes, as well. It is an extremely enlightening and disturbing analysis of the process involved in at least one of the 99 deaths in custody over the eight and a half year period from January 1, 1980 to 31 May 1989. It is appropriate that this document receive consideration at a time when the response of governments to the final report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths is under discussion. Mr President, as it is a lengthy document and in order not to delay any further the program of the Senate, I seek leave to table it. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Order the question is that the Senate do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The Senate stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10 a.m. Continuing to... Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them the trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Petitions. Mr Clark. Petitions have been lodged for presentation by honourable senators as follows. By Senator Kemp from 155 petitioners requesting that Australia remain a constitutional monarchy with Her Majesty the Queen of Australia as the head of state. By Senator O'Chee from 67 petitioners requesting that the Senate take action to pass legislation to grant eligibility for the service pension to the British Commonwealth Occupation Force Japan. Terms of petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. 
there any notices of motion? Sen um, Senator Kerner. President, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate 1 congratulates the town of Roma on its achievement as Queensland's top recycling town. Two, congratulates the Queensland Government for the awarding of a record $467,000 in grants to local council recycling schemes. And three, notes the employment opportunities created in the recycling industry. Senator Sawada. Thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate A congratulates the State Electricity Commission of Victoria for undertaking the establishment of a large-scale wind farm in that state. B notes that this represents an important step in creating a renewable energy industry on a large scale. C requests the State Electricity Commission of Victoria to seriously consider Australian technologies when assessing tenders for the project. And D calls on the federal government to support research and development of Australian renewable energy technologies so that they may become commercially viable in the long term. Senator Lewis. Thank you, Mr President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate A notes that this week is Women's Recreation Week in South Australia, B encourages all women and girls to participate in recreational and sporting activities, acknowledging the benefits from participation for confidence and self-esteem and for mental and physical health, and C notes the continued imbalance in media reporting of women's recreation and sporting activities compared to men's and encourages media organisations to take a leading community role and make positive steps to overcome that imbalance and to break down the social barriers which prevent women and girls from higher levels of participation in recreation and sport. Uh, Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, the Senate notes the government's decision to exempt small business from the sales tax regime, and that the Senate disputes the government's ability to raise the required amount of money to fund such an exemption from improved audit of large sales tax payers. Senator Bernstein. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I give notice on, that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate A notes that this week is Women's Recreation Week in South Australia and B urges women of all ages and stages to participate in some sporting or recreational activity for their own benefit. Are there any further notices of motion? Senator Colston. President, on behalf of uh, Senator Crowley, I give notice that on the next day of sitting she shall move that the Senate acknowledges that the efforts of all those involved in organising the current World Women's Recreation Week in South Australia, B appreciates the benefits to women and girls of participation, of participation in sport and recreation at any stage and at any age for confidence building and good health, and C appreciates the recent increase in media coverage of women's sports and notes the significant impact of, of even this small coverage on the community's understanding of women and sport and the consequent encouragement to many more women and girls to get involved. Are there any further notices of motion? If not, I shall now proceed to the placing of business that decide to postpone or rearrange the business. If not, are there any documents to be tabled by ministers? Excuse Senator. me, Mr President. Senator At placing of business. Um, Mr President, I move that general business notice of motion number 758, standing in my name, relating to the filling of casual vacancies in the Senate by state parliaments, be postponed until Wednesday, 6 of May 1992. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any documents to be tabled by Minister Senator Evans? Yes, uh, Mr President. Uh, documents are tabled in accordance with the circuit to honourable senators and with the concurrence of the Senate. I ask that this be incorporated in hand, sir. Is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? I think. Um, uh, Senator Loosley. Uh, Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 790 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Loosley. Mr President, I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Panizza. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 789, standing in my name, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Panizza. Mr. President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Income Assessment Act 1936 to provide for an extension of the definition of isolated areas to include the seas situated in certain adjacent areas. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator President, Panizza. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 to provide for an extension of the definition of isolated areas to include the seas, adjacent to, the seas situated in certain adjacent areas. Senator Panizza. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. Mr. President, I table an explanatory memoranda for the bill. Senator Evans, will uh, you take the adjournment of the bill? Yeah, I'll move the adjournment. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Yeah. Senator Evans. Uh, Mr. President, I ask the Government Business Notice of Motion Number 1 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection. That's the four estimate. Yeah, I, want to, I, I would wish to make a comment on it, so perhaps if, if afterwards um, well, or now. By well, I, well, I move the motion standing in my name. So you can move it. Yeah. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection. Uh, well, I seek leave to make a comment before the, uh, the, uh, the vote is put, uh, Mr. President. I just simply wanted to say that, uh, that I know there's been some negotiation on this matter. Uh, there is a concern, however, on our side of the chamber that this might become a precedent. Uh, in the past, as you'd be aware, Mr. Mr. President, uh, there's been concern expressed as to whether three estimates committees, more than three estimates committees, could meet concurrently because of the difficulty with, with Hansard. I think that that, uh, that still, still exists. But over and above that, there is also the concern on this side of the chamber uh, that we have senators who have vital interests in more than one uh, area of, uh, of issue. Uh, and with too many estimates committees meeting at once, it makes it impossible for them to make their contribution during the estimate committee phase. The end result of that will be that they will see no alternative but to come back in here in the, the debate on the committee of the whole, which uh, is therefore counterproductive to the scheme of the estimates committees, which is to try and limit the debate on the whole in this place and have a, have a fulsome and useful uh, exchange during the committee, uh, committee stage. I simply wanted to put on the record, therefore, Mr President, that we would trust that uh, our agreement on this occasion to meet some special circumstances, as I understand it, relating to the program, uh, shouldn't be treated as a precedent. Uh, and in the future, we, we remain convinced that it would be in the interest of uh, sensible management of the business of this chamber if no more than three estimates committees met at any one time. The question is the motion moved by Senator Evans be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Calder. Uh, I move that uh, general business notice of motion number 791, standing in my name, be taken as formal. Uh, is there an is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes, there is objection. Senator Cobb. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, I move then contingent notice of motion number 28, uh, standing in my name, that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent a uh, debate on this matter forthwith. And um, bearing in mind that uh, this allows half an hour for debate on this matter with five minutes per, per speaker. I make the point uh, that uh, the Democrats are convinced, are convinced that there should be no further reductions in tariffs whatsoever while this country suffers from its very, very high rate of unemployment, a rate of unemployment which is increasing, a rate of unemployment which, if one looks at figures in the recent days, indicates that the long term, 
the long-term unemployment, those people who are absolutely desperate, those numbers are increasing and increasing uh, at a remarkably rapid rate. Now, if one were to accept for the moment the, uh, the argument which is put by both the government and the opposition that uh, tariff reduction will, Im will uh, improve the economy uh, in the longer term, if one were to accept that argument, then there may be some validity in tariff reduction, provided, provided that there were, there were other jobs available for those people who were displaced by the, uh, the reduction in tariffs and the closure of businesses, the large number of businesses that are simply collapsing all around the country since this uh, tariff reduction has been in place. But there are, those opportunities for alternative employment are not there, and it is totally unconscionable, unconscionable that both the government and the opposition should continue to proceed with tariff reductions at this time. Now, there has been a lot of uh, uh, debate in recent days as to whether there are differences between the government and the opposition in relation to uh, this matter of tariff reductions. And the, uh, the government, particularly uh, in the person of the Prime Minister, has been desperately attempting to indicate that there are differences between the government and the opposition. But uh, I note that uh, uh, most of the uh, commentators who have looked at the statements made by both sides very carefully have observed that there is no difference at all in, in government policy, that uh, what uh, Mr Keating is merely attempting to do is to create an impression, an impression that there is a difference. And of course, uh, Mr Houston himself uh, is well aware of this. this. And um, if I could quote from uh, um, a, a, a statement which appeared uh, in the um, Australian on uh, Friday, uh, Mr C uh, Houston said on ABC Radio last night that he did not believe the coalition's tariff policy was handicap handicapping it. Um, yeah, this was specifically in Wills because it was in the context of a very substantial program of reform over the rest of the decade. I make two points. One is that there, is really, there really isn't all that much difference between our two policies, that is the policies of the government and the policy of the opposition. We want to put it fairly and squarely on the record, Mr President, that at this time, with a million people over, uh, uh, unemployed, a growing number of unemployed, a very high unemployment rate among, uh, among the, uh, the young, uh, people who are, who are becoming permanently unemployable as a consequence of, uh, of the uh, policies of uh, tariff reduction and the consequent closure of businesses, that at this time it is absolutely unconscionable to blindly pursue this economic rationalist reduction in tariffs leading to, uh, to an exacerbation of that situation. It may be uh, reasonable to do it at a time when there is high and growing employment, but not at this stage. And we call on both the government and the opposition to reverse their positions in relation to uh, tariff reductions, to halt tariff reductions until there is a substantial turnaround in the employment opportunities in this country. The question is that standing orders be suspended. Those of that opinion, Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. President, um, uh, the Opposition will oppose the, the suspension. Uh, we oppose it because the, the argument put by um, Senator Coulter is so patently and obviously invalid. It's a terrifying thought uh, that the Democrats come here today, Mr. President, and argue that Australia return to, uh, to former policies when it should be so obvious to all that the further internationalisation of our economy uh, is in the best interests of creating jobs rather than, uh, rather than, uh, rather than ending, ending jobs. Well, Senator Coulter, we have a small economy and a small population. There are enormous markets and enormous opportunities out there for us, but we can't, we can't, have, it, we can't have it both ways. Australia is debating in the gap now, has been debating in the Uruguay round for 1986 for a reduction of international barriers not only in agriculture that's of particular importance to us, but in other areas, in the service industry, in intellectual property, in investment-related uh, investment opportunities, to give the chance to the Australian economy to expand internationally, to enable growth and jobs to be created. You can't have it both ways. You can't go to the GATT, you can't go internationally and, and argue that others should reduce barriers in order that we can have greater opportunity, whilst at the same time arguing that barriers that we have in this country should be, should be retained. 
Fortunately, the Australian Democrats seem to be the only political grouping in this country that still can't see that argument, and they're fairly irrelevant these days, uh, irrelevant these days in, in any event. What Australia needs to do is to act internationalise and seize the opportunities in those international markets, and we can't do that by maintaining barriers whilst at the same time arguing that others should reduce them to give us those opportunities. Now, I, mentioned, I mentioned agriculture, and you, you pointed to my colleague Senator Boswell. Senator Boswell knows the opportunities to Australian rice farmers when the market in Japan is opened, when the market in Korea is opened, and under the GATT proposals and the Dunkel proposition for Dunkel compromise, both would be open to give new opportunities for Australian agricultural producers. But you can't argue that they should be opened whilst at the same time arguing that Australian protection should be maintained. We found it in the debates uh, with the trade committee, bipartisan trade committee of this parliament that was sent to Europe last year. We found an appalling ignorance still within Europe, within France in particular, but other parts of Europe, a belief that uh, in fact the Democrat position reigned supreme and that there was a general view across Australian, uh, Australian government uh, and policy makers that tariffs should be maintained. Europe doesn't understand that there have already been reductions in, in industrial areas production in Australia. But they said to us, unless you're prepared to bring those barriers down, you can't expect the new opportunities that can be created in the international community. What Australia should rather be doing is concentrating upon increasing domestic efficiency. If we can be domestically efficient in our production, then we can be competitive. And that's what the whole coalition policy is all about. It's getting the cost of business down, particularly cutting the cost of government, getting the taxation burden off business. That's why we're advocating $20 billion a year off the price of business taxation so that business can be efficient again and so business can expand and can employ Australians. That's why, Mr. Mr. President, as you know, our policy is for reform of industrial relations so that both uh, Labor and, uh, and employers can join together to negotiate employment agreements that can provide maximum opportunity, maximum efficiency for both employer and employee. That's why we advocate reform of infrastructure in this country so that we can be internationally competitive, get the cost burden off our producers on the wharves, get the cost burden off our producers through the transport systems in Australia. If we concentrate in those areas, Mr President, then we have an opportunity to be internationally competitive again. But if, however, you go back into the dark ages of Democrat policy and argue that the barriers go up and in some way that we, we isolate ourselves from the international community, that we isolate ourselves from international competition, the result in this country will be an ever lowering standard of living, which is the legacy we've inherited from 10 years of Labor, and, and a lack of opportunity for business to expand and the tragedy that we've now reached in this country with nearly a million unemployed. What do the Democrats want to do? Quarantine that million? Lock Order. in that million unemployed? Order. That's not the answer to Order. Australia's Senator economic Hill. future. We must open up Order. and get out there and compete and Time's get jobs. expired. Order. Senator McMullen, I remind senators we are de debating whether standing orders should be suspended. Senator McMullen. Thank you for that uh, reminder, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and the, the government will not be support, supporting the suspension of standing orders uh, with regard to this matter, principally because we regard it as a motion based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the way in which investment decisions are taken in this country and the way, therefore, in which jobs are created in response to those investment decisions. If we were to make, if the government adopted this proposal today and changed the law today, not and if there was a view that changing those laws would create more jobs, not one job would be created this year. Because there are things called lead times. There are things called reality that keep coming up and hitting you between the eyes when you come up with wish list proposals like this. Now, what industry has been asking for? the progressive industries in Australia, the sort of the industries that you are seeking to protect in this circumstance, is some degree of understanding of what the uh, climate within which they will have to invest, the middle and the medium term 
uh, climate in which their industry will need to operate be made clear so that they know not just today some sort of quick fix, we won't do anything until some future knows and then we might start again, which means they don't know. When they invest today, they don't know what the climate, investment climate is going to be in six months or 12 months or 18 months. This is exactly the, exactly the wrong decision to take, exactly the wrong position to take. It will stop anybody from investing because they will have that worst of all situations, uncertainty. It is a guarantee for failure. Whereas the position that the government set down, which was set down on the 12th of March last year and contrary to some of the breathless responses to more recent comments, has, remains in place and it is proposed. no one is proposing to change what we set down on the 12th of March last year. He has not said that at all. And he, but he only seems because some people don't understand what was said in the 12th of March, which was said clearly, which Senator Button reiterated yesterday, and which continues to be the policy of the government, which gives certainty to people who wish to invest. They know the climate. I mean, I disagree strongly with the opposition's zero proposal. But at least if they were elected and putting in that proposal, people would have at least some understanding of the climate within which they are investing. Now, many of them would choose not to invest because they wouldn't like the climate. But that's a different issue. That is saying, here is, I don't agree with their policy. We know that that's very clear. Now, the, why the case for uh, tariffs uh, going back into the 50s was some sort of protection of infant industries. I remember that uh, thesis. And there, is, there might have been some justification for that in the 50s. I have a bit of doubt about it even then. But let's assume there was. If it was a protection of infant industry argument in the 50s, the infant industries we have in Australia today don't want the protection and they want the, protect the overlay of excessive protection that arose from the 50s taken off the industries who are their suppliers. It is not the case that we have some sort of need to protect the newly emerging sunrise industries. They don't want that protection. What they want is to know that there will be a gradual reduction. First of all, they are delighted that there is a program to get rid of that massive superstructure of McEwenism, but also that we can now get down to an, an agreed, known schedule of reductions uh, so that we still do have an industries in motor vehicles, industry in TCF, and we do, and investment is taking place on the basis of the known program set down by the government. It is we have an existing and understood program. It is an existing and understood program under which, for example, substantial investment in the motor vehicle industry is taking place at this time. You have seen in the last few weeks the Prime Minister involved at the opening of at the major initiatives for, for both Toyota and General Motors. Investments, investments that have taken place now, you know that Nissan failed to make a profit 17 years in a row under the, protected, uh, indus the, the massive protection policies of the past, and they haven't been driven out of business by lack of protection. They've been driven out of business by lack of profits, and there were too many people trying to participate in this market. What we want is an existing and understood program to get the tariff levels down, to get them down to a manageable level. And, to get, and so that we can continue to have in industries in which the employment can be created, but so that the new industries can grow in a climate of international Order. competitiveness and efficiency. Order. Senator Powell. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Democrats have called for a suspension of standing orders to allow a debate uh, in which we would call for a halt at this point in the tariff cuts program of the government because we want to bring to close attention two things. One, the disaster of the tariff cut regime implemented at this stage by the government and supported by the opposition, uh, whose own scorched earth policy uh, is, is, uh, uh, is only really a matter of degree by way of difference from the government. In the contributions thus far on the question of whether or not this debate should take place uh, on this motion of suspension for suspension, the Democrats' position on this has been, as usual, grossly misrepresented. It is not the Democrats' intention that we should go backwards on the issue of tariff policy in this country. It is not our intention that we should re-erect 
the brick wall around our industries across the board that was erected in the days of Black Jack McEwen, although let it be said that at its time mm -hmm. uh, much of what happened uh, in the post-Second World War era was appropriate. We acknowledge that what is needed is a targeted policy and one which at the moment needs to be changed because of the drastic and tragic levels of unemployment in this country. And just to remind the Senate uh, of, of that situation, we have uh, only to look at the very recent past to see the tragic uh, nature of the problem, a problem which really can't be overstated. Between January 1990 and January of this year, 1992, unemployment almost doubled from 550,400 to 960,000. That's almost one million people. And then, of course, there are the dependents in the families of those people who suffer under the burden of unemployment. And, of course, we're facing the fact that unemployment is going to rise above that figure and indeed is above that figure in hidden unemployment, a point which the, the opposition continues to pursue because there are many people who have given up looking for jobs, young people, women and even family breadwinners. The number of people who have been out of work for one year or more almost trebled in that same two-year period, from 115,900 to 274,200. So unemployment is a massive problem. These days we've changed our definitions. Long-term unemployment now means having been unemployed for more than a year, whereas previously it was having been unemployed for only six months. We're reclassifying the tragedy of unemployment in this country. Let me make it clear what the Australian Democrats are proposing. We are proposing first that the tariff cut program of the governments, which has got out of hand and which is ignoring the social cost uh, that it is um, uh, placing on the community, stops now. And uh, we, we do see the, uh, the by-election in wills as a very important demonstration of the damage that's being created. And in that uh, particular electorate, the TCF industries are prominent, or at least have been prominent. Um, Mr. Uh, Senator McMullen, in his contribution, said, uh, talked about what industry uh, is saying it wants. It wants to be able to set goals. It wants to plan ahead. In the TCF industries, that is exactly what has happened. And yet, factories continue to close down. 18 factories last year closed down in the electorate of Will. 600 jobs were lost, and a further 2,000 jobs are at risk. And the TCF Council has made its views very clear about what it wants and indeed has uh, exhorted people in the electorate of wills to vote for the Australian Democrats to, to really send a message here to this place about tariff policy. What the Democrats are saying is, therefore, call a meeting of TCF employees and unions to identify the specific products and industry sectors which need increased tariff protection uh, in the context of the government's program and that these should be implemented that emergency procedures should be initiated to reduce the damage caused by dumping of cheap imports, and that then these measures should be extended to other industries. Now, we're listening too to what industry is saying. We're seeing what's happening to the people. And the hoax that Prime Minister Keating has pr tried to perpetrate on the people of Wills, that there is an essential difference between the government and the opposition, isn't working. We're already seeing that in the polls, and it is quite clear that the targeted, socially conscious uh, position that the Australian Democrats are taking on tariffs is not a going back into the past. It's future-oriented and it's people-oriented, and the people of Wills Order. are demonstrating that, and they'll vote for the Democrat and Independent wedge on the 11th of April. I'd also remind honourable senators, as the president did, that we're supposed to be debating whether standing orders should be suspended. Senator Kemp. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I too am opposed to the suspension of standing orders. Uh, and I, for this reason, I, I, listened very closely, I listened very closely to Senator Powell's comments uh, to see whether there was any substance to them. And Senator Powell really gave the game away in the last part of her remarks. This is really just plain uh, fact of the matter, a Will's election stunt. That's what it is. Because basically, Basically, that if, uh, if what Senator Powell proposed in this motion could assist the tragedy of unemployment, 
I believe most members in this parliament would uh, strongly support it. But the reality is, the reality is, Senator Powell and Senator Coulter, that it will not help unemployment uh, when protection. When protection in the TCF industries was at its highest level in 1990, 17,000 jobs were lost in that industry. And I think the question is we've got to ask ourselves whether the Australian Democrats are really fair dinkum in their concern about unemployment. Because I've now been in this chamber, Senator Powell, for almost two years, and I've listened in vain for uh, any evidence from the Australian Dem Dem Democrats that they are prepared to assist industry in any way to create jobs. What, mining, what major mining project has the Australian Democrats supported which would create Ever. jobs Ever. throughout this community? Yeah. Has, Senator Kerno, has Senator Kerno come into this chamber and strongly supported the major Tully mill, mill stream development? Uh, which would uh, not only create jobs in the construction of that mighty project, but which would, of course, uh, provide the power and energy for future developments in Queensland. Not a word. Did, did Senator Coulter support uh, the, the Coronation Hill project, which apparently Mr Keating at times appears to support, and then, then he, he backflips? But did Senator Powell support that major development? Not a word. Uh, did Senator Bell come in? This chamber and support the Wesley Vale development, the pulp mill in Tasmania. No, he, he, of course they don't. They vigorously oppose this. And I wonder what industry will think when uh, we go down and explain to them that what the Australian Democrats want to do is to put a vast range of new taxes on industry. I wonder what industry will think of the additional taxes on power that the Australian Dem Democrats wish to propose. I wonder what they, they feel about the additional transport uh, taxes that uh, you, Senator Coulter, propose. I wonder what they think about the additional fuel taxes that you, you propose. I wonder what all those taxes will do for Australian industry. And I wonder what, if we're thinking in terms of employment, I wonder, Senator uh, Coulter, uh, what the Australian people, the people in small business, will think about your proposal and the incentive that this will create for wealth taxes inheritance taxes, capital gains taxes. I wonder what all those uh, small, uh, people, small business, business, business people in wills will think about that when they, they've struggled to, to maintain their shops, their small factories, they struggle to build them up, and they know that what the Australian Democrats are proposing is a vast range of taxes which will not only inhibit their current operations, but uh, will certainly ensure that any incentive to build up a business no longer exists. We've recently had a report from the BCA, Mr Deputy President, which pointed out that one of the major problems that we have in Australia in the manufacturing industry, of which you've evinced concern, is the very high level of taxes that the manufacturing industry must bear compared uh, with its major competitors overseas. And the recent BCA bulletin spelt that out very, very clearly indeed. And we wonder, when we listen to you, um, Senator uh, Coulter, whether there's any proposal that you have on the table to address this particular problem. And the answer is that you do not want to remove taxes from the manufacturing industry. Your policies want to impose further taxes. Now, the coalition has put down a major package of assistance, the fight back package, which attempts to tilt the favour, the field at last in favour of the manufacturing industry in this country, to rid the manufacturing industry of a vast burdens of tax, taxes. But will you support us, Senator Powell, in our proposal to remove the payroll tax? Will you support us, Senator Powell? Will you support us, Senator Powell, in our proposal to remove the wholesale sales tax? Will, will you support us, Senator Powell, in our, in, in our proposal to uh, cut the cost of transport taxes order, in this country? The and the Senator answer is you is will not. Senator Kearney. Uh, Deputy President, well, this motion will, uh, will uh, fail, as has been made quite clear, and perhaps it's proper to uh, point out why. Uh, Senator Coulter has moved that uh, his motion on the uh, paper, motion number 791, be taken as formal. And uh, when a motion is taken as formal, as you uh, know better than I, uh, Mr Deputy uh, President, it shall be put 
and determined without amendment or debate. So what's been proposed here today uh, by uh, the Democrats is that a motion uh, relating uh, to tariff cuts and unemployment, about which clearly there is considerable differences on the, in the various parts of the chamber, that that be put without debate. And Mr uh, Deputy President, it's made, been made quite clear here this morning that the uh, solutions to the country's problems, and there are many, have uh, <coughs> different answers. And it would be wrong, Mr Deputy President, to uh, put a motion through this uh, House <coughs> of this sort without there being considerable debate. And uh, can I uh, <coughs> uh, make it clear, uh, Mr Deputy President, that unfortunately uh, the uh, motion by Senator Coulter has symbolised what often happens in the uh, debates in this uh, uh, chamber, because uh, <coughs> people take up positions and refuse to debate in respect of the facts of that uh, approach uh, that, that are, they are faced with. Mr uh, Deputy President, uh, the Australian economy, like economies elsewhere around the world at the moment, is in uh, much need of rejuvenation. And, uh, the way to rejuvenate the economy, to make things better than they are now, is to look at the actual facts that face the people of this uh, country and to uh, give answers to uh, those facts in terms of reality, in terms of what is needed. Now, that answer is not going to be given in terms of a sweeping uh, philosophy or a sweeping uh, principle such as let's abolish abolish uh, 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 tariff cuts uh, from now on. Let's stop the uh, tariff cuts. <coughs> it's got to be faced in terms of, uh, well, yes. Yeah, but all I'm saying, Senator Coulter, to be fair to him, Senator Coulter is saying he's not saying that let's abolish uh, uh, tariff cuts. What he's saying is let's stop them here and now. Now, uh, that may be an appropriate course to take in terms of the TCF industries. It may be appropriate to take in uh, terms of other industries as well, as well, but it would be wrong for us as a parliament to pass a motion which simply says let's, cut, uh, let's uh, stop all tariff cuts right across every industry, right across the board. It is too simplistic a uh, solution to a very complex problem. Now, <coughs> that, uh, that tendency, may I say, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President, isn't confined to, to uh, Senator Coulter or to the uh, Democrats. There is a tendency, uh, <coughs> say in terms of putting forward the policies of the fight back package, to, to lack flexibility. Here is a scheme that's been put forward by the opposition, which uh, has a considerable amount of material that has to be considered, but there seems an inability, an inability on the part of the opposition in any way to change the ideology which they have uh, adopted in the fight back package. And uh, uh, Senator Coulter, in putting forward this motion in this way as a formal motion, and no doubt it's put forward on the basis that it will uh, give people, as has been said, an opportunity in this half hour to say something about uh, uh, matters which may affect the, uh, uh, the will's election. But leaving that aside, and what it does symbolise is that there's too much debate goes on in this uh, chamber in terms of ideology, in terms of the, an ignorance of the fact, in terms of ignoring the facts, and in coming up with platitudes, which in effect is uh, just as bad as uh, getting up and moving a, uh, <coughs> that a motion be taken as formal about a matter which clearly cannot be uh, and should not be. Uh, discussed on the uh, matter of uh, on, on the basis of going through without any debate and without any chance of amendment. Order. The time for debate has expired. The question is that the motion of Senator Coulter for the suspension of standing orders be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells.
just finished oh, a lovely cappuccino. <laughs> Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the suspension of standing orders moved by Senator Coulter be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Bourne, teller for the ayes. Senator Brownhill, teller for the nose. Order. Result of the division there being seven ayes and 48 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Would all senators please resume their seats?
Order. Order. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding Appropriation Bill No. 3, 1991-92, for concurrence. Minister, Senator Evans. May proceed without formalities. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill be narrowed a first time. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Clark. The uh, question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Defence Legislation Amendment Bill 1992. Corporations Legislation Evidence Amendment Bill 1992. Minister, Senator Evans. Mr President, I indicated to the Senate that those bills which have just been announced by the President are being introduced together after debate on the motion for the second reading has been adjourned. I'll be moving a motion to have the bills listed separately on the notice paper. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Clark. Defence Legislation Amendment Bill 1992, Corporations Legislation Evidence Amendment Bill 1992. Senator Evans. President, I move that these bills be narrowed a second time, secondly, to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? No objection, leave is granted. Senator Brownhill. I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Evans. President, I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. Uh, the question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, Mr Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Primary Industries and Energy Legislation Amendment Bill number two, 1991, Poultry Industry Assistance Amendment Bill 1991, second reading, adjourned debate. Uh, Senator Archer. Excuse me. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I wish to speak to this bill on this occasion, uh, not so much to... Uh, to talk on the actual business of the bill, but to use it as a vehicle for, for a little bit of, uh, of other discussion on the industry. The, the main purpose of the bill, is, or the, the purpose of the bill, is to uh, clean up uh, old legislation under which uh, debts from a previous arrangement have been unpaid. The, uh, the hen levy, as it was, is no longer operative, and there are still debts that, that are outstanding dating back um, prior to uh, 1990, um, when, the, when the trust fund was wound up. Now, so saying, I, I would like to really raise the issue of the, the import of poultry meat and the, um, the question of quarantine and so on. Prior to 1990, the Australian Poultry Industries Association and the Australian Chicken Meat Federation had been involved in discussions with Aquis and its predecessors concerning the importation of, of poultry products into Australia. There had been discussions uh, concerning importations from United States and New Zealand, and in, in every case it was the, the quarantine aspects that dominated. There's the question of the uh, Newcastle disease, of course, and avian influenza and, and various other lesser known ones, but, uh, but very real as far as the industry is concerned and very important as far as retaining Australia's disease-free status in this area uh, compared with the other countries. Now, on March the 16th, 1990, um, Aquis advised that it had been approached by the governments of the United States, New Zealand, Thailand and Denmark to allow the importation of poultry products. And these were either fresh or frozen, uh, cooked or frozen. Um, the, uh, the announcement went on to say that Aquas were conducting a, a full quarantine risk assessment. Now, Australia is well known throughout the world for its very generous quarantine assessments as far as other countries are concerned. And um, the industry started to become fairly nervous as to what might happen in this particular case. Um, in due course, in April 1991, 
The risk assessment discussion paper was distributed with a response requested by the 14th of July. Now, the, um, the fact that it was uh, very heavily dealt with by the industry meant that uh, the date had to be extended somewhat. The industry itself produced its own uh, study, uh, what was known as the Larkin Report, and uh, discussions have proceeded uh, since then. The, the industry contacted Minister Crean and um, Minister Griffiths, various state minister of, ministers of agriculture and health, as well as, as Aquas, to emphasise the effect of significant changes to quarantine uh, and what this might do to the Australian industry. In due course, on 3rd of December 1991, Aquas advised that, uh, that they considered the quarantine and public health is issues associated with the importation of chicken products is still in progress. The work to date has concentrated on cooked product and we are still considering comments from interested parties on their discussion paper. Now, and so the, the issue still uh, rambles on. The, um, the concern for public health issues and the concern for industry quarantine issues are not quite the same, although they certainly overlap. And it is uh, necessary that they should be considered uh, individually. The, um, the, the letter from, from Aquis went on to say, we have not sought to develop a position on fresh frozen chicken meat at this stage in view of the complexity of the issue and the inadequacy of information from interested countries. Well, but we still, as I say, still ramble on, heading in that uh, direction inexorably. Australia is free of the various strains of Newcastle disease, and the, uh, the last outbreak that, uh, that we had of the uh, virulent strain uh, was in the early 1930s. Australia is also one of the few countries in the world that doesn't allow vaccination of any poultry against Newcastle disease. A recent uh, Aquis discussion paper, a qualitative assessment of current exotic disease risks for Australia, rates Newcastle disease along with avian influenza and blue tongue as the highest priority group of diseases for exotic animal disease risk. And one of the four ways it suggests that exotic Newcastle disease could enter Australia is in foodstuffs containing infected poultry carcass material. I really don't see that there is any necessity for Australia at this stage to even consider the importation of poultry carcass material. But we still progress going on with it. And frozen poultry carcasses were an important mode of the spread of the virulent Newcastle disease from one country to another in the 1940s and 50s, the report went on to say. And once the, the, uh, the virus had entered the country, the 1990 Aquas paper would suggest that there is no reason why virulent Newcastle disease would not become established in Australia and spread very rapidly. Now, the attitude that goes with so much of this is that we have to accept what is an acceptable level of risk. With diseases such as Newcastle disease and foot and mouth disease and the likes, the acceptable level of risk is zero. Not zero plus one or zero point naught naught one, but zero. There is no reason in the world for Australia at this stage to run the risks of, uh, of absolutely decimating what has now become a very well controlled and very uh, well run business. Um, should an outbreak of Newcastle disease happen, the costs would be absolutely enormous and the destruction in the industry would be um, very, very high. The, uh, the, the whole loss of standing that we would have as far as the Australian industry is concerned uh, would be most damaging. What could happen uh, through wildlife also is something that hasn't really been, been checked and it would be impossible to determine. If the disease couldn't be quickly eradicated, massive costs associated with mortality and the loss of production due to the clinical disease with purchasing and applying of vaccines and the loss of trade would be incurred 
on an ongoing basis. Insufficient knowledge of the effects upon and the spread of disease in native bird species means that the effect on the bird population would, as I say, be inestimable. The Chicken Research and Development and Egg Industry Research Councils and their predecessors have spent $1.6 million on Newcastle disease-related research. We've always had in mind that it is possible that through some unthinking reason that the, the disease could come to Australia. We certainly don't want to bring it in by some thinking means. We don't want to open, it, open the industry up to where it could suffer as a result of this. And for all these reasons, the Australian poultry industry totally opposes the importation of poultry products from countries known to have Newcastle disease. It also totally opposes the importation from any country that routinely vaccinates poultry against Newcastle disease. And it is well recognised that vaccinated, apparently healthy birds may still harbour or, sh or shed the virulent strain. <clears throat> Four countries have made application to export What's poultry something? products to Australia – Thailand, the United States, Denmark and New Zealand. The status of Newcastle disease in Thailand and USA should automatically eliminate those countries as possible exporters of poultry products to Australia. The exact situation in Denmark is still unclear, but as from 1992, Denmark will be fully integrated in the European community which will act as a single trading unit, and we must therefore assess the disease status of the EC as a whole when considering Denmark. Then we can consider the, the um, avian influenza, in which, uh, which is another exotic disease of great concern to the poultry industry and is ranked alongside Newcastle disease as one of the top three exotic animal disease risks for Australia. Now, I don't understand why it is that we uh, are still spending a lot of time, spending a lot of money, doing a lot more investigations to see how we can go about opening the doors to, to imports. I don't believe in using quarantine as, a, uh, as an embargo, um, as a, as a non-tariff barrier, but I certainly believe that this government and this parliament owes first things to its own industry. Why don't we just say the risk is too great, we are not prepared to run those sort of risks, and, ac and accordingly we do not see it appropriate that we should change our policy at all on, um, on the importation of either cooked or raw and frozen um, poultry product. The industry itself now comprises about 14 or 1,500 major establishments. They're about evenly divided between egg and meat production, and, uh, and it is an industry which now employs something in the order of 45 to 50,000 people. The assets of the industry are about $1,400 million and that is on the level of there being something between 55 and 60 million birds. The industry produces 400,000 tonnes of poultry meat and over 180 million dozen eggs a year. And it is uh, a very important industry in many uh, rural and outer suburban areas. The the poultry industry has done a, a great job uh, in its own promotion and presentation into the, um, into the households of Australia. And uh, the consumption has risen from 4.4 kilograms per person per year in 1950 to 25.2 kilograms per person in 1990. Um, and this is, of course, in a, in a white meat which the um, the healthy people would tell you is better than, than, uh, than steak. I, I have my personal reservations on that. But the, uh, the, the quantity of, of chicken meat is now second only to beef as far as the consumption uh, is concerned in Australia. The, um, the industry does not uh, intend to try and 
uh, require the government to object to the imports on any grounds other than the risk to the industry itself. It is not worth bringing in things that are going to produce risks to the consumer, and it certainly is not worth bringing into Australia uh, anything that is going to run the risk uh, of decimating or seriously damaging an industry which over the last 20 or 30 years has made such an effort to, to get its house in order, to rationalise, to become modern and effective and efficient, uh, who's spent considerable amounts of money on research and on producing the best the best birds that are that are possible for the purpose for which they are required, and uh, and accordingly, I will certainly support any move that will see that uh, that the extension of the import of of uh, poultry products is curtailed. Senator Crane. Thank you, um, Mr. Acting um, Deputy President. Uh, in rising to speak on the Prime Ministry and energy, energy legislation. Amendment number two, I'd first of all like to begin my comments by making uh, some comments in terms of uh, the amendments of the Meat Inspection Act. And while these uh, amendments here are really to streamline certain procedures, uh, one must take the opportunity of emphasising uh, the point that under our current uh, meat inspection arrangements, uh, which exist in this country, that they are in bad need of overhaul. In fact, it's absolutely imperative, particularly now that there's a 100 per cent recovery of costs uh, in terms of the meat industry, and we still have uh, many of the inefficiencies uh, which exist uh, in the meat inspection service and uh, they need addressing. We also have a significant number of meat inspectors uh, still in the employ of uh, Aquis. And uh, of course, uh, the industry is picking up the costs of uh, those surplus meat inspectors. And uh, the time has come in terms of the uh, whole meat inspection or quarantine inspection services uh, for a major overhaul. And while the industry uh, has the, uh, the cost, the 100 per cent recovery cost, in terms of uh, those inspectors and the service that is provided, they are entitled to a much greater say in terms of uh, future directions. And uh, the time has come for a modernisation of the, the inspection service uh, to get uh, the inspectors themselves, and I'm not arguing about the necessity in terms of our uh, export of our product or the consumption of our product of, uh, or meat products, but those inspectors should uh, be tied uh, to the various uh, meatworks and become an integral part of the abattoir operation. It's only by doing that and progressing down that particular path that we're going to maximise uh, the productivity of the various uh, meat inspectors and lower the costs uh, that are involved in it. And we currently have a situation where uh, we have costs per man in the industry of up to $93,000 uh, per year which is a very um, high cost uh, for a service that is uh, overmanned. I'd also like to take the opportunity, in terms of this uh, Prime Minister and Energy Legislation Bill, particularly in view of the current debate uh, that's occurring with regard to uh, tariffs, to try and put a balanced uh, view in terms of the position as it impacts um, on the industry. And I want to do this against a background of a number of aspects and as to why it is important that we continue to um, have a um, reduction of tariffs uh, across the board as far as rural industries and others are concerned. Now, alongside those reductions in tariffs, it is imperative that the cost imposts that are on the uh, agriculture today and the various industries, whether it be the sugar industry, the beef industry, the wool industry, the wheat industry or the poultry industry that Senator Archer was talking about, that we have a reduction of the input costs or the imposts uh, which flow through into the uh, agriculture. Now, in talking in terms of tariffs, it must be noted here that the cost per farm 
in Australia currently of the current tariff regime is in the order of $8,000 per farm per year, which is an enormous tax which they have to pay up front in terms of the protection that is provided to a number of industries uh, in Australia. And it was with much dismay uh, last week when I read and heard of uh, the Prime Minister's backflip in terms of his previous position uh, on tariffs. And uh, I have to say, I personally heard him some three or four years ago, probably a little longer than that now, when I was uh, on the executive NFF, actually say to us that uh, his policy position in terms of having an efficient uh, economy in Australia and taking us towards uh, becoming internationally competitive, that we must, in time and in not the too distant future, uh, phase out tariffs totally uh, in Australia. He also made some mention at that particular time of the uh, necessity to get the input costs down um, to industry. And of course, at that particular time, which would have been uh, in the 84 85 uh, period, uh, he was advocating at that particular time uh, the introduction of a consumption tax. And of course, uh, that's another one of his big backflips. But uh, if we do look at what's occurred, in recent days, in terms of uh, further amendments to the wholesale sales tax and uh, a report that we saw that was uh, presented to Senator Button yesterday, that there are at least some uh, advisers within the government who recognise the importance of uh, moving uh, our tax base, lowering income tax rates and uh, introducing a consumption tax. But I just wanted to put that on the public record because I was actually there. Uh, when uh, Mr Keating, as the Treasurer of this country, uh, made that statement. And it was more than a statement at that particular time. It was a commitment. But, of course, that commitment has gone down the drain. Now, let's look at tariffs in a little bit more detail and the impact of that 8,000 and compare the difference between the situation which exists in Australia in the farm sector and the US and the EEC, where there are very high levels of uh, protection to the farm sector. And we find in the EEC, uh, for example, that the uh, attrition rate, or those being phased out of the uh, agriculture in the EEC, despite their levels of protection, has been running at something like 16 per cent per year for a number of years. We find in America, which is the other country, the so-called bastion of free enterprise, but with very high levels of protection to the farm sector there uh, through the Farm Bill through EAP and other programs that they have, that their attrition rate is somewhere in the order of 14 per cent. We look at Australia uh, and we find that the attrition rate has been in the order of 6 per cent, where protection is much, much lower uh, to the farm sector. And of course, in our major or larger industries, and in saying our larger industries, I'm not decrying uh, the smaller ones, but our wheat, wool and beef, which have negligible levels of um, protection or assistance, uh, we find that, in fact, uh, the losses in those industries um, are even less of that particular percentage. And I want to make the point here that tariffs in terms of uh, the farming industry, but also in terms of the individual in the street, are, in effect, a consumer tax. And I've already highlighted the fact that there is a cost of some $8,000 uh, per farm. If we look into uh, other areas, we find that, uh, for example, under the current uh, tariff uh, protection which exists for the car industry, that it costs consumers somewhere in the order of $4,000 per car per year, uh, the cost of protection uh, in this country. And if we look uh, a little bit further down the track, we find that across the board, tariffs cost the average household about $16 a week. So when people come in and debate tariff policy, one must realise that really uh, protection for one person or protection for one industry is just a transfer across the board to another industry or another individual. And it's a transfer of a consumer tax. What is required in terms of the position we have uh, in agriculture today, and we have to be realistic about the situation that is occurring uh, in Europe, America, through the GATT 
uh, round and uh, a number of other activities that are going on. But I must make note that very shortly, I think it's the uh, 1st of May, uh, in terms of the world tariff debate, we are finding that Japan, for example, is reducing uh, their tariffs on beef by some 10 per cent, which will have a significant benefit uh, for the Australian industry. It will allow two things. Uh, it will allow some additional increase into the Japanese market, but more importantly, uh, in terms of that, it will allow over time for Australian producers to receive a higher price uh, for their product, which will flow across the board. And suggestions at this particular time, when we look at these things, albeit small, uh, we look at these things, as I said, albeit small, it is irresponsible, I believe, to be now, after having won that particular debate with the Japanese and moving into other areas, it would be totally irresponsible, or it is totally irresponsible, uh, for those in the Australian community who start talking up uh, tariffs and presenting them as a panacea uh, to many of our particular problems. Because, as I said before, it's a transfer from one consumer to the other or from one industry to the other. And uh, while you might protect a few jobs in one particular industry, you will cost, and I must emphasise this point, you will cost jobs in another industry. And if you analyse, uh, and it has been analysed, the whole tariff uh, situation in Australia, it has produced uh, very few uh, jobs. In fact, it hasn't protected the jobs of those people who are involved in it. And if we look at uh, the much quoted textile, clothing and footwear industry, uh, in 1990, when their levels of protection were very high, they quit some 17,000 uh, jobs. And the suggestions which are around in the current debate now, of course, fuelled by um, the wills by election, which was the reason for the uh, Prime Minister's backflip. It was also the reason for an attempt by the Democrats here today to debate uh, the particular issue of tariffs, that uh, a transfer by increasing tariffs in, the will in wills will cost somebody else dollars and cents in another electorate in Australia, and it will cost also any gain in jobs on a pro rata basis in some other electorate if, in fact, the uh, protection is aimed at them. Now, in terms of agriculture—and this also applies across the board—that the direction to go to allow us to remain well competitive is to, in fact, get our costs down, get our input taxes down, get the rest of the wholesale sales tax impact, as outlined in the uh, Fight Back program, uh, off the back of those people who are producing. And it's not only the direct cost of um, the wholesale sales tax, it's the indirect cost too as it flows through the system. Uh, for example, the transport industry. And we find in the transport industry, when we add the uh, cost of the wholesale sales tax, the impact of payroll tax, which is also another tax that we intend to uh, remove and take the liability away from uh, the states in terms of raising that particular amount of money or the money that's raised from the payroll tax. And incidentally, uh, as far as payroll tax, every premium uh, in this country has called for its replacement because it is an attack on employment. But the flow on impact of those particular taxes through to the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to the um, road transport industry is in the order of $53,000 per rig per year. And what that means is that that particular cost has to be picked up down the track and it's passed on in the final analysis uh, to the producer. We look through the various uh, service industries outside uh, the transport industry. Uh, those various service industries that uh, provide for your repairs or uh, supply your machinery, whether it be second-hand or new. Once again, we find that cost structure flows through to them and it's picked up uh, by the final consumer. And in talking about agriculture in this particular um, aspect, when we look at the, as I mentioned earlier on, the fact that on an average right across Australia, uh, farmers pick up $8,000 each per year in flow on consumer taxes as a result of uh, tariffs, we then have to load on the flow on costs of the wholesale sales tax in the operation, the flow on costs of the payroll tax, 
and the flow and costs of the fuel excise and all the other indirect tax that sit um, in the system. And the proposition that we have put forward in terms of the fight back package is to in fact take those out of the system to lower the cost to the industry, to lower the cost, whether it be agriculture, whether it be manufacturing, whether it be the miners, so in fact they can have a cost structure that is well competitive. And it's worth noting in terms of that that our competitors, uh, and particularly the EEC and the uh, United States, whom I mentioned earlier on with their high levels um, of protection, uh, do not have to pay uh, those costs. So not only have they got a very high level of protection, uh, which is a transfer from the taxpayer in those particular countries to the um, <coughs> farm sector in those countries, they also do not have the burden of the high level of input uh, costs that we do. And the position that must be adopted in terms uh, of our industries and uh, in this country is to get that cost burden down so that they can in fact compete. The answer is not to go down the uh, tariff route because, the, as I said before, the tariff route will mean a transfer from one industry or one individual uh, to another. And it will, in fact, in the long term, exacerbate the problem and probably lead Australia to a position whereby we will see the same sorts of levels of attrition in various industries uh, as we've seen in the EEC and the um, United States. Now, part of that particular process also uh, must be in terms of uh, meat inspection and what's uh, occurred there is the modernisation of the meat industry in this particular country to adopt what has occurred uh, in some of the other countries where they have their meat inspection costs at, uh, in the order of 40 and 50 per cent of what they exist in Australia. And of course, one could go on talking about this for a significant length of time, which I do not intend to do, other than to say that uh, in the meat industry, where we're dealing here with the meat inspection costs, one must also uh, recognise that it's not only in the area of meat inspection that our cost structures and our cost problems have to be addressed. We find when we compare uh, the killing costs, uh, for example, in the meat industry in this particular country, uh, despite the Harrison report, despite all the things that we've heard in this particular uh, chamber about uh, industrial reform in our meat industry, that our killing costs in this country range from three, three times to two times to one and a half times, depending on who you compare yourself with uh, in terms of uh, the world situation. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, in talking to this uh, particular bill, I want to emphasise the importance of the removal of input taxes as outlined in the fight back package to um, Australian farmers. I want to emphasise the point that to introduce uh, tariff regime, regimes, particularly when you are trying to pick industries or relate them to industries which exist in the current by-election, is just a straight transfer uh, from one industry or one individual uh, to another in terms of a consumer tax. But the biggest flaw in it all is it means that somebody is trying to pick winners. And I've never seen anybody yet, there is no evidence in the world that suggests in terms of an industry when it comes to being uh, well competitive that you can actually decide that this one should get protection, that one shouldn't get protection, because inherently what happens, they get into a cocoon, they become inefficient, they become cosy in terms of the position uh, they're in. So as has already been outlined by uh, previous speakers, that we are uh, supporting these uh, bills. I just want to finalise my comments by saying that in terms of uh, this particular bill, while uh, the changes are desirable and they're welcome, um, as usual with the bills that relate to agriculture and the current debate uh, which often occurs in this particular country, there is not enough emphasis placed on the importance of allowing the Australian farm sector. Uh, there is not enough emphasis placed in terms of the uh, farm sector on the importance of getting our costs down by making our, for example, 
our meat inspection service uh, competitive and effective by making our uh, meat slaughter systems or our abattoirs competitive or effective and removing those input taxes, uh, which are an enormous burden uh, on the Australian farm sector. In particular, I want to emphasise in my final comments uh, the importance that we don't turn the clock back in terms of the tariff debate and have that current $8,000 per farm uh, start to increase again, when in fact it should be decreasing at a very rapid rate. Minister. Um, Actually, Deputy President, I thank uh, those senators who have spoken to the Primary Industries and Energy Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2 of 1991. Is that the only legislation before the Chair at the moment? I believe so. Good, Mr. Act I thought there were two. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Pol and I thought so. And the uh, Poultry uh, Industries Assistance uh, Bill, Amendment Bill 1991, uh, both of which, of course, have uh, great significance and are key and crucial importance to uh, those involved in those particular industries, uh, which are, of course, part of the, uh, of the sector, uh, which uh, we believe uh, is well-based in our farming communities right around Australia. Mr uh, President, uh, certainly I have listened with interest to some of the comments that have been passed, particularly about meat inspection charges, because I do believe that this is a matter of concern, uh, certainly to the abattoirs in my home state of Tasmania. But I have been somewhat consoled to have been assured by officials that a stringent scrutiny is being undertaken uh, within the uh, uh, quarantine, uh, Australian uh, Quarantine Inspection Service of uh, those meat inspection charges to try to more clearly differentiate those charges which can be properly attributed to the service provided to an abattoir as opposed to loading in uh, various administrative overheads and, uh, and uh, uh, even general community service obligation type matters. Uh, this is, I think, uh, very welcome indeed, um, though the consolation would be even greater if uh, the assurance I also received that the question of the um, allocation of uh, inspectors and their employment uh, uh, is also um, looked at. Uh, but, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I believe that uh, uh, the bills that have been put before the Senate are, as I say, of, uh, of great importance. I hope that, uh, as has been indicated by speakers, that they receive a speedy passage. The question is the Primary Industry and Energy Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 1991, and the Poultry Industry Assistance Amendment Bill 1991 be read, now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Primary Industries and Energy Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 1991, Poultry Industry Assistance Amendment Bill 1991. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The uh, Chairman of the Committee, Senator Colston, reports that the Committee has considered the Primary Industries and Energy Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 1991, and the Poultry Industry Assistance Amendment Bill 1991 and agree to them without amendments. Acting Deputy Minister. President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Move that the bills be now read a third time. The question is the bills be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Primary Industries and Energy Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 1991, Poultry Industry Assistance Amendment Bill 1991. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, 1991. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Olson. Uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, the uh, migration— Is this your farewell speech, by the way? Not yet, Mr oh, Acting good. Deputy President. <laughs> With the inflection of time, it will come in due course. Um, the Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, 1991, proposes 
to amend the Migration Act 1958 to make changes to the merits review system, distinguish uh, the power to uh, detain a person under the Act, increase uh, certain penalty provisions in line with Commonwealth criminal law policy and allow uh, a consistent application of uh, pecuniary penalties under the Crimes Act 1914 and provide that the obligation to endorse a visa or entry permit uh, will be satisfied by an endorsement being recorded in a notified database. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the Coalition has uh, no difficulty or problem with uh, these amendments. The changes to the review system ensure that its objectives of fairness and speed in decisions uh, continue, and the changes to level of penalties uh, for uh, offences under the Act changes the formula under which uh, the maximum pecuniary penalties are imposed. It is sensible to tidy up the references to powers of arrest so that they are changed to read detain in custody so that no confusion remains over the restrictions of arrest set out in the Crimes Act uh, 1914. The maximum pecuniary penalty for an illegal immigrant escaping from custody will rise from five to $12,000. And we welcome this as evidence that the growing problem of illegal immigrants is being taken seriously by the government. The amendment, which changes uh, an obvious marked endorsement on a visa or entry permit of someone suffering uh, from, uh, for example, a prescribed physical or medical condition, to a simple record on a uh, departmental database, is also sensible in its desire to preserve uh, privacy and negate any potential uh, for uh, embarrassment. Accordingly, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, we support this bill with these and other minor technical amendments which are aimed at smoothing the operations of the uh, Immigration Department in its implementation of migration legislation. However, I feel it should go on record at this point that we on this side of the chamber remain totally frustrated by the government's inability to look at the big picture of immigration problems and act accordingly, dealing as it does instead with a steady stream of band-aid legislation and a multitude of regulations which appear to change hourly, never mind daily, and the confusion that that creates not only for legislators the confusion it creates for departmental staff located throughout this country and overseas attempting, attempting to abide by the Act and the regulations. And with the constant change that we've seen over recent times, it can only lead to confusion, uncertainty and certainly frustration at officer level, never mind the impact that that has in turn on individuals seeking advice from departmental officers as to the Act, the regulations, its implementation and its effect on individuals. I would hope that uh, the government at least concedes, acknowledge and recognises that under this Act and with the multitude of regulations it has a problem, a major problem, and it is not attempting to come to grips with that problem in a meaningful way. Rather, host of regulations, band-aid upon band-aid upon band-aid, that is creating confusion. And I trust and I hope that the government will, uh, will recognise that that is a problem and act in a more decisive way to overcome those problems that are clearly there in this Act. Uh, Senator Teague. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, it's uh, with pleasure that I uh, speak after Senator Ralston, my South Australian colleague, and uh, very much support his summation of this uh, bill. In fact, the clauses, uh, as he has said, are uh, capable of bipartisan support in this chamber because they do uh, strengthen legislation in the national interest. Um, but the debate does give the Senate an opportunity to uh, discuss the government's immigration policies, and I wish uh, for a few minutes to uh, uh, to, to draw attention to two major uh, areas of weakness in the administration of immigration by this government. 
I first want to, uh, to note uh, that um, uh, there has been too, too much uh, uh, change, too much um, uh, reworking of, uh, of regulations in the last three years since I was a member of the Parliament's uh, uh, committee to review migration uh, re uh, regulations. Uh, there has been enormous um, complication and, uh, and variation because of the changes that have been introduced. The government got a lot of things wrong and uh, have been uh, too slow in, in, the repaired, in the repairs that have been necessary to make the Act work. The, re the reason why we refer to regulations in this area so much is that the new Act uh, to work requires a huge volume of uh, subsidiary legislation which are in the form of regulations. That is not provisions that are directly debated in the, in the Parliament but which are uh, formulated uh, with advice from the Parliament's Committee on Immigration Regulations are formulated by the government and uh, published by the government subject to uh, a possible disallowance uh, by Parliament. So the, the regulations under the Immigration Act are now enormously complicated and enormously detailed. And uh, we have, as I say, in these recent uh, years uh, been enormously taxing upon uh, the thousands of uh, public servants who are required to administer uh, the Act and regulations through the volume of, of changes that have been necessary because the government didn't get it right at the beginning. In this legislation, Migration Amendment Number Four uh, for this uh, for, for 1991, uh, there are two matters I want to uh, re refer to. Uh, one is the new Section 121A. I welcome uh, the amendment. It makes clearer the situation uh, w which will fo be followed when a case. Uh, is being reviewed, that is, where an applicant has been denied uh, and is then appealing for a review of the original decision. The regulations to be taken into account when an appeal is being considered are to be those which are the more beneficial to the applicant, whether those in effect at the time of the first decision on the case or those applying when the appeal is under consideration. And uh, that appears to be just. It certainly is in the, to the advantage of the, of the applicant, and so this clarification uh, by that amendment um, is one that I welcome. And I refer, as Senator Olson did, to the updating of the penalty provisions in the Act. It does happen that uh, penalties and acts uh, can go unreviewed for a period of time and after a while can become out of date. It is therefore desirable that this bill addresses the matter, matter of penalties uh, in the uh, Migration Act and seeks to bring them into line with the general approach of the Commonwealth to penalties in criminal law as set out in section 4b2 of the Crimes Act. The increase in the level of financial penalties emphasises the seriousness with which the Parliament views breaches of the Migration Act. And, Mr Deputy President, uh, maintaining the integrity of our immigration policy is a recurring theme of mine. Uh, in uh, a dozen speeches on immigration uh, here in the Senate in recent years. I think anyone that uh, wanted to bother themselves would find that the integrity of the immigration program is something that I've referred to on, on every occasion. I believe that uh, the Australian public doesn't have confidence uh, in the, the present government's administration of immigration. It does not have confidence that we do have an immigration program that's got integrity. It seems to be uh, not fair to all comers from wherever they may apply. And uh, it seems to me to be one of the essential targets, one of the essential goals that we all should press towards, whether from uh, the Australian Democrats, from the present government or from the future government, that we uh, so uh, back up the legislation, the decisions of this uh, uh, and the other chamber of parliament, 
and so enact fairly in every part of the world the immigration regulations that uh, any person applying to come and live in Australia can be assured that they are being dealt with in exactly the same way whether they came, their application comes from one country or another. And that the, the whole system of immigration decisions has a ring of integrity about it. Now, there are two present concerns of mine that uh, I now wish to refer to, uh, which go beyond this increase in the, the penalties that uh, are required to ensure um, that there is a deterrent for those who are breaking our immigration laws. I certainly welcome the increase in the, in the penalties. Uh, I certainly welcome the increased signal this gives that we are intent about uh, a deterrent to those who would break Australian law in the immigration area and that we are seeking to have integrity for our uh, immigration program. But the, the two, the two uh, uh, major uh, elements undermining uh, the soundness of our immigration policy, our immigration program, uh, are squarely at the feet of uh, the present Labor government here in Canberra. One is the, the result of the present recession. We have, uh, from uh, the Prime Minister, uh, it would appear uh, when he was Treasurer, that he's um, regarded Australia as having to need a recession. He certainly uh, been the one most responsible uh, for the re recession that we have in this country. Uh, one million unemployed, $160 billion of national debt, a huge current account problem, uh, a country that's going broke and where there is suffering in, uh, in every, every state, in every city, in every, every area of, uh, of Australia. And in the context of this recession, the government has not uh, adjusted the immigration program to take the recession it's, it's, it's placed upon Australians into account. And uh, I share with those in the opposition a call even now on the government to cut the immigration program uh, so that we don't have p uh, uh, p applicants coming from various countries immigrating to Australia with high hopes that they are going to make a, a new world for themselves, a new world of prosperity for their family and a contribution to this country to find that when they arrive uh, there is a degree of recession that they had not expected and that they're on the dole queue, that they're unemployed and that their, uh, their dreams are shattered. And uh, they are not only uh, adding to the burden uh, on the Australian taxpayer, but they are themselves uh, the victims of being lured to immigrate to a country that at the moment hasn't got a huge amount to offer them. Uh, I have been, for all of my uh, 14 years in the Senate, a person who's advocated high immigration. Always a responsibly high amount, but because I've seen immigration since the Second World War as one of the uh, resources as one of the factors that has led to the economic development of this country. And uh, when I say responsibly high, uh, the figure must be uh, a, 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 a number which, uh, uh, which Australia is able to, uh, to, to integrate um, in, in, in a successful way. If we had too great a number of immigrants, that we weren't capable as an economy, as a, as a social community to uh, receive and to ensure that they made a transition into uh, fully productive uh, and prosperous families within Australia, then the number would be too high. So I, as, as one who's on the, uh, that, that wants a high immigration program in normal times, uh, am calling for a lower immigration uh, figure 
because it is irresponsible to add to the doll queues, to add to the, uh, the misery of, of um, victims from a recession, those who have newly arrived in this country. Now, the government uh, has recently been urged by the, uh, the uh, ACTU uh, to cut the immigration program by 10 per cent, I think some 11,000. And uh, when I read Mr Ferguson's uh, remarks, uh, and of course the trade unions are um, very close allies, uh, some of my colleagues regard them as the real government uh, of Australia, they are, um, they are putting forward the view that this government has been uh, too slow to recognise that in a recession there is a need to cut the numbers. And uh, it's just been this week that they have called for uh, this change and made this direct criticism of the immigration program as administered by the Labor government. Well, now I believe that what they're calling for is, uh, is itself too late and it is too little. And I uh, uh, still urge the government uh, to cut the uh, immigration um, uh, numbers greater than the amount that the ACTU is now urging, but frankly for, the, for much the same reasons that the ACTU has, has mentioned. I notice the advisers uh, to the government who are in the chamber and uh, we've looked at each other across the chamber on uh, many occasions in dealing with immigration matters. And I, uh, I say, I say um, uh, to, to, uh, to them and to all those in the public who are, um, who are sitting with bated breath, that's right, Senator Tate, um, that, uh, that in order to, to ensure the integrity of our immigration program as a successful program, as a reliable program, as, as one that people can build their lives upon in making decisions to come to this country, and in order to not create further victims of the recession beyond the million Australians who are unemployed, uh, we need to much more. Uh, we, we need to cut uh, the immigration numbers uh, much more than the ACTU has advocated this week. I draw attention to two other elements of the ACTU's um, uh, recommendations, and, and that is to emphasise English language requirements uh, in the intake of, uh, of those successful applicants for immigration to Australia. Uh, it was fashionable about um, uh, five to ten years ago amongst uh, the members of the present government uh, to, to downgrade the test of English language requirements um, because they were supposing that this was a direct uh, or an indirect way of discriminating against those whose uh, mother tongue was, no, was not English but some other language, uh, as if it was some small shadow of the old and uh, totally now discarded white Australia policy. I think that um, it's been a disservice uh, to have taken up that fashion uh, within the, the Labor Party's um, ranks over the, uh, the period five to ten years ago, and we all need to squarely look at practical, uh, the practical elements of those applicants who are coming to Australia and to, to, uh, to note uh, very honestly that it is a requirement for success in this country to be fluent in English and, uh, and that there ought to be priority given uh, to those applicants who have uh, English language as a, a skill that um, uh, equips them to be more successful when they come to this country. Now, of course, we do have adult and child uh, migrant uh, English uh, education programs, uh, but uh, uh, that is only to ensure that those who come uh, having, having one priority for other reasons cannot be disadvantaged uh, in their actual life here in Australia. And we give them the transition, we give them the bridge to, to, get, to gain English language abilities when they're here. But in the program itself, we need to give greater weight 
to uh, English language as a requirement for uh, successful application. And uh, I um, note as well that it is skill, it is uh, marketable, employable skills that, uh, that go even beyond English language as, a, as the requirement that ought to gain uh, priority for applicants when they are applying to immigrate to Australia. We are wanting to see not only the immigration program working to the advantage of those successful applicants that, um, uh, that uh, are to come and live in this country, but very clearly to the, to the um, advantage of the Australia's national interest. The, those that will have the best economic effect upon this country from an immigration program are those who come here with well-developed skills, with expertise that they are going to then use to the betterment of this country. And again, we need to go right back to the uh, Fitzgerald report uh, to uh, a whole uh, range of signals in the last five years to, uh, to get the balance uh, more weighted in favour of um, skilled migration to this country to the benefit of, uh, of all Australians. Now, having uh, um, directly criticised the government with regard to the uh, effect of the recession and the need to cut immigration, I finally turn to the vexed problem of uh, the Chinese students in Australia from before and since the Tiananmen massacre of June 1989. Uh, there's been some uh, disastrous news this month, and that is the uh, revealing by the government in answer to opposition questions of a total blowout of numbers in terms of the overstay of Chinese students in this country. I am uh, the Vice President uh, in this parliament of the Australia-China Friendship uh, Association. I have visited China on numerous occasions and uh, senators will know that I was one who advocated the, in February last year the, the, the uh, normalising of relations between Australia and China to the benefit of both of our countries. But I am uh, equally strong in my remarks about the integrity of Australia's immigration program. And I'm equally uh, emphatic that when overseas students come to study in Australia, they do so on the basis that they will gain skills and return to use those skills in their own country. And in the case of China, we have had uh, tens of thousands of students who have come, studied in Australia, gained uh, professional skills as well as English language reinforcements and gone back to serve in their country China, except for those who by the, uh, this present Labor government have been given an easy road, a shortcut, a, a, de a decision which I believe has been unsound and that is that they should be able to remain in Australia uh, despite the undertaking they gave that they would return to China and despite Australia's alleged uh, commitment uh, to an overseas student program which would uh, return students to their own countries. Now the, the, the bad news of this month is this. We all knew uh, about a first group, that is some 21,000 uh, Chinese students who were in Australia at the time of the Tiananmen massacre of June 1989, and many of us were critical, but we understood the, uh, the emotions in the government that had swayed their hearts to uh, give a blanket uh, extension of visas for those 21,000 students for four years uh, for them to work out whether or not they were to gain refugee status in this country or whether they would uh, in some other way become permanent residents of Australia. Uh, since that time, only uh, 1,990, um, uh, a little more than, than that have left, but 
about 2,000 of those students have left Australia. 19,000 of that group are still here. But the bad news that we have this, this month is that since the Tiananmen Square massacre, 44,000 new people, 44,644 um, Chinese nationals um, arrived in Australia. Uh, 24,838 of them uh, were students and others are non-students. And only 16,382 of these have left. Only 2,125 of them being students. And that leaves a balance of 28,262 uh, who are overstaying. And these overstayers are not the Tiananmen, the students who were here when Tiananmen happened. They are, they are Chinese citizens who have arrived since Tiananmen. So we've got two groups. And the total of the two groups is not just 19,000 of the original group, but the total of 47,262 who remain in, in, in Australia. Now that's, they're here, um, Senator Tamman says, illegally. Well now some of them are here illegally, but most of them are here because of the soft-heartedness of the present government. I know that this, uh, this soft-hearted announcement of the former Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, was made without consultation with the Minister for Immigration at that time, without consultation with the department, uh, because of Tiananmen Square. It was made because the Prime Minister was in tears about the, about the possible uh, suffering or discrimination that those students might have in their return to Australia. And so then, without consultation, without putting his head into the repercussions this would have for undermining the integrity of the Australian immigration program, by a wave of the arm, literally, there was an extension of visas given to all of those students. And then because, because it's, it's hard to differentiate the present situation of those who have arrived since Tiananmen Square, from those who arrived before, the wave of the arm uh, is, is, is applying to them as well. And so we have almost 50,000 Chinese residents who have, by the wave of the arm, gained residence in Australia. Uh, for some it will be temporary residence, but it's still to be seen. The government has not delivered. The government has not clarified what will happen with regard to these 50,000 Chinese. Now, let me, uh, I don't want to go on uh, too long about this. I, I would rather sit down um, and allow the um, other senators to speak on this immigration bill. But I, I just want to make it in, entirely clear that if there is a genuine refugee amongst those 50,000, that is a person who can demonstrate that their life or livelihood would be in jeopardy were they required to return to China, then of course uh, Australia can respond as it does to every other genuine refugee who is in Australia. But it is not only my estimate, it's the estimate, I believe, of the Department of Immigration, it's the estimate of Chinese students themselves, that 95 per cent, at least, of the 50,000 that I've referred to would not have their life or livelihood in jeopardy were they to return to Australia. I'll make that very clear. 95 per cent of the 50,000 will not be in jeopardy if they return to Australia. Now, if they return to, to China. Now, I'm, uh, I've always advocated since June 89 that there be a case-by-case -case review of the applicants and that that be done in an administrative method that um, didn't require one person to laboriously go over 50,000 applications, but that in a, in, a, in a properly systematic way to deal with categories of, uh, of applicants so that uh, this could be done expeditiously. It was my hope that it would be all completely uh, determined by now. However, 
uh, this government is so out of control in this matter, has not made any hard decisions in this matter, is still relying upon former Prime Minister Hawke's wave of the arm, that the, this, is, uh, this is a totally unresolved uh, element of Australia's immigration program. And it is a signal that is going to all parts of the, of the world that um, if you get to Australia in some way, uh, and if you've got some kind of uh, uh, excuse that you can build a refugee application uh, on, then go for your life and you may be able to get there. And if you employ some, some private uh, sector lawyers, you can at least delay uh, through appeals uh, and, and get uh, an extended stay. And even if you lose, you get uh, a couple of years of, um, of, of all the benefits of living in Australia. Now, I, uh, I can only say that um, the Australian public uh, does not have confidence in uh, the present Labor government's administration of immigration. It does not have confidence either on the recession grounds to which I referred or on this complete blowout of, um, uh, with regard to the Chinese students in this country. I, uh, I conclude by saying I wish every individual Chinese student well in their, in their future. I wish most of them would return to their own country and contribute in a positive way to their own country without any kind of uh, deterrent uh, or impedance uh, to their uh, professional work in their own country. Uh, I've, I'm, I'm not going to table here uh, some correspondence I've received in the last uh, few weeks, uh, which I'm sure the department's very aware of, uh, of uh, Chinese students who are, who are writing to members of parliament saying, uh, let me make it clear, I know my own community and the reason why 50,000 want to stay in Australia is exactly the same as everyone else who wants to stay in Australia. They love the place. They think it's a, a, a way to, to have a better life. They like the affluence of Australia. They want to make their, their life here because their children will, uh, will have, a, uh, uh, will have a, um, a better future in this, in this country than if we returned. Uh, to uh, the third world comforts of, uh, of, of China. Now, I'm not denying uh, the aspiration to live in Australia. Of course, I recognise that so many who are here uh, illegally or in undetermined status um, would love to remain in Australia. But so do about 50 million people in the world. And the whole point about an immigration program is to ensure that there is fairness, there is integrity that there is a rational determination of the priorities of applicants, that there is the same outcome for, for an applicant from one country as from another country. And uh, that is what is smelling at the moment. That is what is not happening at the moment. And uh, why doesn't the present government uh, recognise the equal claims by Lebanese, by Filipinos, by English, by German, by Irish, by every other kind of applicant? who want to live in Australia and who re recognise that this is a great place uh, for their children and for where they can uh, make a contribution. I'm not in any way um, questioning the, uh, uh, the aspirations of the, the 50,000, but I am seriously critical uh, of the present government's inability to make decisions that are needed to ensure that there is integrity in Australia's immigration program. Now, I, I say this with such uh, uh, emphasis because I have already done this four or five times, uh, Senator Tate, in, in immigration debates in this chamber, and, and the government has still not made a decision. And I can only conclude that uh, this seems to be a government paralysed from making decisions that will make for the integrity of the Order immigration Senator, program. Senator, your time has expired. Call the minister. Oh, Senator Coulter. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Democrats also uh, support the um, substance of this legislation, which is to uh, clarify and uh, make more fair the administration of the, um, uh, uh, the way in which Australia deals 
with those people um, who have come into the country or who may come into the country or who may uh, not uh, be able to remain in the country. And of course, we strongly support uh, that uh, increased fairness and, and clarity with which uh, these matters are dealt. And uh, I'd uh, reflect the, um, the remarks of uh, Senator ba uh, Baden Teague, who's just spoken in this regard. <coughs> um, and stress that uh, the Democrats would always support uh, any move to make uh, those matters clearer and fairer and, um, and less um, uh, restrictive, and uh, that they should also uh, be equally applied to people who come from uh, a, any part of the world, that there should be no uh, discrimination on grounds of, uh, of race, sex, religion or any of those other things built into our, um, our immigration system. However, Senator Baden Teague uh, passed some remarks about the, uh, the other aspect of immigration, and that is uh, in relation to numbers. And uh, he, like his uh, leader and like the ACTU, um, called for a reduction in the size of the immigration program. So I'd like to just make a, a few remarks uh, uh, directed at that question. The Democrats uh, adopted in 1977 and have been working out in considerably more detail what it means, what it means for Australia to move towards an ecologically sustainable pattern of development. A pattern of development in which the options for future generations who live in this country, from wherever they may come, the options are in terms of uh, the environment, availability to resources, uh, will be no less than the options which are available to the present generation. That is, after all, what uh, sustainability means. It's what intergenerational equity on which uh, sustainability is based ultimately means. Both the government and the opposition have uh, paid lip service to the idea of sustainability, but have failed totally to recognise that the size of the population which is acting on the environment is one major component of that impact. And that before one has an immigration program at all, one needs to develop a population policy. And it's something that this country has totally failed to do. We have had an immigration program now since 1947. We have never, as a nation, developed a population policy. Now, in terms of sustainability, I think it is manifest to everybody that the pattern of exploitation in Australia is not sustainable in the long run. We are degrading the uh, ability of our land to produce food. We have increasing uh, soil erosion. We have increasing salinisation. We are decreasing the ability of the water supply of this, uh, of this country to continue to meet uh, the needs of even the present population. We are seeing that our water supplies are becoming increasingly polluted. Uh, we have seen in uh, the last year the spread of blue-green algae into the Murray-Darling system on which uh, Adelaide ultimately depends for its backup uh, water supply. We have seen in the case of uh, Perth the, uh, the uh, gradual rundown of the aquifers underlying Perth, on which uh, Perth's water supply uh, depends, and we have seen progressive pollution of those aquifers. We have seen the increasing salinisation of those aquifers as those aquifers become both polluted and depressed, uh, because Perth, after all, is built on a, um, a very uh, sandy coastal plain. All things which indicate that the present population of this country, the present population of this country, if it continues making the demands on the environment which it currently does, is not sustainable. In other words, we are, by that measure of sustainability, already an overpopulated country. And that is why we need desperately to develop a population policy. We need to try and work out at what level of resource use, at what level of impact in terms of, uh, of um, uh, demand for resources and the uh, pollution consequent upon the, uh, the exploitation and the disposal of those resources, at what level 
uh, we can uh, maintain a, an industrial civilization in this country over the long term. And having worked out that level on a, on a per capita basis, then what level of population, what size of population uh, is uh, consistent with that, bearing in mind uh, that uh, we are committed to ensuring, I hope, that uh, there will be a viable and worthwhile um, uh, lifestyle still present for our descendants in this country, not in 10 years' time, not in 50 years' time, but in 1,000 years' time, in 10,000 years' time and in a million years' time that there will still be people able to inhabit this country uh, without uh, loss of the quality of life which uh, we have come to enjoy and which, uh, on which ultimately the welfare of human beings as animals, as animals depends. And one of the most depressing uh, aspects of the uh, uh, migration reviews which go on is that we don't find biologists and ecologists built into that uh, review process. So I make appeal, uh, an appeal to the, uh, to the government that it must, it must, as a matter of urgency, develop a population policy. It must look quite seriously at the demography of what is happening to the uh, Australian population. What is happening to the age structure of the Australian population? What happens to the age structure of the population if you have uh, substantial increases in, uh, in immigration rates for uh, some years and then for whatever reason you substantially cut those rates. Because what happens is that you have a cohort of people who move through the population all ageing at the same time and you produce the very um, problems that uh, many people have argued we need to avoid in terms of the um, of the age, uh, the, uh, an excessive number of, uh, of ageing people in the community not supported by a sufficient number of young people. Uh, it is, as it were, a reverse of the situation we had after the Second World War when we had a baby boom and suddenly we found that we had to build a lot of schools which a few years later uh, were empty and uh, we had made a large investment in resources which were then being underutilised. And when those baby boomers um, uh, themselves produced uh, children, we had another mini baby boom and we had a, um, a damped recurrence of the same uh, thing. We, we needed to build more facilities for, uh, for education for children, which a few years down the track were not required. And in a similar way, if you have a cohort of people who all age together, not followed on by another cohort of people of roughly the same size, you'll build a whole lot of facilities for aged people, which then in a few years' time uh, you won't need. So the, the, uh, the call which has come from some members of the opposition for a complete cessation of immigration uh, simply doesn't take into account those sorts of factors. If we're going to build a population policy, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, we must look at a population policy over a very long period of time. It can't be a short-term policy. Because people live 70 to 80 years, a population policy has to look at what will happen at least over 100 years. Now, to put a few figures to this, what will happen to Australia's population under various uh, uh, possible scenarios? It's often and quite incorrectly said that if we were to cut our immigration rate to zero now, our population would immediately start falling, simply because the net reproduction rate of, uh, of uh, Australians is below one, below replacement. Now that conclusion is totally false and ignores the fact that uh, the majority uh, of, um, of the Australian population are, uh, are younger than a population at stability. We have more young women still to enter their reproductive years than we have older women who are dying. So that without any immigration at all into this country, population would still increase by something around about three million people uh, and then would go into slow decline um, if the net reproduction rate remained at about 0.9 where it is now but it would not get back to 17 million people until about 100 years from now. So the idea that the population would suddenly fall 
because we had no immigration is simply uh, false and is not borne out by, uh, by demographic analysis. Similarly, when uh, the former Minister for Immigration, uh, Senator Ray, was asked what he thought a, um, uh, an optimal population for Australia might be, he uh, gave the figure 25 million. It's a figure which many other people have, uh, have used. The present rates of immigration would see us pass 25 million and wave goodbye to it, to it around about the year 2030 with no hope of ever getting back to it. If we want to stabilise it about 25 million people, we need to quite seriously cut the, uh, the immigration rate from where it is at the present time. So the point I'm making, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, is that we do need to develop a population policy for this country and having developed a population policy, we then would look at uh, what sort of immigration program in terms of numbers uh, would fit with that, uh, with that population policy. But having said that, and I stress again that the, the, uh, the Democrats in no sense blame immigrants for any environmental damage which has occurred in this country. It's not the immigrants who are responsible for the immigration program, it's the government that's responsible for the immigration program. And if the increase in population causes environmental problems, it is the government which, is, uh, which has caused the population increase by pursuing a program of population increase through immigration. Migrants are not responsible for, uh, for environmental damage. And similarly, the, uh, those who do come into this country, those who do come into this country, should never be selected on any grounds which relates to uh, race, religion, creed, sex, or any other uh, discriminatory factor. Now, where we would differ very markedly from both the government and the opposition is that um, in meeting our humanitarian responsibilities, we believe that the, uh, the program, um, uh, the, uh, the immigration program, should be based around refugees and around family reunion and not about skills or uh, around a, a reconstructed um, uh, business migration program, if that should get underway. Skills have been used as an argument for immigration into this country ever since 1947, and it's an indictment of uh, successive governments in this country that we still apparently need skilled people to come into this country. We should be having a much better educational and training program in this country for Australians so that we don't need to bring in people from outside with skills. And it is about time that we, uh, we more adequately trained, trained Australians so that we don't uh, feel a need to bring in people from other countries. In relation to uh, business migration, certainly as it was constructed, uh, I think uh, enough has been said about the, uh, the rorts and the damage which the, that program uh, did. In terms of refugees, I'd pick up a remark of uh, Senator Baden-Teague where he quite uh, clearly identified refugees as those people who temporarily cannot remain in their own country for fear of, of, um, of um, action being taken against them which threatens their life or their, or their livelihood. And uh, the, uh, the Democrats believe that Australia should bring in a much larger number of refugees uh, bearing in mind that they may well be people who uh, later on could return to their own country but in the meantime need, uh, need succour. And as far as the family reunion program is concerned, it's obvious that having brought people into this country, it is only fair, at least as regards close family, that those people uh, should be allowed to um, bring uh, close family um, in, into uh, Australia. But um, I would argue, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the, uh, the program does need to be cut, but cut along lines which are based on long-term sustainability. As regards this, uh, this bill, as I said in my opening remarks, um, it does go to, the, to a number of matters which, uh, which relate to uh, the uh, fairness and transparency with which uh, migrants, intending migrants, and those who have um, um, found themselves uh, on the wrong side of the immigration law are dealt, and uh, the, uh, the Democrats um, 
uh, strongly support uh, this and any other moves uh, in this direction. Minister. Oh, thank sorry, you, Madam Senator Acting McGuire. Deputy President. Oh, I don't mind being called that. It's, uh, right. Good for my morale every now and again. It's sort of, you know, that little flicker of optimism sort of uh, flutter momentarily. Um, the nor anywhere else, comrade, will find. Um, the, can I thank uh, uh, senators for their support for this legislation? I note the, the comments that they've made about it and the generally supportive uh, uh, remarks they, they have made, and I thank them for that. Uh, as uh, all senators involved in the debate will be aware, there will be a minor government-sponsored amendment uh, in the committee stages to uh, uh, overcome what is in effect the drafting error uh, to achieve the intended outcome, but to, uh, to, well, to actually achieve the intended outcome rather than what would have been the outcome has it, had it remained as originally drafted. So I won't uh, take up the time of uh, the Senate anymore at this stage. I'll deal with the amendment in such brief comments as need to be made in the committee stage. I thank senators for their support. Thank you, Senator. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, leave the ayes have it. Uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958. We are speaking slowly. <laughs> Is the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so awarded. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator McClellan. Mr Chairman, firstly, I table uh, a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the amendment to be moved by the government to this bill, and I now formally move the amendment as distributed, as I indicated in summing up to second reading. It uh, corrects a drafting error. It achieves the original uh, intention uh, of the legislation. I think senators understand both the substance and the import of the amendment. I won't speak to it any further. I simply commend it to the Senate. The question is the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Chairman of the Committee, Senator Colston, reports that the Committee has considered the Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, 1991 and agreed to it with one amendment. Minister, I, Senator I move the report of the Committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those other opinions say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Senator McMullen. And I now move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958. Government Business Order of the Day No. 3, Horse Grains Levy Bill 1992, first reading, adjourned debate. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clark? A bill for an act to impose a levy on certain coarse grain produced in Australia. Senator McMullen? I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And uh, with the concurrence of the Senate, I suggest that the Coarse Grains Levy Bill 1992 be debated cognately with the Coarse Grains Levy Consequential Provisions Bill 1992. Is a suggestion you're something seeking leave for? Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, that suggestion is, is a request, I think, for leave. Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. Um, Senator Tamling. Thank you, Madam Deputy, Deputy President. The, purp the purpose of the Coarse Grains Levy Bill 1992 is to impose a levy on barley, cereal rye, oats, triticale in Australia to fund research. And the purpose of the Coarse Grains Levy Consequential Provision Bill 1992 is to provide for the collection of levies on the barley, triticale, oats and cereal rye industries and repeal the Barley Research Levy Act 1980 and the Triticale Levy Act 1988. 
in referring to the Coarse Grains Levy Bill 1992, coarse grains comprise feed wheat, triticale, sorghum, feed oats, feed maize and feed barley. Together, coarse grains constitute Australia's second most important crop after wheat. Barley, $708 million in 1989-90, oats, $178 million and sorghum, $136 million, rank among Australia's top income earners. This bill proposes to incorporate the existing barley and triticale levies imposed by the Barley Research Levy Act 1980 and the Triticale Levy Act 1988 in a single act and impose new levies on oats and cereal rye. These proposed levy arrangements are being made at the request of the Coarse Grains Council of Australia on behalf of coarse grain producers. This legislation is part of the standard rural industry research and development arrangement through the Primary Industries and Energy Research and Development Act that is, the dollar-for-dollar dollar industry and government arrangement up to a maximum of 0.5 per cent of the gross value of production for the particular industry. It is estimated that the Commonwealth's matching contribution for oats and cereal rye will total $270,000 per annum from 1993-94 and $3.1 million of barley and $90,000 for Triticale in 1992-93. In turning to the Coarse Grains Levy Consequential Provisions Bill 1992, the Primary Industries Levies and Collection Charges Collection Act 1991, the Principal Act, provides uniform collection procedures for various levies and charges. Prior to the commencement of the Principal Act, each primary industry levy and charge comprised two pieces of legislation an act imposing the levy and or charge, and an act collecting the levy or charge. One of the principal effects of the principal act was to do away with the levy or charge collection act for each levy of charge imposed. However, acts which impose a levy or charge are not able to be consolidated in the same way as collection acts because of section 55 of the Constitution, part of which provides, and I quote, Laws imposing taxation, except laws imposing duties of customs or excise, shall deal with one subject of taxation only." End of quote. The provisions of the Principal Act largely reflect standard Commonwealth levy and charge collection legislation of the past five years and updates many of the collection arrangements for levies and charges imposed by those acts listed in the schedules to the Principal Act. With regard to coarse grains and grain research, this legislation signifies further development in the coarse grains and grain industry generally, which can be seen in three stages. The first stage was when wheat, a loan of the grains, had a research arrangement with the government. Over a period that was seen to be too narrow, the con concentration was on wheat when there was a need for research to develop more appropriate strains of other coarse grain varieties to meet market opportunities and also, as required, for better farm management practices in the wheat-sheep zone of Australia. The second stage in the development of research arrangements came with the inclusion of that broader range of grain varieties in the research arrangements. In this second stage, yield as well as suitable varieties for climatic different climatic and soil situations was the dominant factor. In the third stage, where the yield is still important but market requirements are now having a higher priority than before. The opposition parties will be supporting this legislation. We acknowledge the progress that is being made with coarse grain research and recognise that there is now a need for more special research to pick up these market opportunities. At a time when coarse grain growers of Australia are experiencing their lowest incomes on record, according to the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics, it is $32,000 on a farm business basis, and the uncertainties and unfairness of a corrupt world grain trade, these farmers are really setting an example to the rest of Australia. Thus, in this particularly difficult economic time, these growers are prepared not only to meet the standard or the challenge set for them by government of 
5 per cent of the gross value of production, but also go beyond it. If other sectors of Australian business were prepared to make the same sacrifices or for long-term gains for the international competitiveness of their industry, Australia would be looking forward to a far better future. Senator Panizza. Elegant timing, sir. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We are here <coughs> today debating the uh, coarse grain levy bill, and that is uh, the idea of this bill is to bring into one into one bill a certain uh, different uh, uh, acts already in, as well as imposing uh, a, uh, a levy on on oats as well. And I, I welcome the measure, Madam Acting Deputy President, because uh, coarse grains, uh, they're, they're, there's a wide variety of coarse grains. When you're dealing with the wheat industry, it is an industry that's far more organised and under one roof. And uh, if we're able to bring the coarse grain, and I've got a certain amount of experience in coarse grain, so I suppose I'd better declare my interest that I generally forget in these cases, you can bring them all under one roof. So you've got oats, you've got uh, barley, you've got triticale, and uh, a few of the others, and rye, I can see that comes in. Now, I believe, Madam Acting Deputy President, in the, in the past that the coarse grains have been rather neglected. Uh, as far as not so much on the levy side, we've had levy on on quite a few of them uh, for research, but the money spent on research, of course, varies with production, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and production, of course, so varies on world markets, and uh, coarse grains, unfortunately, reacts to what the wheat industry does. If the wheat industry uh, wheat prices are up. Uh, continue or keep up a certain level, coarse grains go down. So uh, they're not a, the industry is not able to make any long-term, uh, long, real long-term contracts. Uh, I know that uh, oats is in fair demand as malting uh, uh, overseas, as well, of course, the barley is. But uh, getting that reaction uh, that uh, caused by the wheat industry or the wheat price going up and down. Uh, really doesn't let the coarse grain settle down, and the most stable uh, sort of market is within Australia itself, and uh, mostly with the stock feeders, uh, you know, making stock feed and manufacturing of stock feed uh, for for animals, race horses, and that sort of thing. But uh, then, of course, that being a limited market gives you a limited price what you can expect. And uh, I know with oats has been static at a hundred dollars a ton for the last uh, 10 years, as far as I can remember, and, uh, and then you've got to deliver it to the, the city as well for that. But uh, with the research, and uh, another thing I know, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, there's been no real new varieties of high production, especially for the low rainfall areas, been around for quite a time. And uh, with the sort of levies that will be going through, matched by the government, uh, contribution, then hopefully uh, on the oats side of thing, we will develop some new varieties that uh, produce uh, a reasonable high return in the lower rainfalls, as well as in the in the in, sorry in the low rainfalls, as well as the high rainfalls. Production on high rainfall is uh, is quite high, but. Uh, where you have that sort of case, we want more research into uh, being able to produce grain without producing too much uh, bulk in uh, in the straw. Now, bulk in the straw is very good if you happen to be growing hay and selling hay as a product. But unfortunately, uh, with the sort of varieties that are around, there is too much bulk in the straw, and by the time you get down the right sort of weather to cut hay, it is it goes rank. So. That's what we need, the industry needs. A sort of oats develop not too much bulk, enough bulk to, to cut hay, and uh, without getting too rank, and of course your return should be. Uh, the departments of agriculture, especially of Western Australia, have been uh, quite the, the forefront of, uh, of research into, uh, into your uh, coarse grains. 
but uh, I believe that it's not quite so repeated around the rest of Australia. By the same token, I would say that some states lead the, the research into the wheat industry, and especially South Australia, where they've been able to grow reasonably, or develop, I should say, reasonably high-grade quality wheat uh, and also heavy production. Because it's not, uh, it doesn't do the economics of a farm very uh, too much by uh, uh, producing uh, quality and quality alone if you don't get production you've got to work your formula out so you've got a certain amount of return and that's where I believe South Australian Department of Agriculture and Roseworth Ecology especially has done a good job on that one but uh, getting back to the mechanics of the bill Mr Madam Acting Deputy President I think it is a move in the right direction I can remember going back some time ago with oats uh, there was no levy but there was a voluntary levy and this is obviously replacing that but it was almost compulsory in the fact that you had to uh, mark a box so if you didn't want to contribute and I suppose they, uh, the oat industry got some uh, uh, got quite a bit of uh, money in through levies that, that they didn't really want to that, that they really got it by default rather and of course that caused uh, ups and downs in the amount of uh, levy that came through and coupled with uh, up and down production no one really knew where they were. This sort of bill uh, will and the government uh, you know putting up a dollar for dollar will make a, quite a difference of stability of research and uh, which has got to be encouraged in all products uh, let alone the, grain, the coarse grain industry. But uh, if I can, uh, if the time allows me, Madam Ad Acting Deputy President, uh, do go into a few of the other problems of the rural industry around Australia that uh, exist at present moment. I know uh, I've said in this place for quite some time that, uh, that the rural industry is uh, reviving a certain amount uh, because of the upsurge in wheat prices again, but there is a lot of other aspects that uh, has got, this government's got to look at. I know in the One Nation package, uh, the government, we haven't seen legislation, has provided certain measures to, to help the rural industry out, but uh, uh, well, we haven't had the legislation, but I, don't, I think it's too little and in a lot of cases uh, too late. There, is, there was a uh, certain amount of money for, uh, for uh, RAS, this uh, Rural Adjustment Scheme, called RAFCO in Western Australia, who are very slow in uh, putting any money out that, that may have, because it's set up with a, uh, in a bureaucratic sort of system uh, that uh, the money goes to RAFCO and then they decide how they distribute it and applications are made. So you make these applications, farmers needing carry on finance or, or finance to uh, to build the farm up, or indeed there is a certain amount of finance to uh, to get off the farm altogether for the ones that haven't got a future. And uh, I presume you can compare that to the payout like you have on the Australian waterfront. The only thing the, the, this government uh, uh, it prefers to help the waterfront mates more than what farmers have been doing, because the waterfront uh, mates that they have got uh, have been on this uh, security of tenure of their jobs for so many years and uh, with a, a guaranteed pay for a maximum of 35 weeks but they still get their pay whether they work five weeks or 35 weeks and, uh, and Senator Collins's buyout package there's an average of $94,000 available for them as a, uh, as a buyout of, the, of the, what the jobs they have got and uh, and a little further to that, even though the waterfront reform is going along quite smoothly, Senator Collins tells us, we've got the case in Western Australia where the, the state government has bought into the argument by directing their port authorities, which are under the state government, to take on some of these excess water, uh, waterfront workers uh, as permanent employees permanent employees but still got their old uh, the same conditions of uh, uh, that big package uh, which I think is a salary about fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year maximum of 35 hour a week 
though uh, with uh, no minimum, a five weeks holiday pay and all that sort of thing, uh, the, these regional ports have been forcified to take these on. And of course, now getting back towards the bill again, of course, it keeps up the price that it costs you to get that uh, coarse grains as well as wheat across the wharf. And uh, what's more, these extras that uh, these extras that uh, that have been that the port authorities have been told to take on, they are not needed because of what's the use of watching a, a self-loading ship load or self-unloading uh, ship unload? It's, it's totally pointless. So, in that case, there, uh, if the government of Western Australia, or indeed any other state government of Australia that want to buy into the argument and, and, and push wharfage up rather than down, if they've got an interest for the uh, wheat industry, coarse grain industry or any other thing, then they wouldn't go down that line. And uh, I know the figures I've got for the, the waterfront of Sydney and Melbourne, costs have gone up 20 per cent uh, in the last 12 months to put uh, goods across the wharf, which they should be going down with this waterfront reform. So, and on the other side of you, uh, our grain growers and coarse grain growers, uh, very little has been done. Uh, instead of, uh, I forget what the, the figure was, I think it was $80 million was allocated as extra carry-on finance. I think the Minister of Prime Industry could have looked the idea of putting it through the other way, uh, uh, making it available say on a one-off GMP for grain, I know that uh, that's a dirty word with the government. Uh, the GMP was a figure that uh, guaranteed minimum price that was on the, the wheat industry some time ago that this government took off the last time that they brought up a new wheat marketing act. But uh, I don't advocate that it, uh, don't advocate it anymore that we should have a GMP, but I think a GMP rather than this uh, sort of uh, uh, putting more money into RAFCO or RAS, RAS then would have been a lot more efficient because it, so you don't have to get that backlog with RAFCO of dealing with farmers, uh, uh, what farmers' needs are if there was such a one-off guarantee like Premier Carmen Lawrence put on the wheat industry in WA last year, which incidentally got the crop planted then it goes back to the local bank managers who know farmers and businessmen a lot more at uh, a lot closer to hand and be far more efficient so uh, uh, you know that's where the government could have helped the government could have helped by uh, doing other measures that takes off the impost on farmers and uh, that sort of thing rather than, than what they have done they've got a long way to go to remove uh, I mean we've got into the tariff debate this morning uh, that uh, we've got into the tariff debate we've got into the, the tariff debate and uh, we and if you remember the, the Democrats this morning move a, a motion to st uh, to suspend standing orders to uh, to uh, debate that the tariffs the only reason they did move that of course this is the last broadcast day in the Senate before the the world's by-election but uh, uh, that's the only reason I want it. But with tariffs, the farmers, the rural producers had to cop theirs first. And uh, it's too late to go back on the tariffs. We've got to keep going. And the government and the opposition have got the same sort of policy. We've got to keep going. The farmers have taken, the rural producers have taken their hit in the past. And, uh, and uh, it's time that industry took their own medicine and get it far more efficient. Well, Madam uh, Deputy Acting. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to wind up my comments at this stage on the, on the, the coarse grain levy bill. I certainly support the measures of the bill because uh, it will only make it for more efficiency in collecting levies in the time to come. Thank you, Senator. Call Senator McMahon. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, can I thank senators for their support for the legislation and for their excellent timing in, of their contributions so that we may finish before the lunch adjournment and I, in, I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye, those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. And Clark. A bill for an act to impose a levy on certain coarse grain produced in Australia.
Or, or the um, committee is considering the course grounds levy bill of 1992. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that this bill be now passed without requests. Those of that opinion say aye. The country no, I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The country no, I think the ayes have it. Chairman of Committee, Senator Colston reports that the committee has considered the Coarse Grains Levy Bill 1992 and agreed to it without requests. I move Senator the report Wale. of the committee be adopted. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Senator move Wale. the bill be read a third time. Question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to impose the levy on certain coarse grain produced in Australia. Government Business Order of the Day No. 4, Coarse Grains Levy Consequential Provisions Bill 1992, second reading, adjourned debate. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those opinions, that opinion say aye, those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. A bill for an act to enact certain saving provisions and to repeal certain acts and to amend the Primary Industries Levy and Charges Collection Act 1991 in consequence of the enactment of the Coarse Grains Levy Act 1992 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that that bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is <laughs> so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The chairman of committee, Senator Colston, reports that the committee has considered the coarse grains levy consequential provisions bill 1992 agreed to it without amendments. Senator McMullen. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. And I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that, that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clerk. Coarse Grains Levy Consequential Provisions Bill 1992. The, it being 12.45, the sitting of the, of the Senate is suspended until 2 p.m.
The um, Leader of the Government, Senator Evans. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement about ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr. President, Senator I Evans. inform the Senate that the Minister of Industry, Technology and Commerce and the Leader of Government, Senator, Senator Button, left today on government business overseas. He'll return to Australia on the 27th of April. Senator Button's absence, I'll act as Leader of the Government and represent the Prime Minister, Treasurer and Minister for Finance. And the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook, will, as usual, take questions normally directed to Senator Button as Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce. And seeking around here. Questions, questions without notice. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to uh, uh, Senator Evans, representing the Treasurer. And I refer to the government's announcement to exempt small uh, businesses from the sales tax, uh, from their liability to sales tax. How much revenue, Minister, does the government expect to forego, and how does the government propose to finance such a significant amount of revenue? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Cinder Evans. Mr. Uh, President, the the government has given priority to measures to reduce tax on business inputs, as is well known. It was announced in last year's budget, 1991 budget, in fact, that the wholesale sales tax would be comprehensively reviewed in order to simplify its operation and to consider further avenues for removing tax on business inputs. In last year's March industry statement, a wider definition of production was adopted so that a wider range of goods used by goods producers are exempted from sales tax. As part of this ongoing simplification exercise, the government is reviewing the administration of wholesale sales tax law, which is unquestionably the, uh, the matter to which uh, Senator Watson is referring. We believe, of course, that a simplified WST system is a much more efficient system than the GST, given that it only involves uh, 75,000 active taxpayers rather than every business in the country, which is what would be affected if uh, you lot ever had the chance to put that into place. Supplementary. If, Watson. if the government intends to finance this foregone revenue by more effective auditing, is it not a fact that for decades the sales tax division has been conducting on-site audits for quite, for, for quite some time? Minister, Senator Evans. Well, it may well have been, but uh, there's always room for improvement in auditing uh, procedures, and to the extent that that is an anticipated source of the uh, making up the revenue shortfall. I'm sure there will be further opportunities uh, for making uh, extra returns in that area. Senator Schott. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Transport and Communications, Senator Richardson. Can the Minister inform the Senate whether the ABC is proceeding with plans to commence satellite delivery of its programming into the Asia-Pacific region? Has the Minister information on which, sat on which satellite option would be the most suitable on the basis of regional coverage? cost-effectiveness and practicality? And secondly, what barriers, for example, copyright clearances and technical difficulties would need to be overcome? In view of Australia's rapidly expanding export markets to the Asia-Pacific region, is the government able to provide any additional funding to the ABC to assist with the estimated $1.5 million to $2 million per annum cost for the hire of transponder capacity on the satellite links? The Minister for Transport and Communication, Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. I'm surprised that my my good friend and colleague, Senator Schott, would, would seek to get me uh, put myself into great uh, difficulty and strife by announcing that we're about to uh, support the uh, satellite. I'm glad you like it, Senator. I'm I'm I'm, I'm delighted that you're impressed. We'll get you some sunglasses. Uh, first off, um, I should uh, inform the Senate, Mr. President, that the ABC. Uh, uh, Chairman, thank you, Robert, uh, has advised me that the ABC does have a project underway uh, to have a look at uh, the possible provision of some uh, satellite television service to the Asia-Pacific region. As, um, as I think uh, most uh, people would be aware, there will be, over the course of the next uh, year or two, a proliferation of uh, available satellite space uh, occurring over our region. And given that uh, transmission costs for satellite delivery are gradually reducing, uh, obviously uh, a service transmitted from Australia is, uh, is becoming now plausible. The ABC uh, has uh, advised me that it, uh, it sees its ABC-owned Australian programming constituting the core of the service, with additional regional news 
and current affairs input. Now, they are currently uh, examining, that is, the ABC are currently examining the options that might be available to him regarding the, uh, the cost and the funding. And you, uh, you've mentioned, Senator Schott, the one and a half to two million dollar option, which involves uh, repackaging current programming. And uh, I'd have to say that that's, that's good because it's the cheapest option. They are also examining options that can cost as much as twenty million dollars. Uh, and that would be uh, an option that involves Radio Australia producing programs in eight languages and uh, separate regional news services and, and all that goes with a, uh, a proper integrated satellite service over uh, a large area. Now, at, uh, well, there's no, at this stage of the game, there's no proposal that's been put up, Senator, to approve. Not, not, uh, oh, I'm very glad to hear that. I, I might add. Uh, I, well, I, I don't think that Senator Evans would have any objection to the ABC looking at any of this. I'd be very surprised if he did. However, uh, there is no uh, no formal proposal at this stage, Senator Schott, uh, to do any of this. It's just the case that uh, uh, Mr. Hill wanted me uh, well and truly made aware of uh, of uh, the proposal they were looking at. In terms of copyright difficulties, I think in the same way that Star TV, which has a, a footprint over 2.5 billion people in 38 countries, has been able to overcome copyright difficulties, even though some of the countries into which they go have been, uh, shall we say, world centres for trouble over copyright. I think if they can manage to overcome the difficulties, there should be no reason why the ABC wouldn't be able to as well. So uh, I think uh, it's an innovative proposal by the ABC, but the government uh, at this stage of the game doesn't have a formal proposal put to it, so we've given no agreement. But certainly I have sanctioned the ABC for shewing the matter. Senator Walters. Thank you, Mr President. I direct my question to Senator Collins, uh, Minister for Shipping. And I ask the minister, how can he justify the claim that he's achieving waterfront reform in Australia when I've been provided with two quotes? The first, to ship a 20-foot container loaded with household effects from Hobart to Tilbury, London, at the cost of $2,000 Australian, and two, to ship that same container from Hobart to Brisbane at the same cost of $3,000. Order. Order. There are too many interjections from both sides of the chamber. Senator Walters. I'll start again, Mr President. I ask the minister. How can he justify the claim that he's achieving waterfront, waterfront reform in Australia when I've been provided with two quotes? One, to ship a 20-foot container Order. loaded with household effects from Hobart to Tilbury, London, at a cost of $2,000. And the second one, to ship that same container from Hobart to Brisbane at the cost of 3,500, Minister. If this is what the Minister calls reform, will he acknowledge that he has failed dismally and he should honour his commitment to resign, seeing he had said, should he not, do so, should he not achieve substantial reform, then he would? I ask, ask him when he intends to tender his resignation to the Prime Minister. The Minister for Shipping and Aviation, Senator Collins. Mr. Mr. President, the difficulty, the difficulty with the question, Mr. President, is this: the shipping, the shipping rates, the shipping rates from Australia to London have got almost absolutely nothing whatever to do with waterfront reform at all. In fact, the total, component, the total component of stevedoring costs on a uh, sea journey of that length would in fact be less than 1 per cent. The question of shipping freight rates, I repeat again, which was the gravamen of the question, Mr. President, is almost totally unrelated to, the, to waterfront reform or stevedoring costs. Senator West. Thank the question again, Senator West. Again. Order. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. And I ask, I ask the Minister would. Order. Ask the minister Order. Would, 
Senator West, start again. Yes, I'm attempting to direct this to Senator Cook, your, uh, Mr. President. And I ask that the minister would be aware of reports about levels of youth unemployment, including a claim that nearly half young people in Victoria are unemployed. Could the minister advise about the accuracy of these reports? The minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Mr. President, on the 12th of March, Senator Kay Patterson, a Victorian senator, put out a press statement which said uh, one in two young Victorians are unemployed. Now, Mr. Mr. President, this has to be uh, rightfully seen as an outrageous Order. and deceptive statement by Senator Patterson. The government, of course, has always been concerned about the level of, uh, of unemployment and, in particular, the level of youth unemployment. That is the reason why we introduced the One Nation package and that is the reason why we have taken steps to stimulate the economy. What can't be said of us that is that we have ever tried to hide the fact. We have always been honest about the level of employment in this country and what, uh, and what needs to be done about it. The, the actual facts, Mr. President, are that uh, uh, less than one in ten Australian teenagers are unemployed and seeking full-time work. Less than one in ten. On the, uh, the national percentage is in fact 9.4 per cent of the teenage population. 9.4. That's not one in two, as Senator Patterson claimed. If we look at the if we look at the Victorian figures. We find in Victoria the figure is a little higher. It's 12.1 uh, per cent, but it is not 50 per cent. It is not 50 per cent, as Senator uh, uh, Patterson's press release has duplicitously uh, alleged and, uh, and tried to mislead the community. Mr. President, fewer, if we take the 15 to 19-year-old categories, fewer 15 to 19-year-old people are unemployed in Australia now than were unemployed during the years of the Fraser Howard recession, the recession 1982-83. Uh, uh, this is a recession. I remind the Senate that uh, Dr Hewson was the senior economic adviser to the, to the Howard government. Taking the seasonally adjusted figures of 15 to 19 year olds looking for full-time work, in April of 1983, in Order. April of 1983, there were, were 157,000 uh, during the recession of the uh, of the Hewson Howard Fraser period. In February 1992, there were 124,700. That is, there is in fact a reduction of 32,900 if you compare the number of youth unemployed now to the number of youth unemployed at the time of uh, of the last recession. But does, does Senator Patterson say that? Of course she doesn't. What Senator Patterson says is one in two. Now, Mr. President, the re I read the whole press release, Senator, and it does you no credit whatever to put out a duplicitous press release of Shame. this nature without Shame. being honest about these statistics. Now, if I uh, if I go further, the uh, the um, the real reason, Mr. President, why the uh, why Senator Patterson has, uh, has alleged these figures uh, is that uh, she has failed to take account of the fact that of uh, ten young Australians in this category, seven of them are in training and, uh, and or in education. Seven of them are in training and education. The, uh, the retention rate for year 12 students in Australia has gone up 80 per cent under this government. Gone up 80 per cent under this government. Expenditure on, uh, on higher education under this government, in real terms, has gone up 42 per cent, and so there are more training and educational opportunities for young people. Of the three out of the ten who are, in, who, uh, who are not in training or education, they are in the workforce, and on a national average, less than one of those is, is unemployed. So it is, it is about time, uh, Mr. President, that uh, these statistics were treated honestly not in an alarmist way, not in a way to pretend the problem is different from what it is, but in an honest way so we can have a genuine, genuine debate about the serious problem of youth unemployment in this country. Senator Powell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is uh, directed to the Minister for Defence, Senator Ray, and it relates to a personnel management newsletter called PM Observer, which circulates in the Soldier Career Management Agency at the Defence Department establishment at 360 St Kilda Road, Melbourne. 
Is the minister aware that the publication circulates quarterly with the sanction of management of the agency to some 100 or 150 people, men and women? Will the minister comment on the following items in the November 91 edition of the PM Observer? First, stories of a sexist and soft porn nature entitled Diary of a Private Eye and Mistaken Identity. Second, a series of blonde jokes, all sexist and many of a degrading soft porn nature. Thirdly, particularly distasteful so-called AIDS jokes. And fourthly, highly discriminatory, offensive and degrading so-called Aboriginal jokes. Is the minister concerned that the kinds of discriminatory attitudes which have recently been de demonstrated in police forces around Australia might also be rampant in the defence establishment, as this publication and other recent events would seem to indicate? And what steps there were some Irish jokes in there too, Senator. What steps will the minister take in relation to this particular publication and on questions of racism and sexism generally in defence establishments? The Minister for Defence, Senator Wright. Mr President, uh, I am aware of that publication. Uh, it appeared on November uh, 1991. Uh, you asked for my comment and description of it. Uh, the publication was sexist, racist and puerile. The commanding officer, having seen the, the particular publication, took immediate steps to reprimand all those involved, and I don't think you'll see a repeat episode. You ask the more general question of whether there is racism and sexism in the Defence Forces. In part, yes, the same as the rest of the community. But our official attitude, of course, is always to uh, counteract those uh, particular tendencies, and I believe the Australian Defence Forces have a good record in that regard. You only need to see North Force in northern Australia to see the proper integ integration between those of European descent and Aboriginal descent and how well they work together. But there are the odd incidents. There was another one mentioned on SBS News last night. Again, on immediate discovery, full and, and absolute disciplinary uh, action is taken. Uh, we may get to a stage, uh, some stage this decade or next decade, when no one will exhibit a racist or, uh, or a sexist attitude. Uh, I'm not confident that that will occur, but all I can assure you is every time we see signs of it, we try to eradicate it and we will continue to do so. There are positive sides to it. I get very favourable comment from other defence ministers in our region about the behaviour of our various deployments and also our crew visits throughout the region, where they are excellent ambassadors for Australia, more often than I have to say, better ambassadors than a lot of the tourists that leave this particular country. I assure the, assure the, uh, the senator that wherever these sort of activities are discovered, we try to correct them immediately. Supplementary, Senator Powell. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the uh, minister for uh, for his answer and uh, for um, uh, the information of the prompt action of the commanding officer. Uh, however, I would ask the minister if he could um, uh, perhaps take up the question raised with me by the person who uh, raised this question with me of attitudes and behaviour which have not found their way into print uh, in that establishment. Uh, if he could take that up, I would very much appreciate it. Minister Senator Rowe. Well, as this issue has only recently come to my uh, attention, Senator, I haven't had a chance yet uh, to follow through the more general, what may be a more general problem there other than the publication, and uh, we'll follow that matter through. Senator Giles. My question is to the Minister for Shipping and Aviation. I understand that the government's reform program for the shipping industry was intended to finish by June 1992. Is the program running to schedule, and will it finish on time? The Minister for Shipping and Aviation, Senator Collins. Order. Order. Senator Collins. Modesty prevents me from doing that, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, I'm pleased to advise the uh, the Senate that uh, the shipping reform uh, program, as demonstrated by the latest uh, progress uh, report, is that the reform program is still running ahead of schedule and will be well and truly completed by the middle of this year. The program has achieved its target of substantially re reducing uh, well I, I must say Mr President that as a total of only about three and a half per cent of Australian cargo is carried in Australian ships uh, the chances of that cargo to London being carried in Australian ship aren't very great. Mr President, uh, the average crew size in Australian ships now stands at 21, representing a cut of 25 per cent over the average of 28 in 1989 and a fall of 36 per cent compared to the 1983 average of 33 when this government took office. 
New ships are being introduced now with crews down to 17 and 18, and some smaller vessels are now down to 11 in the crews. The aim also has been realised of revitalising the Australian fleet by the introduction of modern, technologically advanced ships. $1.5 billion has been invested by the industry in 26 new ships being introduced over the last three years, representing a renewal of one-third of the total Australian fleet. Another five vessels are on order. I point out, Mr President, that this is the largest capitalisation of the Australian fleet in history and would never have occurred without the success of the government shipping reform program, as the, as the ship owners will tell you. Mr President, there has been a reduction of 20 per cent in the seagoing workforce, or around 1,000 jobs. The reduced crewing is estimated to accrue savings in crew costs of around $50 million to the industry currently per annum. More than 1,900 seafarers have been retained to provide a more flexible, multi-skilled workforce. Mr President, I emphasise that these reforms have been achieved in an atmosphere of industrial harmony in an industry where only a few short years ago employers and unions were renowned for their prolonged and bitter industrial battles. Both employers and unions are to be commended on the success of the reform program and for their support for further reform initiatives to take the industry beyond its current achievements. Mr President, in February, the Shipping Industry Reform Authority presented its report of the future directions for the industry. It recommended the development through negotiation of a further program of shipping reform to maintain the momentum of, of change. Mr President, currently the government is negotiating with the industry parties to progress that further reform. Senator Tierney. Yeah. Thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. The minister would be aware of widespread concern amongst employers about reports that the ACTU has persuaded the government to protect it from proposed increase in penalties in relation to section 45 of the Trade Practices Act. Will the minister assure the Senate that any increase in penalties for breaches to the Act will be applied uniformly to corporations and trade unions and that the parliament will not be asked to arrange special deals in the courts for the government's trade union mates. Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. I am aware of speculation, Senator, but uh, uh, in, in propounding the speculation in the form of this question, you do, you do yourself no service. In the first case, I am not the responsible minister for the Trade Practices Act. That falls within the portfolio of the, of the Attorney General. And, uh, I know that, and I know that he has that matter under, uh, under consideration. In the second case, the government position, uh, Senator, will be revealed to you at an appropriate time, at an appropriate time by the government. At an appropriate time by the government, and it's not, a, it's not an appropriate time now because the matter is under consideration and under review. But, uh, but I, I might say, Mr. President, that. Uh, I have, uh, I have discussed this matter with the Attorney General, and uh, uh, he has indicated to me some salient information that uh, perhaps would uh, educate this debate a little. The first, uh, the first point, I'm coming to it. Just, just show a little bit. Order. The first point is that uh, of all of the actions taken under Section 45D and Section 45E of the Trade Practices Act against trade unions in this country, none of them have resulted in any trade union being fined. The, the effect of uh, section 45 D&E rests on its injunctive powers and uh, the, the obtaining of an injunction against action being taken, and that has always succeeded in, uh, in preventing uh, that action going further, and uh, it has never meant that any of the fines under that section have been, uh, have been, made, have been made or, in fact, uh, uh, paid. And I understand from the Attorney-General that on, on that basis uh, he is examining Section 45 D&E to see whether or not uh, the level of fine is necessary at all, and that uh, the, because it has never been resorted to and the injunctive effect seems to be uh, the issue that it has most effect. Now, the, uh, well, it has caused a problem in industrial relations, Senator, in my view, and it has caused a problem. It has caused a problem 
it has caused a problem because it has meant that industrial relations law hasn't acted on its own in affecting the outcome of industrial disputes. Other law has. But that's a matter of uh, discussion between me and the Attorney General, and in the appropriate time, he no doubt will make a uh, statement. Supplementary. Supplementary. Senator Tierney. I take it from the Minister's ducking and weaving in answer to this question that uh, penalties for breaches to the Act uh, may not be applied uh, uniformly to the trade union movement and to the corporations, and the Parliament may be asked to arrange uh, special deals uh, the courts for the unions for the government's trade union mates. Minister. Cook. Well, you can't uh, educate a mind which is militantly committed to remaining ignorant, and you can you can therefore uh, you can therefore take from that statement you can therefore take from that statement whatever you wish, Senator. But as I said, the government will announce its position in due course. It's not appropriate to announce it now. And my advice to you is: don't be too hasty. Don't jump to conclusions. This government is a government. Uh, for the country, we don't do deals of the sort that you refer to in a uh, in a shoddy way. We make sensible law, and we'll announce the outcome in due course. Um, Senator McKinnon. President, my question is directed to the Minister for Justice, Senator Tate. I preface my question by recognising the government's response to the Royal Commission on Black Deaths in Custody, which was tabled in this place yesterday, which in turn recognised a large and disproportionate number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are detained in custody. I ask the Minister, given that most of the people are now interned in institutions outside the Commonwealth Government's jurisdiction, I ask what steps the Commonwealth can take to encourage cooperation with the states in order to uh, bring about a reduction of that uh, uh, detention rate that is currently happening. The Minister for Justice, Senator Tate. Mr President, I was very encouraged to see in uh, this morning's Sydney Morning Herald an editorial which uh, goes a long way to answer the question uh, raised by Senator McKeon, which is the editorial is headed Aborigines, not just money. The first sentence reads, the first task arising out of the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody is simply to keep more Aborigines out of jail. And Mr President, I think uh, that is a very evident point uh, arising out of the deliberations of that Royal Commission, which found, of course, that Aboriginal people don't die at a greater rate than uh, non-Aboriginal people in custody, and that was perhaps a surprising finding of the Commission. But it did, of course, find this overwhelming difference. The rate at which such Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people come into custody is about 20 time, 29 times that in which the non-Aboriginal population comes into custody. If non-Aboriginal people were imprisoned at the same rate during the period reviewed by the Royal Commission, as Aboriginal people were, then some 8,500 deaths in custody would have resulted. And that gives some idea of the magnitude of the impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of uh, their detention in police cells and in uh, prisons uh, throughout this country. Mr. President, it's for that reason that we need to take urgent steps to reduce the numbers of those who are detained in such uh, custody situations. And I think perhaps the uh, real breakthrough of the government's response in this regard is to fund the establishing of uh, a series of bail hostels around the country. These uh, bail hostels will be of particular uh, use, of course, for young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are often denied bail because they don't have the uh, appropriate fixed address or the uh, means of uh, meeting other conditions relating to bail. And uh, it is a fact that there is a greater likelihood of custodial sentences being imposed if young people are detained rather than granted bail. So it's very important that these bail hostels be established under the supervision of, a, uh, of an Aboriginal uh, person who acts as a house parent or supervisor of the bail centre, bail hostel, and I believe as these are established uh, around the country, then they will provide a very sensible diversion away from the sorts of custody which uh, has uh, the, the detention in which leads to uh, apparently uh, the rate of deaths that we have uh, seen revealed in the Royal Commission. Mr President, uh, well, the, the, magistrate, the magistrate will divert them to the bail hostel rather than into some other form Order. of uh, custody, uh, Senator Lewis. Mr President, the, uh, the program will also, as I say, provide a framework within which the elders in the community, the, uh, the house parent, the supervisor and so on, other community members of standing will be able to take an active role in the diversion of these young uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people 
away from the criminal justice system in that strong custody uh, area, which, uh, as I say, has led to such an overrepresentation of those peoples in custody, with the consequential uh, uh, deaths that have been noted. Mr. President, uh, for this to succeed, of course, uh, there will need to be the cooperation and understanding of the police. Uh, that is a very important part also of the government's response. Uh, Minister Tickner emphasised yesterday that governments are not singling out police for criticism. The truth is that the police, he said, like the rest of the community, have a range of attitudes and opinions. But uh, they can no doubt do much more to improve their dealing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And uh, there are certainly programs in place within the Australian Federal Police, and we're encouraging such programs to be uh, put in place in other police forces throughout Australia so that in the contact between police and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, the uh, understanding can be bettered, the diversion into non custodial bail hostels uh, be a way then of ensuring that uh, we have a lesser representation of these people in custody and one hopes, therefore, a lesser incidence of the tragic deaths which led to the setting up of the Commission. Senator Crane. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. I ask, does the Minister intend to introduce legislation to force contractors to operate within the award system? Minister for Industrial Relations. Senator no. Cook. Um, Senator Sherry. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Evans, representing the Treasurer. Do today's balance of payments figures indicate that the budget current account deficit estimates are still on track? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Evans. Yes, Mr. President, very much so. The February current account deficit figures released today uh, showed a fall of some $237 million to $667 million in seasonally adjusted terms. And that would imply an annual current account balance well below the budget forecast of a current account deficit of $14 billion in 1991 92 The current account deficit is 34 uh, per cent lower in the eight months to February compared with the corresponding period last year. Imports are down by 0.6 per cent. Exports are up by 9.8 per cent, which gives the lie to the uh, constant uh, suggestion we hear that any improvement in the trade balance is simply a function of the, uh, of the recession, uh, causing a uh, reduction in imports. It's coming on the export side. The balance of uh, merchandise trade improved from a surplus of $77 million to, over that period to a surplus of $2.5 billion. The figures also show uh, that we can expect um, a surplus on goods and services uh, together, the first since 1979-80, and that's another vindication of uh, the forecast in last year's budget. Overall, uh, Mr. President, we're looking at a situation where the uh, current account deficit has fallen from 6.5 per cent of GDP to 4.3 per cent, and it's expected that's over the last year, and it's expected to fall to three and three quarter per cent of GDP this year despite weak commodity prices and uh, relatively subdued world trade growth. While there probably will be some uh, increase in that percentage, uh, with an increase in economic activity associated with uh, coming out of the recession, we do expect that uh, smaller percentage to be sustainable in the longer term. Senator Panuza. Mr. President, my question without notice to the Minister, for the, land the Minister representing the Minister for Land Transport. I ask the Minister, is it a fact that the West Australian Black Spot program has not been received and also is it a fact that it will not be programmed until the West Australian Government passes legislation to do with certain internal traffic laws? The Minister representing the Minister for Land and Transport, Senator Richardson. I'll have to take that on notice and get a, an answer from the, uh, the Minister. Senator Crowley. Mr President, my question is to Senator Tate, representing the Minister for Health. Has the Minister seen the document put out by the private and public hospitals associations addressing health insurance and hospital funding? Can the Minister say what is the government's response to the document? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Tate. Mr President, I have myself had time to peruse uh, every page of that particular document, but I understand that the Minister for Health has. And of course, he welcomes that support for the core reforms contained in the NHS hospital papers uh, that is contained in those uh, documents. 
But the financing proposals put forward in those particular documents do nothing, we believe, to improve the access of Australians to health services. Well, it's not, it's not uh, as simple as to say, of course, they do, uh, Senator Heron, because it's clear that what they are designed to do is to greatly improve the lot of those uh, private hospitals, private insurance and, to a very much lesser extent, those public hospitals which can have private patients in them funded through private insurance uh, premiums. There, this, well, Mr President, uh, Senator Heron says to re relieve the pressure on public hospitals, and I know I should address my remarks through the chair. But uh, the fact is that there is no real allowance for growth in, public, in, uh, in uh, patient numbers in these proposals at all. The costings say that the proposals include a reduction in Commonwealth payments to the states to leave the states in a budget neutral position. What they have in mind, obviously, is that the extra revenue to be generated from the uh, bed day charges is offset by the cut in the grant to uh, public hospitals that is envisaged under the coalition's fight back program. Senator Heron notes in, uh, in assent to that proposition. In other words, there will be actually no more money available within the public health uh, hospital system. Uh, there will be an offset, an offset from, the, uh, from the private patients with their bed day charges, only just compensating for the decline in assistance from uh, state governments for the public hospitals, which is forced on them by the uh, cut in uh, funding from the federal government to the states, proposed by the opposition. So that there is no way in which public hospitals will in fact be better off or able to pr provide more services uh, to cater for more patients within the public hospital system. So uh, this, this, this is a complete, uh, completely uh, misleading to suggest that public hospitals will be improving their capacity to uh, serve more patients in the provision of uh, hospital care. Mr President, the fact is the federal government believes that the public hospital system uh, is the cornerstone of the Australian hospital system. It ought to be retained in a way which acknowledges the proper publicly funded support which has sustained them over many, many decades and uh, which ought to, as I say, remain the real foundation for their improvement, along with uh, other improvements required to ensure the delivery of effective health care to Australians in our hospitals. These financing measures are simply a means of using private insurance premiums taken out of the pockets of those who wish to use the hospital services of this country and are channelling them in a way which, as I say, barely offsets the reduction in government funding of public hospitals. Therefore, it won't improve the, uh, the status of the public hospitals in their ability to provide good health care for Australians. Senator Jogi. Supplementary, Senator Crowley. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister say from the uh, government's response that he's got whether or not this paper and its encouragement for private insurance will one increase or put pressures to increase health costs to the nation and what might it do to inflation? Minister, Senator Tate. Well, Mr President, it's quite clear that of course uh, there will be an inflationary impact of the, uh, of the proposals put forward insofar as they rely on private health insurance premiums because private health insurance premiums are of course taken into the calculation of the CPI. So that's a self-evident uh, consequence of the adoption of any such policy. Uh, and that will go up, of course, by a certain percentage, uh, Senator, which, which has to be uh, acknowledged by the opposition, as I'm sure it would be. And when one considers that the payment of private health insurance premiums in this way will be virtually required by the opposition of Australian households and families, in addition to the payment of their Medicare levy, in addition to the payment of their Medicare levy, which Medicare levy will, of course, only get them 75 per cent return of the schedule fee rather than 85 per cent under current, current arrangements, one can see that the co-payment which people will have to make when visiting their doctor, of course, which is also a very integral part of the opposition's plan. So in all sorts of ways, the cost of the provision of health care to the Australian community, whether it's primary health care as one visits one's GP surgery or into the hospital system, the cost must increase to families and households uh, throughout Australia. So, Mr President, in that way there is no doubt that uh, the cost of uh, health care throughout Australia will, will, uh, will become much greater and will be financed simply by persons having to pay private health insurance premiums, which will then, of course, basically go into the hands of the private hospitals and, of course, the members of the AMA. 
Jogi, Senator Jogi Peterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is addressed to the Minister for Transport and Communications, Senator Richardson. I draw the Minister's attention to Australia Post's former system of reduced mailing rates for registered publications, which enabled small trade and leisure magazines to provide their readers with attractively priced subscription rates while still making a profit. Is the Minister aware that with the introduction of Australia Post's print post price rises, the cost of mailing these publications to subscribers will become prohibitively high? Is he also aware that these new charges will see mailing costs increase by up to 223 per cent above the level of only 18 months ago? I ask the minister, with inflation increasing just over 1.5 per cent over the last year, how can Australia Post justify these new charges? I further ask the minister, in view of the highly depressed state of Australia's economy, which has markedly lowered advertising revenues in such publications, together with the flood of publications from overseas, what action will the minister take to ensure that this action will not prove to be the final nail in the coffin of many small Australian publishing businesses? The Minister for Transport and Communications, Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, last night, Senator Jockey Peterson, this issue was raised at the Estimates Committee, and uh, Australia Post uh, gave a number of specific answers, and I'll get them for you. But I think I can uh, explain today the gist of what they said. The uh, magazines that, uh, to which you refer have been uh, loss makers for uh, Australia Post for a very long time. The losses amount to many millions of dollars. They are very considerable indeed. And when you uh, give Australia Post a charter that says you shall operate as a commercial organisation, you'll organise yourself on proper business lines, it's very difficult then to say to them, but where you're making losses, you're not allowed to fix it. The truth is, of course, that the ordinary users of postal services have been subsidising the uh, rates for these magazines for many years. And uh, whether that cross subsidy can be justified is, I think, uh, the heart of the problem. As I understand last night's evidence, the average increases are around 30 to 35 per cent, uh, and they were necessary to at least get this service up to the point of being commercially viable. Now, I don't believe, as a government, we ought to sanction the kind of cross subsidy that makes uh, every uh, uh, person who uses the postal service across Australia subsidise the loss-making uh, uh, parts of the business. So I think really what Australia Post have done is live up to the charter, and I don't really think we can ask them to do any more than that. Senator Shamrat. Thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. It's in three parts. Firstly, can the minister confirm that the final report of the Resource Assessment Commission Forest and Timber Inquiry has been forwarded to the Prime Minister and other relevant ministers for their consideration? Secondly, if so, why has the government failed to make this important report available to the parliament? particularly as its recommendations would be central to the Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs consideration of the Forest Conservation and Development Bill 1992. And thirdly, will the minister undertake to immediately make this report available to the parliament? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Mr President, my understanding is that the report will be tabled tomorrow, and I think that uh, will in effect answer the other questions that uh, the senator has put to us. Senator Archer. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce. The Minister will recall that on 25 March, in response to a question without notice from Senator Childs, Senator Button said that an additional $51 million was being made available by the Prime Minister's One Nation statement to assist with the restructuring of the textile, clothing and footwear industries. Would the minister comment on the statement by the president of the Textile Closing and Footwear Council of Australia that the amount now allocated to the restructuring program is in fact not 51 million, but only 10 million more than what had been originally promised for this purpose and as outlined on the 12th of March 1991 in the statement building a competitive Australia? The minister representing the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Cook. I haven't seen the statement referred to by the industry spokesman that you have mentioned, Senator. 
I am aware of, uh, of course, what the One Nation Statement has said, and uh, I am aware too that uh, in terms of uh, tariff protection for this industry, your party favours a package which removes all tariff protection, a zero tariff protection, which would bleed this industry and drive it into the ground. I am aware of that. But in terms of uh, this particular uh, statement by the industry, in relation to what Senator Button said on the 24th of March, I will obtain the necessary information and reply to your question later. Senator Kerno. My question is to Senator Collins, representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Given that the states are predictably saying that they don't have enough money to implement the deaths in custody recommendations, and given that this opportunity is uh, generally acknowledged as the last opportunity this century to move forward on the question of Aboriginal Affairs, I ask the Minister does he believe that the states, as they are claiming, don't have enough money for this purpose? Does the government support the call by the New South Wales Premier for the matter to be addressed at the Premier's conference next month? And finally, if the matter is not resolved adequately, is there a case for the Commonwealth to assume its national responsibility in the delivery of services to Aboriginal people? The Minister representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh as Senator Tate, uh, in an earlier question related specifically to the law and justice uh, response uh, in this package, uh, uh, commended uh, this morning's editorial in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, as I wish to do, because the opening paragraph of, uh, of that editorial uh, supported uh, or echoed precisely what the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs said when he brought this statement down in the House yesterday, and that is the fundamental aim of any package that is designed to adequately respond uh, or attempt to adequately respond to uh, deaths, Aboriginal deaths in custody must be directed at keeping Aboriginal people out of jail. The editorial goes on to, uh, to uh, say that since the report uh, was brought down, uh, 25 Aboriginal people have in fact died in custody. The precise figure, in fact, Mr. President, is 28. And it may be of some interest to senators to know that in that same period of time that 28 Aboriginal people have died in custody, 150 non-Aboriginal people have died in custody. The other pertinent thing about that statistic is those figures are consistent across the age groups, so that for every one Aboriginal person in the age 20 to 30 age range that has died in custody, around six non-Aboriginal people of the same age group have died in custody. The impact of that figure, of course, is that that uh, precisely reflects, as Senator Tate alluded to in his answer, the early research of the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody Commission that found some three years ago when this process started that that was the situation. Therefore, I think a fair test is whether the government's response does address that fundamental question of attempting to try to reduce the numbers of Aboriginal people uh, that are in prison. What is required? Yes, indeed, I would agree with that, Senator. Mr. President, uh, I think that the, the statement comprehensively does pass that test. In terms of uh, the response, I think it, it is fair to say that it was always expected by every party concerned in this that there would be a national response to what is a serious national problem. That is a combined effort by federal and state governments, state and territory governments, and of course, many of the specific problems relating to the difficulties Aboriginal people are having emanate directly, and I don't say this in a critical sense, I sim simply say it as a matter of fact, right direct directly to areas that are fundamentally a responsibility of state governments. Therefore, it is appropriate for the Commonwealth to look to the states to assist uh, in uh, providing an adequate response. Mr. President, uh, I cannot answer, I, I'm not in a position to answer. Uh, whether the states in fact have enough money to fund this because I, I'm not well, well I mean uh, everyone poor, always though. cries poor but I'm just not in a position to comment on the, on, the, on the budgets of all of the states and territories. I noted the, uh, the suggestion of, uh, of Premier Griner and uh, I also note uh, the public statements of the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs that he is confident that he can advance this matter satisfactory and we all hope he does by further consultations with state governments and I understand he's going to embark on that process. 
in terms of the responsibilities that the Commonwealth has got, and they are fundamental responsibilities, I do believe that the initial response of the Commonwealth has, in fact, as it's designed to do, set the lead. It's a substantial response. It's a package of $150 million. I particularly would like to applaud the uh, direction of money to bail hostels uh, as part of that package. That is a practical, sensible and, I believe, will be a productive response to what is a real problem I know on the ground in terms of trying to keep particularly young Aboriginal offenders out of jail in the first instance. And I'm also very pleased to see, Mr President, as part of that package, a very substantial sum of money that's going to be direct directed towards alleviating substance abuse. And regrettably, and I'm afraid it's too consistent to pretend otherwise, substance abuse is a recurring and consistent feature uh, in Aboriginal offences. Mr President, uh, I do believe that the Commonwealth has given a substantial and commendable upfront lead to the states in what has been initially a very substantial response by the Commonwealth. I'm confident, as the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs is, and I hope this will, this will be the case, the matter can be progressed satisfactorily by negotiation with the states. Senator Newman. My question is directed to the Minister for Transport and Communications. I preface my question by noting that the Cabinet last night decided there should be no longer any opportunity for incidental tobacco advertising on television on the basis that the government accepts a link between certain television programming and subsequent behaviour. In that the Minister intends to permit sexual deviates, armed with a PIN number and a smart card, to perv on pay TV pornography in the comfort of their own homes, Order. Can the minister explain why the rights of these men should take priority over the rights of all women not to be degraded nor to be exposed to physical danger from copycat sex crimes? Minister for Transport and Communications, Senator right. Richardson. It takes a fair bit to surprise me, Mr. President, in this place, but that has surprised me. Um, I, should, uh, I should preface my answer, Senator Newman, by saying that. Uh, all I can say to you is what I intend to recommend to the government, because obviously no decision has been made, so it's not government policy. But I, uh, I do not intend to. Uh, Order. Order. I, um, I do not intend to uh, to allow pornography on pay TV. I made that fairly clear in a meeting of uh, party colleagues the other night, uh, and I can repeat it here. That's at least what I'll recommend. Whether my Colleagues seek to uh, overrule me is uh, is uh, another question, but certainly uh, we will not not accept pornography on pay television. The next uh, question then uh, then comes down to uh, to uh, our rating. And if uh, if you are if you are inferring, Senator, that uh, or indeed Senator Harridan in his interjection, that uh, an R can equal X. That the content in them is the is the same, then you'd both be wrong because the X-rated stuff is uh, is very much tougher. As far as pay television is concerned, again, it is a personal opinion and not government policy. Well, hang on, listen to what I'm order. saying. And then order, listen. order, oh. order. Well, Ignore the interjections, Senator Richardson. We have, we have a fundamental disagreement on that, Senator, but that's not too surprising. I have. It's a matter of what I've seen with my own eyes. Whether the eyes can mislead you is another matter. The eyes were popping out a couple of times on this trip. Order. I, in terms of our rating, uh, Senator Newman, um, I, uh, I believe that uh, on a pay television operation, uh, just the same as uh, you can get uh, R-rated in video stores or watch them in a movie house, when you are paying extra money, when it's not free-to-air television, when it requires a dish put on the roof and, a, and an extra box put, a, put on the television set, I believe people will be entitled to see R-rated movies. Having said that. Having said that, well, just a minute, Senator Harding, let me answer it. If you want to ask another question, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, having said that, um, I believe that uh, that can only work properly, Senator, with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the right kind of smart card technology. Now, that technology is in operation in a number of countries around the world, and what it means, of course, is that parents will be able to determine in the home themselves what uh, they believe is suitable for their children to view or not. The, uh, the whole pay TV operation won't work unless the card is in. It will be up to parents to determine whether or not uh, kids can see it. But if the argument is to be that adults can't watch 
on pay TV that they're going to be paying something like $40 a month for, the same that they can see down at the movie house or get for 4 or $5 at the video store, then uh, I'm afraid I have to disagree with you. Senator Burns. Mr. President, I direct my question to the Minister for Shipping and Aviation, Senator Collins. Minister, are you aware of ongoing attacks on the proposed federal funding for the upgrading of Townsville Port? And will this criticism all the government plans for this particular port? The Minister for Shipping and Aviation, Senator Collins. A question without notice, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, yes, I am aware of the ongoing attacks on the funding of the Townsville Port, although they have receded in recent weeks. Mr. Uh, yes, indeed, Order. Mr. President. And what I must say, I was extremely interested to see happen, is that after the attack was launched here in the Parliament by Senator Pera, in fact, on the same day that it happened, on the same day that it happened, the opposition here in the Senate announced by way of a press release that they were about, and I use their word, to blitz North Queensland with a team of 19 opposition senators. And indeed, uh, and indeed, they did, uh, they did uh, blitz. In fact, in fact. In fact, they put out a press release saying, Senator Macdonald put out a supporting press release saying that it wasn't going to be a fun tourist uh, arrangement. That it was, it was going to be all, it was going to be all go go go. Quote. I religiously searched all of the media covering the trip, and I couldn't find out where they went, 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 uh, Mr. President, because the only note. The only note, the only, uh, the only prominent press, uh, press coverage of their of the go go go, the go 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 trip Order. was uh, a very prominent photograph in the Townsville Bulletin. The five of the go 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 as white water rafting down a river. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. President, I think I think the Order. I think the thing that I most noted because I waited Order. for. It, was Order. that a team of five peeled off to Townsville and were several days in Townsville. Order. Order. One day Order. In, Will the ministers one day ignore in the interjections? One day, in, one day in Townsville. Despite the fact that the federal opposition here in the Senate specifically attacked and criticised the funding of the port of Townsville, the most important port in North Queensland and one of the heartbeats economically of that city, not one single senator bothered to go near the port while they were in Townsville, not one of them went near the port authority, not one single one of them lifted a finger, lifted a finger to actually investigate what the money was likely to be spent on or to give the port authority an opportunity to put their views. Mr President, I believe I believe, therefore, that the real reason for the trip to Queensland was exactly as the honourable member for Herbert said it was, and that was a task force to try and find more things to knock off Point the of federal order. budget. Point of, order. Point, order. Point of order. Point of order. Senator Macdonald. Mr. President, if Senator Collins wants to debate the trip, we're more than happy to do that and refer him to what the Townsville Bulletin editorial said about the trip when he congratulated the Liberal Party for showing some interest in North Queensland, which the Labor Party never does. Order. Never does. Now, order. if he wants to do that— Order. Resume your seat. Order. It's no point of order. Senator Calvert. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mr President. Mike. Order. Order. My question without notice—I wasn't on the raft, Senator Burns. My question without notice— Order. 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 Senator Calvert. Thank you. Order. There are too many interjections on the government side. Senator Calvert. My question is to the Minister for Justice, Senator Tate. Is the Minister aware, is the minister aware that the Australian government's record in relation to the privacy of our citizens has received strong criticism at the inaugural meeting of the worldwide privacy body, Privacy International, which was held in Washington this month. Can the minister confirm or deny that the government is to establish a major investigative database 
on Australian citizens, which is to be known as the Law Enforcement Access Network. If such a network is to be established, can the minister indicate to the Senate what public consultation has taken place, what is the intended usage of the database, and is the Privacy Commissioner to be given the right to overview the operation of the database itself? And finally, can the minister give an undertaking that there will be a full and honest uh, revaluation from the government of the full facts surrounding any database of Australian citizens? The Minister for Justice and Consumer Affairs, Senator Tate. Mr. President, uh, the opposition appears to be trying to hop on a hysterical bandwagon so far as this particular project is concerned. What the law enforcement uh, uh, facility, the Law Enforcement Access Network, as it's called, or LEAN for short, is, uh, is to deal with is material that's already on the public record. It will be bringing together that material which is generally available to any citizen whatsoever from company records and, uh, and land ownership records. Land ownership records and, uh, and, and uh, company records are already in the public domain. This is simply a way of bringing them together in a convenient form to enable uh, law enforcement uh, investigations to be undertaken. And, uh, this parliament itself, the Senate itself, had an extensive debate when we debated the Privacy Act as to the way in which law enforcement could be conducted in a way which was compatible with the privacy principles. And in fact, uh, this particular project has been looked at from that point of view, has been found to be quite consistent with the provision made by this very Senate chamber so far as law enforcement activities are concerned in that regard. Indeed, the Privacy Commissioner, Mr Kevin O'Connor, who has been mentioned uh, by Senator Calvert, has of course been very much involved in the development of this particular proposal. He has been consulted on the development of all the privacy and security procedures that will be uh, involved in, uh, in this particular project. And uh, I believe that that particular oversight, I think was the term used by Senator Calvert, would be very appropriately continued. But I do want to emphasise that one is not talking about uh, secret or confidential information. One is simply bringing together information which is already in the public uh, domain. The uh, stringent privacy and security protection, Senator, which have been specified for this particular system include computer security controls that verify users' identity and prevent unauthorised use, audit and accountability trials, trials which will allow any system abuses to be detected and monitored, and sanctions, of course, under the Crimes Act and the Privacy Act, as put down by this parliament, will serve to deter and uh, punish uh, any violators. So I believe, Mr uh, President, that uh, the sort of impression that has been given overseas about this particular project is quite misleading and deceptive, and uh, I'm sure that uh, my answer so far, anyway, will have satisfied Senator Calvert's uh, concerns. Senator Evans. Ask further questions be placed on notice. Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. During question time, Senator Archer asked me a question uh, in my capacity as minister representing the minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce. I uh, have now obtained some further information in relation to that question. When the uh, TCF plan was first announced by Senator Button in 1987, the government said it would provide up to, up to $120 million for industry restructuring. Allocations to the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Development Authority had been made until the One Nation Statement on the basis of need, that is, demand. To last November, only $79 million uh, had been allocated. During industry consultations prior to the One Nation Statement, Textile, Clothing and Footwear Council of Australia sought a halt to reductions in protection for the industry. This was rejected. However, the government recognised the need to further assist these industries to restructure. Therefore, the One Nation Statement committed the remaining funds up to $120 million plus an additional $10 million. Um, Senator Zakharov. Seek leave to give a notice of motion. His leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Zakharov. Mr. President, I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move that the time for the presentation of the report of the Standing Committee on Community Affairs on the examination of annual reports be extended to the 7th of May 1992. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a brief statement relating to the notice I've just given. His leave granted. Leaves granted. Senator Zakharov. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee seeks an extension of time to report on annual reports received since its last report to the Senate in September 1991. 
The committee's priority has been its report on the employment of people with disabilities to be tabled tomorrow and the completion of two other substantial inquiries. The committee will report by the 7th of May 1992. Senator Alston. President, uh, pursuant to the order of the Senate of the 28th of September 1988, I ask the Minister representing the Treasurer, that being Senator Evans, to explain why answers have not yet been provided to my questions on notice numbers 1699 and 1718 concerning the Child Support Agency and the Superannuation Guarantee Levy, respectively. Senator Evans. Mr. President, I just became aware of this uh, a few minutes ago. I've sought information, uh, haven't yet got a response. All I can undertake to do is to ensure that those answers are given as soon as possible. Senator Austin. I move that the Senate take note of the uh, answer. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I don't in any way hold Senator Evans personally responsible, and uh, I don't even hold uh, Senator Button uh, directly responsible, but certainly uh, in their representative capacities. Uh, they have something to answer for, because these uh, questions, although they are not as egregiously out of date as some recent ones to which uh, Senator Button has finally provided answers, nonetheless are very serious policy questions, and particularly the one in relation to the superannuation guarantee levy. I understand that the bill has uh, become available this afternoon. That gives these questions an, an even greater significance than they might otherwise have. But particularly when one has in mind that the Senate uh, Select Committee on Superannuation received a letter from uh, the Treasurer before last, before last, Mr Kerrin, dated 2 October, in which he undertook to provide that committee with a submission from Treasury. Now that's more than six months ago. In other words, Treasury is deliberately treating the Senate Committee with contempt and is clearly uh, doing its best to frustrate the uh, deliberation. Uh, the sensible deliberation and consideration by that committee of some fundamental issues. And that is why these questions are on notice. They were put on notice on the 27th of February last, uh, in view of this uh, continuing failure on the part of uh, Treasury. And uh, I therefore uh, want to make it very clear to uh, Senator Evans and those that he represents that unless answers are received before question time tomorrow, that I will be moving to. Uh, uh, censure the government uh, in no uncertain terms, because it is uh, abundantly clear to anyone who studies these questions that they go to the very heart of the debate about superannuation in this country. In many respects, uh, what the government uh, is in the process of doing is setting up a superannuation guarantee levy bill to legitimate uh, what is a compulsory scheme arises purely because of the comprehensive failure of the award-based system to deliver the goods, and yet uh, when all logic tells you that it ought to be uh, put forward as a replacement for that failed system, it's simply to be superimposed on top of it and to make matters uh, comprehensively worse. Now, these questions go not only to uh, the uh, essence of the SGL, but they raise even more important matters in terms of the uh, impact on employment and inflation of a proposal which is clearly going to result in employers having to find, in some instances, up to 12 per cent of wages by way of contributions over the next eight years. An impossible task, uh, unless it's at the expense of uh, profits and retained earnings and therefore the ability to uh, reinvest in plant and equipment, uh, expand businesses, create jobs, or, on the other hand, uh, it will be at the expense of wage increases. And I have no doubt that it is the latter and that the ACTU is comprehensively hoodwinking its own membership. What they don't realise, and which they very well ought to know by now, is that they are going to be the ones who are going to pay for the privilege of disqualifying themselves from the age pension. In other words, over the next eight years, the workers of Australia are going to be forced to go without wage increases, even to the level of inflation in order to disqualify themselves, in other words, to go without the age pension. So that's where the burden of superannuation in this country is going to lie, on the shoulders of those that the government claims to represent. Not only a heartless policy, but a very dishonest one. And I hope that people like Senator Faulkner, who probably weren't aware of this until now, will uh, rush back to the ACTU and tell them that it's just not on. And unless we do know how this is going to be funded and what the employment and inflation consequences are, 
then your people are being hoodwinked. Is the CAI right or wrong when it says that there will be something of the order of 60,000 jobs lost over the next decade? Senator McMullen uh, wrote a very interesting uh, article in the Canberra Times on all of this, uh, again quite misleading. H had the temerity to suggest that uh, one of the great achievements of award superannuation was to extend the spread of superannuation to part-time and casuals. What, of course, he didn't tell them was that they are being taken to the cleaners. Unless you have superannuation uh, entitlements well in excess of 3 per cent or 5 per cent, all of your contributions are eaten up in administration and insurance charges. An absolute disgrace. And the workers of Australia wouldn't stand for it for a moment if they knew the true facts. But they're not being told the true facts. They're simply being told by this government that they've managed to achieve a spread in coverage. Well, the price of that spread of coverage is that uh, three or five per cent of a minimum $3,000 will leave you behind. In theory, you'll be owing money to the insurer. That's the price you're paying for this so-called spread in superannuation coverage. And in order to do it, you've already been forced to go without three per cent in terms of wage rises, because the ACTU constantly tells us that the first round three per cent was, a, uh, was at their expense wasn't an impost on employers, and there is absolutely no doubt at all, if you read Senator McMullen's article, that the balance of the 12 per cent is also going to be the workers' shout. So, in other words, the workers of Australia are going to go without wage increases over the next decade in order that they can pick up the tab for superannuation in this country. And that's why these set of questions are fundamentally important. We want to know what the real savings impact is going to be, for example of a compulsory system. Because I have no doubt at all that Senator Walsh is right in saying there will simply be a saving switch as a result of the SGL. Individuals will reduce their discretionary savings to compensate for enforced savings through the SGL. And indeed it's quite clear from the, the most recent Mintel survey that that's what is happening already, that employers are scaling down their level of voluntary contributions, discretionary contributions, and workers are doing the same. They're going to simply settle for a lowest common denominator approach. They'll wash their hands of super. They'll leave it to the employer, who, of course, is screwing them at their own expense. So the end result will be that uh, the workers will simply get the bare minimum, not enough to really do them any good in retirement, sufficient to disqualify themselves at least in part from an age pension, and this government will go out and tell them they've never had it so good. Well, I think it's a travesty and a disgrace. And one of the best ways of demonstrating this is to look at the answers that are provided. If the government doesn't provide them before question time tomorrow, we will know that there is only one inference to be drawn, and that is that all of those allegations are true, that the government has no defence, and that it's simply trying to hoodwink the public for a little longer. And uh, we're not prepared to cop that. Senator McGibbon. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a brief statement. Ah, public sorry, the question is that the Senate take note of the question. I thought you were going to speak on that. Uh, question is the Senate take note of the question. Those of, that uh, those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Mr Acting President. I seek leave to make a brief statement in the public interest on an answer by Senator Collins to a question by Senator Charles yesterday. Is leave granted? There's no objection. I thank the Senate, Mr Acting President. Yesterday, Senator Collins made an incomplete answer to a question about the failure of an F-28 aircraft to appear on the new Thompson radar at Cairns. Uh, and that aircraft joined at least three other wide-bodied aircraft, Boeing 767s, on, in not showing on the radar screen, despite being often in the field of uh, screening of at least three different Thompson radars. Senator Collins said, and I quote, that on investigation it was discovered that the problem with the F-28 was a faulty radar transponder on board the aircraft, and it had nothing whatever to do with the system itself. Now, Mr Acting President, the point is that it really doesn't matter whether the transponder on the aircraft is working or not. The primary radar detects the aircraft and shows it on its screen and plots its track. And the air traffic controller asks the pilot to uh, set one of three or four frequencies on the transponder and squawk ident, and that gives an indication on the blip on the radar screen as to what the particular aircraft is. But whether the frequency is incorrectly set whether the transponder is working imperfectly or whether in fact there is no transponder at all 
is irrelevant to the display of the presence of the aircraft, because that's a function of the primary radar, and it should appear on the screen. Now, what happened on this occasion and on other occasions was no indication of the presence of the aircraft appeared on the radar screens, according to the air traffic controllers, and that is documented and beyond dispute. And it's not correct to blame the failure on the transponder the way Senator Collins did, and uh, to that extent he certainly misled the Senate in response to his answer yesterday. And to castigate honourable senators like Senator Macdonald and Senator Aitchie and myself who have raised this matter, which does relate very much to uh, public safety, is, I believe, quite irresponsible. Uh, Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr, Deputy, Mr Acting Deputy Chairman. I seek leave to move that the Senate take note of Senator Cook's answer to Senator West's question in question time today. Is leave granted? Been no objection. Leave granted. I move that the Senate take note of Senator Cook's answer to Senator West's question in question time today. Mr Acting Deputy Chairman, it happens today to be April Fool's Day, but the public will not be fooled by the selective and scurrilous reporting of my press release that took part, place in the Senate today on the part of Senator Cook. It was a desperate attempt to create a smokescreen to try and cover up the tragic youth unemployment figures in Victoria. Forty-six per cent of young people seeking full-time work are currently unemployed. And that's what I said in my press release, and I quote from it. There are nearly 41,000 young Victorians looking for full-time work, including 24,600 teenagers who have been forced to start off their working lives on the dole queue. That's what I said. Yes, the heading did say one in two young Victorians unemployed, but many headings and uh, headlines on newspapers say 10 per cent unemployed in Australia. It doesn't mean 10 per cent of all babies, old people and people who are not seeking full-time work. It, we all understand what it means. It means 10 per cent of those people seeking full-time work or seeking work. That's what that heading means, one in two young Victorians unemployed. But no, Senator Cook chooses to distort that. He doesn't have the gall to table or incorporate my press release, but uses question time to indicate or to uh, misrepresent what I actually said. And uh, I ask, Senator, I ask uh, Acting Deputy President if I may incorporate, seek leave to incorporate my press release into Hansard so that the public can see exactly what I did say and how on two occasions in that press release I qualified it by saying, as I've already said, that uh, 41,000 young Victorians were looking for, who were looking for full-time work were unemployed, and I said the cold, hard fact is that one in two young Victorian workers, not one in two of all young Victorians, one in two young Victorian workers have been thrown onto the unemployment scrap heap as a result of the recession that the Prime Minister claimed we had to have. If you, Minister, read uh, vinegar and brown paper in the Fin Review, which were equally, were just as wrong, just as wrong, when they reported that, I, that I'd said that, and in fact didn't go on to say that I had twice qualified in my press release the fact that it was of those young people who were seeking work. Mr Baldwin's tried to, to cast a smoke screen and say that young unemployment in Australia is only 8 per cent—8 per cent of all those young people, not counting those who are at school or that, counting those who are at TAFE or in higher education. But that's what this government is trying to do—cover up the fact that what you're going to leave for the next generation is a standard of living that's worse than has ever been before in Australia, and it will be the first generation who passes on to the next generation a standard of living that is worse. And I am ashamed that you, this government, has brought us to this point compared with when most of us here in this chamber were young. And when I was 15, I was working in an office, and I left that job, and four days later I had another job, and I didn't have to worry whether I was going to get a job. I got a job. But that's not the case for young people today, not the case for those 46,000 young people in Victoria. And you have the hide to come in here and to misrepresent by 
selectively quoting from the heading and not quoting from the, from the full text. And I'll leave it for those who choose to read and see the full text of that to decide whether you were wrong or whether I was right. And I think I know which side the public would come down on. Uh, order, order. Senator Patterson sought leave to incorporate a document. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. And the question is that the Senate take note of the answer. You wish to speak to that, Senator Bowen? Senator Bowen. Directing Deputy President, uh, I thank the Senate for the opportunity of very briefly responding to one of the more disgraceful and dishonourable statements by this minister who has a record of such disgraceful behaviour. He deliberately, I presume, deliberately misled the Senate because I can't believe he would not know the facts on this matter. He claimed falsely here that three in ten, only three in ten people aged 15 to 19, are in the workforce in Australia. The Australian Bureau of Statistics clearly shows that to be yet another of Senator Cook's false assertions based on no facts and with a deliberate intention to mislead the Senate and the Australian people. Point of order. Uh, point of order. Senator Cook. See if you can get it right this time. No, I ask Mr, uh, I ask, uh, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President that the term that the term deliberately mislead, which Senator Bohm has used deliberately, be withdrawn, as it is a, a reflection on me which is just not uh, entitled to be made by him or anyone I else. I withdraw the word misleading. Point of order. Senator Bohm, you've I, I withdraw the word misleading. I hadn't realised the minister no, was simply deliberate, incompetent. Deliberate yes, I, I withdraw deliberate. I hadn't realised the minister was simply incompetent. And the incompetence relates to this. And I'd be grateful, Minister, if you would listen for a change instead of responding to everything with the open mouth. The facts and the figures are here for you. I'll give you a copy if you really need to be informed. The figures in the Australian Bureau of Statistics Labor Force Estimates for February 1992 show that the population between the ages of 15 and 19 is 1,330 million. Uh, sorry, 1 million 330,000. 1.33 million. The number of people in that age group in the Labor Force Minister is 774,600. Not three in ten, Minister, six in ten. You misled the House, apparently because of incompetence. The number of people not in the Labor Force, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, is 556,800. That's in that uh, age group. That is four in ten, not the seven in ten you endeavoured to try to pretend to this chamber were the real figures. What you have done, Minister, is to confuse the number of people in tertiary and secondary education with the number of people not in the workforce. What you simply don't understand is that a large proportion of those people are at work, either full-time or part-time, as well as undergoing some kind of training. Your massive incompetence, because you assure me it's not deliberate, your massive incompetence leads you to have made a grievous error. And the facts are simple and clear. Even if we include all those wanting only part-time work, we get a figure, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, of 27 per cent, two and a half times the total rate for all Australians. 27 per cent of young people can't even find a part-time work, let alone full-time work. But the key point that, uh, that Senator Patterson was making is, of course, totally accurate. And that key point is this. You have never objected to the expression there is a 10 per cent unemployment rate, ever. And yet, you magically object to Senator Patterson using as an unemployment rate a proportion of the labour force. Yet the 10 per cent labour for, uh, unemployment rate you happily accept all the time, and apparently too happily because you're doing nothing to fix it up. That 10 per cent rate that you accept is only as a percentage of the labour force. Exactly the same criteria used to denigrate Senator Patterson, and last week tried to denigrate me, 
exactly the same criteria you would apply to the total unemployment rate would make it, for your information, 7.2, just in case you want to try to mislead the House about that as well. Now, the fact is you have never complained, as you, indeed you should not in the matter of youth unemployment, you have never complained about headlines or anything else that says the unemployment rate is 10 per cent because that is the proportion of the labour force. Just as Senator Patterson's one in two is totally accurate as a proportion of the labour force seeking full-time work. And if she had extended it to cover those people seeking part-time work, it would still be, uh, for Australia, almost 30 per cent and no doubt in Victoria far above it. I just finish on this point. Would you explain to the Senate how youth unemployment is so wonderful according to your figures when in fact over the last two years 182,900 uh, 182, full-time youth jobs have been wiped out? Can you explain to the Senate how youth employment, unemployment is so wonderful when in fact the total job losses over the last two years of 158,200, that includes part-time work, of that 158,200 total jobs lost, 157,700 are youth jobs. They almost make up the total number of jobs lost. And you have the temerity, Minister, to come into this place and seek to mislead this chamber on the severity of youth unemployment. Why don't you pretend total unemployment is only 7.2 per cent? Why don't you? Why don't you? Because you know it to be false, that's why. And you, are, you have double standards. And because you're so embarrassed about the appalling level of youth unemployment, you will stoop at nothing, nothing, to try to deceive the Australian people about the true nature of youth unemployment. You should be embarrassed, you should be ashamed, and it is a disgrace that you are using the young people of Australia in this way, in this way with a petty debating point which is false anyway, to try to cover up your failure, your failure, Minister, to do anything to diminish the horrendous level of youth unemployment which your Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister, said in 1984 was such, was such that no government should ever be forgiven for allowing it to happen. And you might say, ah, but if you use a particular set of figures, you will find that youth unemployment, as defined by you, was worse under the Fraser years than, uh, than it is now. Can I tell you, can I tell you, if you want to have a look at the official statistics, have a look at the unemployed persons, that's the actual level of unemployed persons, in February 1992, aged 15 to 19, uh, uh, 1992, it was 209,300. In 1983, it was 209,200. Just as a matter of accuracy, there are just a thousand more. A thousand more. This is not seasonally adjusted. These are the actual figures, the actual number of young people out of work. Unemployed persons aged 15 to 19. According to Australian Bureau of Statistics, you're going to try to pretend they tell fibs, are you? Now, what is even worse is that another Australian Bureau of Statistics survey showed that there were 150,000 odd people who were not, young people aged 15 to 19 who were not on, uh, actually, it included all young people, not just 15 to 19, I have to concede that. There were 150 odd thousand people who were attending school or tertiary institutions who said, if a job was available, they wanted it, but they weren't actively seeking it because there were no jobs available. And that was a survey last September by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Add that 150,000 odd who really want a job but have been paid to go back to school under our study, and what sort of horrendous unemployment figure do you get? You're taking the credit for having sent back to school by paying the Moss study, those people who could not get a job and yet who want a job. You've managed a huge retention rate largely because the young people of Australia can't get jobs and they may as well go back to school. And you're crowing about it. Minister, your deception, 
You're misleading the parliament. Your use of young people in this way is a disgrace. Uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. What we've heard is so much sound and fury signifying a back down. Oh. Signifying oh. a back down from the opposition. Because in the middle of all of that robust rhetoric was the comment by Senator Patterson that I shouldn't rely on her headline. That in fact, if you read what she says in the Hansard, she said words to the effect that the headline is wrong and I qualified it later. Therefore I am to be excused for saying, therefore I am to be excused for saying one in two young Australians are unemployed. Order. Order. Senator. I ask him to withdraw that. Not a point of I do ask for uh, Senator Bohm, Mr President, to be brought to order and, and to be asked to withdraw the reflection he just made on me, which is despicable. Order, Senator Bohm, you did call the minister a liar. I would ask you to withdraw. Uh, well, I suppose I have to withdraw. I, I withdraw. He was just totally misleading and deliberately so. Minister. Ah, well, here we have a very funny uh, turn of events. Senator Bohm just dishes it out in great dollops. And when he is asked to observe normal courtesies in the chamber, can't bring himself to be a human being, wants to continue on being a, a nasty person. Well, fine, let that be the case. Well, uh, Senator Macdonald, Mr. Mr. President, I did hear that comment. I'd ask you to withdraw that. Yeah. Yeah. That is I, 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 yes, I, I'm sorry, but it's just uh, this minister God, really uh, just ask you your withdraw. Patience. I Thank do you. withdraw. Uh, Thank you, Sen uh, Minister. It seems uh, nastiness is a contagious disease on the opposition benches. And no wonder, because when I raise, when the question was raised with me in question time today, it hit a raw nerve in the opposition. The facts are that this government has always been uncomfortable with the level of unemployment in this country and always been concerned about it. And we're concerned about it, particularly for the long-term unemployed and particularly for young people in this country. And we don't yield to the synthetic concern of the opposition on this as being superior. That this is a genuine commitment and concern from this government, but what we have always tried to do, what we have always tried to do, is tell the truth about this. Is tell the truth, and we have, and we insist that this debate be, be conducted truthfully, honestly, and fairly. And that is the reason uh, why, in my answer to the question, I uh, concentrated on simply setting out the facts. Now, if the facts offend, if the facts offend. If the facts are uncomfortable, well, they are uncomfortable for the government because the level of unemployment is palpably too high. But if they offend the opposition, then it is clear to see why. You only have to turn to the opposition's consumption tax package and see what does the opposition propose to do. What does the opposition propose to do about the level of youth unemployment or unemployment in general in this country? Well, what it proposes to do is to abolish the labour market support programs abolish the labour market support programs that we have in place to provide training, job search, to provide the subsidies to employers to take on young people and things of that nature. To just wipe all those out. They're gone. Kiss them goodbye. Ta-da. Don't see them again. That's the opposition's proposal. That's an indication of concern and sympathy for the plight <coughs> of young unemployed. The, uh, the, uh, the, the next part of uh, the proposal in the, uh, in the consumption tax package is to abolish the, the CES. The CES gets the chop. That's finished. It's not, uh, not there any longer. You put that out to private contract. The next thing uh, with the abolition of the CES goes to the Youth Access Centre and the Youth Bureau. If both those were retained, it could be said at least fairly that there is some concern for the unemployed by, by providing services to help them find employment. But no, under the consumption tax package, they get the chop too. Now, this from an opposition that claims concern. This from, from an opposition that claims worry and, and, uh, and concern. It hardly matches the rhetoric. Now, the sin, apparently, that I have committed, Mr Acting Deputy President, is that I fingered them. That's the sin that I committed. And I fingered them by saying, let's look at the facts. The facts are that if you compare during the last year of the, of the, of the Fraser government 
a government in which Mr Howard was the Treasurer and Mr Hewson was the senior economic adviser to the Prime Minister of the day. If you compare the unemployment figures then to the unemployment figures uh, that I have uh, for February this year, seasonally adjusted as the proper measure, you find that there is 32,900 people between the ages of 15 and 19 in work now compared to them. In work now compared to them, and this out of a much larger labour force, out of a much larger labour force. That offends the opposition because it goes essentially to this question. Sure, we have, sure we have a recession, and sure we're coming out of it. And what the electors of Wills and what the electors of other electorates in Australia will judge the major parties in this country on is who they believe can, can perform best to lower the level of unemployment for permanent careers for young people and not artificial jobs best. That's what they'll judge us on. And when we compare what the opposition did, comparing to what we are doing in, in dealing with a very difficult recession, then on that, on that test we succeed, you fail, and that offends you. That offends you. Now let me come back to this question of the youth labour force, because this is a matter for vigorous debate. And, uh, and although we have the somewhat uh, somewhat uh, overblown rhetoric of my colleague, Senator Bohm. I'll be nice to you, Senator Bohm. While we have the overblown rhetoric from you, there is a basis, there is a basis for, for genuine debate on this question. You see, what the opposition proposes to do is pretend that, uh, that uh, the youth jobs market for young people between the ages of 15 and 19, as, is, as it is commonly measured, is the same labour market and has the same characteristics as the adult labour market. Well, one of the, one of the outstanding characteristics of the adult labour market is a lot of adults tend to be married with children and therefore uh, one or other of the partners not working. They are out of the, out of the labour force. So we look at the participation rate and we calculate, we are, we calculate uh, unemployment based on the participation rate. Between the ages of 15 and 19, it just so happens According to my observations of human nature, there are very few people out of the labour, out of the labour force based on the fact that they are married and supporting families. But the opposition says, as, as uh, Senator Patterson did in her press release, that the level of youth unemployment is, uh, is one in two. I quote directly from the headline of your, of your release that you've incorporated, Senator, one in two young Victorians unemployed. Well, when we came to government, this thing has to be said. When we came to government, the levels of retention, the number of kids going to year 12 at high schools in this country was an international laughing stock. We were down around, in the OECD comparison, we were down around the level of Turkey on the amount of money we spent on education in this country. That has changed. It has changed dramatically. It provides better education for young kids to go through to year 12. The retention rate is increased by 80 per cent, us compared to you. And there's been a massive commitment to education. The life chances for young kids, including those who are unemployed, are enhanced greatly by better educational standards and better training. We have done that. We have done that, but we get penalised in this debate because we're successful. We get penalised because we've succeeded in providing better educational standards on the basis that uh, you don't recognise that in terms of the total population of young people. The second thing is. Uh, high school training is one thing, university uh, opportunity is another, and, and opportunities for technical training is a third. We have spent, as I say, 42 per cent more in real dollars, in real expenditure, on opportunities for tertiary, for, uh, for post-secondary education, an increase of that amount. And so there are more spots in universities available in Australia today than ever before, and the, the program is to expand that. And we, are, we have proposed in the One Nation Statement to spend $720 million more on uh, providing for an enhanced role for, for TAFEs so that uh, kids leaving school can go to technical education through the TAFE system. And that is on top of a huge commitment already through the states and the Commonwealth for TAFE uh, education. What we have done is fundamentally, fundamentally change the composition and nature of the labour market for young people by providing enhanced educational opportunity and ongoing training opportunity. And that means, when we say in the population of 15 to 19 year olds, that on a rough order of indication, to simplify the complex terms that are traded across this chamber in debate and give an indication to people who listen to this place what the uh, debate is about, 
Of every 10 young people in Australia, seven of them are in education and being trained, three of them are in the workforce. And of the three that are in the workforce, one is unemployed and three are employed. And that, that simply and starkly illustrates in a shorthand way what we are debating. You won't account for the seven who are being trained, and you won't account for the number extra that are being trained under us that under you, and you won't acknowledge that there are fewer actual people unemployed in this age bracket under us in this recession than under you in your recession, and you won't acknowledge that they get placement in the labour market for jobs quicker under us than they did under you, and quicker than they do in the mainstream adult labour market. You won't acknowledge any of those things, because what you are wanting to do is, is dramatise and take comfort and joy and pleasure out of, the, out of the misery of unemployment by making it a trite political argument. So uh, I, don't, uh, I don't back down from uh, any, any, anything that I've said, Mr Acting Deputy President. It needs to be put on the, it needs to be put on the record in that way. And order. I order. Uh, order. The minister has Senator used Hill. that technique before, but I, I'd put to you that it's a reflection on senators to say that they take comfort out of the unemployment of youth. And if you rule that way, I ask if you require him to withdraw that. I believe the president has already said that that's not unparliamentary. See, I, I'd be less nice to you than, uh, than uh, Senator Evans is, uh, Senator, because I think uh, your, uh, your position on Cambodia is despicable because you're hoping that there's going to be some accident to an Australian military personnel. And, uh, and I think that that's frankly quite a despicable thing. However, however. Order. For the same point of order in relation to that statement, I await your ruling. Well, I'm, I'm not sure whether the president's ruled on that, but I, I, uh, uh, I don't think you have a point of order, Senator. I wish to raise a point of order, Mr. Deputy President. Sorry, um, Senator. I believe T. that uh, standing orders uh, say that if a, if any senator is directly offended by a, a reflection made by another senator, the chair should ask that senator to withdraw out of courtesy to the senator who has raised the point of order. And in these two cases, uh, this minister has said that there are senators in this chamber, and I don't believe there's one, even on the government side, that takes any comfort out of the unemployment of Australians. And secondly, this minister has said that Senator Hill will take some comfort or is looking to, to take some advantage out of a mishap or a setback in the peace process in Cambodia, both of which are, are decidedly untrue, and I don't believe those sorts of accusations can be made against any senator in this chamber. And on the standing order where a, a, a senator uh, who objects to such reflections, it is, uh, I believe, in order for the chair to ask that per minister or that speaker uh, to withdraw uh, out of courtesy to the person who's raised the matter. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Nakin, Deputy President, be a very unhappy president in this place in the interest of uh, maintenance of robust parliamentary uh, yeah, and democratic yeah. speech. Were yeah. matters of that particular kind uh, to be, in effect, uh, ruled out of the ambit of legitimate parliamentary debate? I ask you to rule in a way that is consistent with the way the president has ruled in this respect, and uh, allow the uh, opposition just to appreciate that uh, they've got to cop something every now and again when uh, circumstances require. Yeah, uh, Senator Mr. Hill. Uh, now that I've, uh, on the point of order, now that I've been able to look up the relevant standing order, Mr. Acting President, uh, 193, that in effect provides that all imputations of improper motives on the behalf of a member are out of order. In both instances, both in relation to the reflection on Senator Barr, the more recent one in relation to me, he was imputing what anyone would reasonably say improper motives by any standard, Mr. President. Now, I put to you that's clearly within the terms of the standing order. It is, it is out of order, and he should be required to withdraw. Yes, the words that take comfort from. from, from sorry, I'm, just, just, I'm going to rule on this, and then we'll get on with the business. Because, just well, okay. Well, well, Mr. Deputy President, Senator Hill mentioned uh, uh, Rule 193, but mentioned. Uh, improper motives. The rule also refers to uh, personal reflections. And, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Deputy President, to suggest that uh, Senator Hill gets some gratification out of Australian troops being hurt, is, is a, that's what you inferred and that's what you meant, Senator. That, that's, what you, that's what you did say, uh, Senator Cook. It was a disgusting and despicable thing. 
which uh, is a personal reflection on Senator Hill, and under that ruling, as well as the one Senator Hill and uh, Senator uh, Teague have raised, I, I would think that the minister should be brought to account. Um, well, I, I rule this way that the, the words that were used, I believe, were, were take comfort from, uh, or to the effect of take comfort from uh, deaths in Cambodia. And I do believe that that could be taken as being offensive. I certainly would, if I was in that position, take that opinion. So I rule, uh, Minister, would you uh, withdraw those offensive words? Out of respect to your ruling, Mr Acting Deputy President, I of course withdraw. And uh, let me say uh, uh, that uh, I never started this in terms of the trading of accusations. Senator Bohm did and made some references that he withdrew, but he went on uh, in an in a unabashed way to simply make the same insinuations. So let me be gracious, Mr Acting Deputy President. <laughs> I withdraw as well and further, although I'm not required to by standing orders, the reference that any particular senator in this place takes comfort for the, for the high level of unemployment. But certainly, uh, spokespersons for the opposition, uh, it can be clearly said, have delighted in it because they see it as a political weapon against the government. And, and therefore, unemployment figures, if they're up, are greeted with, with some joy on the opposition side on the opposition side because there's yet another stick to beat the government with. Well, that's part of the political process and we cop that. We cop that. But in terms of trying to, trying to pretend that there is a serious debate here, let us not have ex ex explosions of disdain, anger and uh, accusations hurled at me and then, then think that then, uh, uh, they won't be returned because I can say that I will defend myself in cases where the, uh, where the inferences against me are unreasonable. I was concluding, Mr Acting Deputy President, by saying that what we have as a government is a commitment through the One Nation Statement for public expenditure and infrastructure development to grow the economy, to expand the economy, to stimulate growth and get employment that way. We have a commitment to training, a substantial commitment to training, to give life opportunities to young people by seeing that they have access to training that they don't now have and didn't have in the days of the opposition. And we have a policy as well to provide labour market support programs for those who are unemployed and in the foreseeable future won't be in work. And they are programs to assist in training, job search and things of that nature. That's our position. The position of the opposition is to abolish many of those programs, substitute an artificial program for the labour market ones, make the young unemployed carry the cost and burden uh, of, uh, of reduced wages in order to try and find work bid down wages in the workplace as well for the fully employed people, rotate the available work in a rotational way between those in work and those out of work, and not address the substantial inequities in education and training, not address the question of how you develop an economy, because their proposal is simply a taxing one, and not address the real needs of the labour market. So uh, I conclude by saying, Mr President, this debate has, this, has an issue about how you measure real youth unemployment. And that, and I agree on this point, to some extent is a, a marginal issue. The real issue is how you reduce youth unemployment, and that's a policy issue. Let's have the debate on how you measure it, but let's make the most important issue on how you reduce it. And when you compare our policy position to that of the opposition, there's no doubt we win hands down. The question is, the Senator take note of the uh, answer. Senator Patterson, I believe you've already spoken. And I'm uh, in closing the debate. Right. I seek leave to incorporate in Hansard the ABS statistics referred to by Senator Boehm in his speech. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. I just wish to note, Mr Acting Deputy President, these figures show six out of ten aged 15 to 19 are in the workforce, not the three out of ten claimed by Senator Cook, and four out of ten are not in the workforce, not the seven out of ten which was falsely claimed by Senator Cook. The question is, the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Macdonald. Directing Deputy President, I seek uh, leave to move a motion to take note of the answer from Senator Collins uh, regarding the Townsville Court. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the uh, uh, answer. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I don't uh, want to enter into a full-scale debate today with Senator Collins on the uh, matters he raised uh, in his question. Uh, uh, I do uh, 
as indicate to Senator Collins, though, that at any time he wants a full-scale debate, I'm more than happy to uh, uh, have that debate with him. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, uh, 19 of my colleagues were able to come and uh, see North Queensland at first hand to learn about their problems. Uh, Senator Collins is uh, a rather uh, untruthful statement that uh, nobody took any interest in the Townsville Port is quite clearly uh, incorrect. There were a number of senators in Townsville uh, going their different ways, but uh, uh, many of them uh, did raise the issue with various people who used the port, and it was a uh, matter of uh, some discussion uh, during that trip, quite contrary to what uh, Senator uh, uh, Collins has uh, said. Uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, the uh, trip uh, to uh, North Queensland uh, was very well received by North Queensland people who were uh, very pleased that we were able to come there. Uh, I indicated in uh, a, a remark I made on a point of order that there was an editorial in the Townsville Bulletin headed full marks to libs for an NQ visit. And uh, I do, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, seek uh, leave to incorporate that editorial. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Hansard. I have shown it to the Minister. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. I might uh, just, uh, as I say, Mr Acting Deputy President, I don't want to uh, waste the time of the Senate by uh, uh, arguing any uh, more with Senator Collins at this stage. I'm quite happy to have the full debate. It's somewhat of a regret, though, that Senator Collins couldn't even get his facts right. He has an office in Townsville that he never uses. He has the animals in Townsville monitoring all the media, and he didn't even know the difference between the Cairns Post and the Townsville Bulletin. And I mean, it really just shows what sort of a Northern Australian minister we've got. He doesn't even know what papers are in what uh, a particular town. He really has little interest in that uh, uh, part of the world at all. It is uh, uh, quite uh, obvious that he needs to get up there with a team of his uh, colleagues to see what North Queensland's about. I invite them to do it, and if they do do it, I won't stand around carping like the four Labor uh, politicians in North Queensland and whinging because people are coming to look uh, at North Queensland. I, I, in fact, I told them to, Senator Hill, you're quite right. I would welcome them. I will facilitate their trip in any, any way that I possibly can, because it's important that people like Senator Evans, Senator Tate, Senator Colston know what's happening in North Queensland. They North very, Queensland to see what sort of, of, of course. Of course. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, welcome up there uh, any time they uh, like. And might I say that even all the, uh, the Democrats are so very irrelevant in this parliament, I'd even welcome their team to come up there. And senators, if you want to come, let me know. I'll, I'll do what I can to facilitate it, because I want, I want uh, people to, uh, uh, to see the North, to understand its potential, understand the problems we're suffering under this government, and do something about it in the Senate. So, Mr uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, at any time Senator Collins wants the debate, I'm more than happy. Uh, I'm proud of the hard work that my colleagues uh, uh, did while uh, uh, they were there, and I look forward to the day when Senator Collins has the gumption and the courage to bring his colleagues up uh, to look at the great potential that is North Queensland. The question is the motion moved by Senator Macdonald to take note of Senator Collins' answer be agreed to. Those who have opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Senator uh, Harrod. <coughs> Deputy President, I seek leave to uh, take note to move motion to take note of the uh, answer given by Senator Richardson to uh, uh, Senator Newman. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Harrod. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the response by Senator Richardson to uh, the question by Senator Newman. I do so because uh, Senator Richardson said to the Senate that there will be no, pay TV, no porn pay TV in Australia. That is absolutely untrue. He has misled the House and attempted to mislead the people of Australia. He then said that uh, uh, he, he, um, he, in fact, has been proven wrong out of his own mouth, because then he then said uh, that his proposal uh, would um, allow our films uh, to be um, shown over pay TV. Now that proposal means that not only will porn pay TV be beamed into Australian home environments, 
but also ultra-violent uh, ultra films uh, which have a, quote, prevailing tone of ruthlessness and savagery will also uh, be uh, transmitted into Australian home environment. And I use those quotes deliberately uh, because that is how the Film Board of Review referred to some of these films uh, uh, which are now classified as R and which the minister says will be available uh, to be beamed into Australian home, uh, direct into Australian homes uh, via a pay TV. Um, the proposal by, of Senator Richen, Richardson uh, will, as I say, enable porn pay TV uh, to be um, transmitted into the uh, home environment in Australia. This proposal will be very much welcomed by Canberra's hardcore porn merchant who is gearing up for this very, uh, uh, very activity, this very enterprise. He has indicated, Lark has indicated, that well, if he can't get X into the homes, he'll get R, the R equivalents of X. And as the Senate, uh, as the Joint Standing Committee on, uh, on um, Video Materials said in its report, the fact is that um, uh, uh, quite a number of R classified uh, films and videos are identical in theme, representation, and intent and title as their ex counterparts, save only for, quote, explicit, end quote, closely detailed depictions of genitalia. In other words, they are precisely the same porn movies, precisely the same porn movies taken with a different camera at a different angle. Themes the same, content the same, intent the same. Uh, now, Mr uh, Deputy President, so that clearly indicates that what the minister said is false. His proposal will allow porn pay TV and uh, to, be, uh, to show uh, the type of degrading pornographic uh, films that were described in the Joint Select Committee's re report. His proposal will allow films, the dominant theme of um, which is that it objectifies and commodifies women. And I quote from the Joint Select Committee. He obviously doesn't know this. He hasn't read the Joint Select Committee report. And uh, as the Joint Select Committee said, rather than treating women as free and responsible in 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 initiators of human activity, the material in this category, although non-violent, treats women as sexual commodities to arouse the sexual desires of its target audience. And uh, it goes on. I won't quote it uh, further, but I refer to chapter 13 of the report of the Joint Select Committee on Video Materials. I will just quote another aspect because uh, Senator Richardson may be reminded at one stage of what he said, the messenger that he sent to a particular union that was concerned about this video material. Paragraph 13.49 of the Joint Select Committee on Video Materials says this, women of these videos that we're talking about, women are often depicted as sexually malleable for the purposes of satisfying male sexual desires. This is sometimes manifested by themes involving workplace sexual favours. Women are frequently depicted as eager for sexual experience of any kind and ever ready for any opportunity for sexual activity. This is frequently manifested in the group sex scenes depicting diverse sexual activity, which are a feature of much of the material in this category. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the, uh, the minister clearly has misled the chamber. He, uh, 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 he uh, 
uh, the, it is the themes and the content as much as the explicitness which mediate the problematic attitudes uh, in regular viewers. And the Select Committee, the Joint Standing Select Committee, heard evidence that this type of material, which he says ought to go into uh, the homes of Australia, of Australian subscribers, um, uh, that uh, the, the evidence that were, was uh, given to the committee said that this material mediates in the minds of habitual viewer a calloused and manipulative orientation towards women and uh, mediates in their minds an attitude that women are highly uh, uh, promiscuous and available. Let's go to the question of violent films. He says that our material ought to be beamed directly through pay TV into the homes. And I quoted uh, before a, um, uh, a description of one of the films uh, that the board, Film Board of Review uh, described, and that is one of the R classified films, uh, as having a pervading tone of ruthlessness and savagery. And another, and I will quote from the Film Board of Review, describing an, another R film as being an orgy of violence with, a, with, a, with grisly procession of blows, kicks, stabbings, shootings and graphic bone breakings, and having no mitigating qualities at all. Now, Mr uh, Deputy President, I believe that it was necessary for me to move this motion to take note, uh, because the record must be set right. Now, either the minister is ignorant or he is deviously attempting to hoodwink and deceive the public. I presume it's the first, the former, because, um, uh, because uh, uh, my concern is that if it's not, uh, then this minister will be responsible uh, for a dirty three-card trick on the people of Australia. And not only he will have to, and the government will have to answer for that, but each individual senator and member of the government will have to answer it before the electorate. Senator Newman. Mr. President, I uh, rise to support my colleague Senator Harradine in his concern at the uh, misleading, as I believe it also, of, of the Senate this afternoon at question time by Senator Richardson in answer to my question on pay TV and the introduction of uh, pornography on, on that medium. It, we can all argue till we're blue in the face as to what exactly is pornography. It's not my purpose to get into that now. But what I am so concerned about is the growth in this country, the insidious growth of violent movies uh, and other technology uh, designed to Yes, under Senator Tate's government, sadly, I am surprised that he could condone it. But these, these uh, violent movies and uh, uh, um, other uh, materials that come into this country which treat women as sex objects and suitable for violent treatment. Um, perhaps it is that the classifications of, of such material in this country need reassessment. I'm very glad that as a result of our pressure uh, in the coalition parties, uh, the Senate Select Committee was set up to investigate um, the standards to be uh, maintained on the new technologies, and they've already, of course, reported on the 0055 numbers uh, which Telecom uh, introduced and which we have deplored. I'm, I'm very glad to welcome my colleague, um, the Shadow Minister for Communications, Mr Warwick Smith, who put out a press release today on this issue. And I'd like to quote from that. He said, as yet we have no decision that pay TV is to proceed, yet already the decision of porn or no porn is made. This government will be remembered for its debts, its deals, and now its approach to porn. He went on to say, it's our view that there should be restrictions on what should be shown on, could, can be shown on pay TV in the interests of community standards and in particular the protection of children and that program standards which currently exist in relation to free-to-air broadcasters should also apply to pay TV. It's also the policy of the coalition to proscribe X-rated videos. He then draws attention to the uh, Senate Select Committee which we uh, uh, pushed to, to be uh, established 
and he, he pointed out that the committee in its interim report recommended that Telecom adopt a code of conduct for the 0055 telephone numbers which would prevent the service provider providing either knowingly or negligently information which in any way may be interpreted as indecent, obscene, offensive or sexually titillating or denoting sexual suggestion or sexual fantasy. And they also said that on the 0051 closed user service, information equivalent to the R or X film video classification. So clearly, that uh, committee, that all-party committee, I think it was a, I know it was a unanimous uh, report from that committee from all parties, um, was concerned about R and X material going out on the 0051 telephone number uh, service. He also concluded his press release by saying, it's my strong view that similar standards should apply to pay TV content and that R-rated material on pay TV not be available to pin holders. And I will so argue to the coalition front bench when this matter is presented for decision. There is no, no getting away from it, Mr uh, Deputy President. My colleague will have my full and whole support. I'd like to draw to the Senate's attention in the, just the brief time I want to take this afternoon um, a speech which was made by the uh, Prosecutor for the Queen of Victoria, Mr Richard Reid, uh, a speech he made in, November, in Tasmania in November last year. He, uh, he, referred, he, he started his speech by saying, talking about pornography and depicted violence, he said, these are issues which strike right at the heart of every family in Australia. How I'm pleased to say that the tide seems to be turning as the media and certain politicians are now taking a much closer look at the obvious moral and ethical issues associated with the public display of both violent and pornographic material. It's imperative that responsible women's groups throughout Australia become vocal about these issues and take the lead in turning the tide. Mr Deputy President, that is happening. Women's groups from the left of politics to the right of politics are speaking out about the impact on women and on children of this, this burgeoning pornographic tide that we're suffering. The editor of the Age, uh, no, the, uh, the Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne, was, re was uh, referring to an article in the Age, and he said, "Current restrictions on the importation, production, and screening of such pornography reflects community attitudes which are already quite liberal enough. Whatever is freely and legally available in videotape outlets will be obtained and used by children. It is naive and dishonest to argue otherwise. And the same goes for the minister's answer today when he seemed to think that using a PIN number and a smart card was beyond the wit of the children of Australia. Maybe he doesn't know much about the children of Australia. The Archbishop said, and I, I really think this is the crux of the matter, we live in a free society and we rightly treasure its benefits, but we also share significant responsibilities for the well-being of every citizen. It's not possible on moral, democratic or logical grounds for a just and equitable society to liberalise laws that increase violence and demean human relations and behaviour. And that, Mr Deputy President, is why I am so concerned at this growth in pornography under the sponsorship of this government. In this, uh, in this speech by Mr Reid, he went through some cases which he had seen on his files uh, in the uh, prosecution section of the courts in Victoria. He did an exploratory study, a very brief one, and I don't intend to go through them by any means, but I'd like to read to you two cases. At 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. on Thursday, the 21st of March, 1991, a young woman aged 35 lay asleep in her home in Bandura, a Melbourne suburb, with her three and a half year old daughter beside her. Her other two children, aged eight and six years, were also asleep in the home. She recalls waking up to find a strange man on top of her wearing a mask. Now, Mr. Deputy President, he tied her up, and, uh, taped her mouth, and tied her up, etc. He then removed her nightdress and proceeded to rape her repeatedly, both vaginally and orally, and attempted to rape her anally. This included placing her on the kitchen table and attempting to rape her there. The rapist lived only a few streets away and had planned this attack for some time. When arrested at the hospital where he worked, the police found a pornographic video amongst his personal belongings. When they searched his home, the police found a large collection of X-rated videos. He admitted watching two pornographic videos shortly before he left to commit this rape, Innocent Seduction and What's Love Got to Do With It? He said there was no particular storyline in these videos which related to what he did and no bondage, but he agreed with the police that these videos had triggered him. The police have shown me, uh, Mr. Reid, 
Both these videos, and I can assure you the scenes in What's Love Got To Do With It, closely match what this rapist did to his victim. The actor in the video has intercourse with the actress on the kitchen table, just as this rapist did with his victim. He said that he had been home alone watching pornographic videos. I've sat home watching videos, X-rated videos, for a while. Earlier, I had no idea. I had no intentions of doing anything like this. But as I was watching the videos and that, just sort of, I thought, thought about it and then it came to, my, come to mind. I thought, I'll go out and, for a walk and see what happens. And that's when, as I was walking, I was trying to say, you know, don't do it, don't do it. And that's when it just kept, you know, coming into my mind to do it because I had everything prepared just in case. I took my gloves and all that. This offender said that he made the balaclava that night while he was watching the X-rated videos and went to a supermarket to buy the stockings and rubber gloves. He told the police he was still a virgin with no girlfriend and was sexually frustrated. He said it was fair to say that he got these fanciful ideas from pornographic videos and books and magazines he had viewed. His Honour Judge Bart sentenced him to five years imprisonment with a minimum term of four years and in sentencing him, Judge Bart said it was, quote, all very well for the community to call for condign punishment for an offender who commits sexual offences. The community at the same time appears to encourage and condone, if not promote, the making, sale and rental of such videos which clearly can be expected to influence the sexual behaviour of susceptible members of the community. I hesitate to call it hypocrisy, but it surely points to a lack of consistency in the social and moral standards which underpin our laws. He went on to say, unrestricted rights of so-called adults to watch X-rated videos, the community would have to tolerate the terrible effects. It is a matter for communities and parliaments, not for me, said the judge. And the second case is very short, also appalling. On the 23rd of January 1990, a young 19-year-old girl was taken against her will to a motel in Seaford, a bayside suburb outside Melbourne. The offender was aged 25 and married with three young children. He forced her to undress and then placed his penis in her mouth and ejaculated in her mouth. He then had vaginal intercourse with her and this caused her great pain. This rapist proceeded to have intercourse with her in various positions including anal intercourse. He then put her under the shower and got in with her and attempted intercourse under the shower. Still not satisfied, he had vaginal intercourse again after the shower. He then masturbated and ejaculated on her face and finally left her. Following his arrest, he was interviewed by police and told them how his fantasy turned into an obsession. This interview was recorded on videotape and Mr. Reed referred to the transcript. Question. Well, now that you've brought up the fantasy, are you able to tell me how your fantasy developed? Answer. Yes, through watching pornographic movies and reading pornographic books and looking at pictures in pornographic books and watching the acts on the films. Question. What sort of acts are you talking about? A. Sexual acts. Q. Such as? A. Such as all different types of positions. Oral sex, anal sex. Q. Anything else? A. No, it was just the acts. This thing was just in my mind and I had this fantasy. And it turned, now it's turned into an obsession. And well, I didn't think that I was hurting the girl, but I was just that obsessed that I didn't know. He went on to say that one of his fantasies was to masturbate and ejaculate on the girl's face and to watch her masturbate. He said another fantasy... I, I, can, I share Mr Senator Tate's concern, Mr Deputy President, I won't finish that, that case. The purpose of reading those awful stories into the record is so that nobody could misunderstand what it is that we are so concerned about. We've had a recent example overseas of somebody watching um, uh, La what's the Silence of the Lambs, imitating the, uh, the violence in that and then calling himself Hannibal the Cannibal. We've had, on a much uh, well, still serious note, but, but separate from pornography, we've had the Duntroon cadets apparently copying the uh, TV reports of the, news out, news, uh, the Queensland police in their racist stunt. We've got a government who's concerned that we will smoke cigarettes if we watch TV advertising. And yet somehow there seems to be a failure to connect the, the uh, influence on people's behaviour of watching pornographic material and involve it involving themselves in the um, fantasies and the obsessions which I've just described, which have led to such serious and terrible crimes. 
The, I think the onus of proving that there isn't any significant link between pornography and imitative criminal behaviour and, and depicted violence and imitative cr criminal behaviour lies squarely with those who assert, contrary to human experience, that there is no such causal link. So said the prosecutor of Victoria. Mr Deputy President, I conclude by saying we are desperately concerned at the danger to women and children and the apparent readiness of the government to allow the expansion of pornography, as they did already with the 0055 telephone numbers, as it appears Senator Richardson is prepared to condone or encourage with the pay television. My question to him, my question to him at question time related to the rights of some people in the society to take priority over the rights of the vulnerable, namely the women and the children. The minister must not go unchallenged on this. All decent men and women in this country must strongly ma make their objections heard. This has to be stopped. Senator Walters. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Mr. Deputy President, the minister during question time informed us that he had put to caucus, and I'm not <coughs> sure whether caucus has uh, yet accepted it, but has put to caucus that it should be accepted that in pay television, R-rated videos should be allowed into the home uh, with a pin number mechanism. A pin number mechanism. As the minister well knows, or certainly should know, and if he didn't, his staff should tell him, at present there is a Senate Select Committee looking at exactly this issue, pay television. The minister's recommendation to caucus, I believe, preempts the committee's report, and that distresses me considerably. Now, the minister in charge of this debate at the moment, Senator Tate, is uh, well aware of the concerns that we have. He may indicate to me whether caucus has already accepted it. Has caucus accepted it, Senator Tate? I beg your pardon? Well, uh, he doesn't discuss our internal matters, and so uh, we really have no idea, except from the minister's answer in question time, that what he wants in this country is violent, sexually violent, and violent videos in the home with the supposed precaution that the adults in the family have a PIN number. Let me explain to the people of Australia that all this means is that a card will be slipped into a black box on the top of the television and this particular violent, sexually violent film can be shown in the family, in the home. It doesn't matter whether the children are present or not, it can be shown. Now we're told that it's no different to videos, buying videos. That is not right. That is not correct. Indeed, the card, I could imagine father coming home, having had a few uh, drinks at the pub and uh, him putting his card in and watching the most violent pornographic video that you can uh, hope to see, not only in front of the family, but perhaps leaving his card in the black video box, in the black box, and therefore enabling the children to be able to see it. Now, I hope Senator Tate will answer the concerns of the various senators that have been expressed today. I hope he will have the courage to get up and answer on behalf of the government the concerns that have been expressed here. Let me tell you, Senator Tate, that we have a survey put out by the Institute of Criminology, a world, in, a world survey, a comparison of crime in Australia and other countries, it's called. And in that survey, we found that Australia ranked highest in these 14 jurisdictions of sexual incidents. Australia ranked highest. It ranked third highest of those 14 countries behind USA and Canada in sexual assault, including rape. Switzerland and England had very low 
serious sexual assault rates. The European countries had very low, generally very low, rates when compared to Australia, the US and Canada. The Institute was extremely concerned, and ex concerned enough to believe, and I'd like to quote the Institute, it says, the result which must surely give concern, cause of concern to all Australians and reinforce the need for the establishment of a nat national crime prevention strategy. Now we've got this stupid, idiotic situation where in the same news release this morning we have this government so concerned about the youth of Australia being influenced by tobacco advertising on television, by tobacco advertising in sporting events, that they're going to attempt to ban it. Of course, they're making some exceptions, and so they can't allow South Australia to do without their, uh, their particular car race that uh, is uh, supported by tobacco industry. But they are so concerned, or so supposedly concerned, the t tobacco advertising and the scenes depicted of, uh, uh, of the tobacco industry on television, that they will ban it. But when it comes to pornography, when it comes to violence, there is no concern within the government that there could be any influence there at all. It is illogical, it is hypocritical, and Senator Tate, I am appalled at your acceptance of this, uh, of this rubbish put into the homes by your government. Um, Madam Acting uh, President, well, Senator Tate shakes his head. Well, now you tell me. I asked you earlier and you wouldn't tell me whether the government had made a decision. Now you tell me they won't. They haven't made a decision. I asked Senator Re uh, Walters to acknowledge. She asked me whether the caucus had discussed the matter. She did not ask me whether the government had made a decision. At question time, Senator Richardson made it clear the government had not made a decision. There is a very clear distinction, Senator. Right. And you know it. So we have no, I don't know how you lot work. I know how we work. And we don't have our, when we're in government, it's our party room that makes a decision. I don't know that your caucus makes a different decision to the government, but the government rules. You may work that way. It's typical of your sort of democracy, as I've so often said in this place. Order but Senator Tate, in order our senators, place, the party the chair, room makes the you. decision. And while there the is no point of order, and I presume that's what Senator Tate was standing for, I thought uh, there was a moment's lapse into uncivility. Senator Walters. I couldn't agree with you more, Madam Acting President. Um, as I said, Go. we have a situation where this government has already indicated very clearly that they have no concerns at all with this type of violence, this type of sexual um, violence going into the homes. You can look at your watch, Senator Tate, but I've got half an hour if I want it. And I have not promised you anything, Senator Evans, and I never have, and I never will, and I can assure you I will be talking a lot longer than 10 minutes. So we've uh, got the situation, Madam, uh, Madam Acting President, that Senator Tate knows very well that his government defeated my bill on violence and pornography. He, as minister, took the bill. He, as minister, when the vote came, sought a pair. And when one of my constituents wrote to him saying, I am surprised you voted against Senator Walter's bill, he wrote back to them saying, if you say that outside this chamber, I will sue you. I did not vote against the bill. He didn't say he'd snuck off for a pair. He'd snuck off for a pair. And a pair, as you know, Minister, uh, because Senator, 
Senator Tate has now snuck off again, and we have Senator Ray. Well, as you know, a pair indicates a vote. A pair taken out by a government indicates a vote. Well, and Senator Tate to does not. tried to bamboozle, bamboozle my constituent by pretending he didn't vote against my bill. He voted against my bill, but he wasn't game to cross the floor if he didn't want to. He sought a pair. But a pair indicates a vote against the, the bill when it's a, a pair given by the government. And we all know that in this place. And Senator Tate is hypocritical in his uh, in his lack of truth, uh, Senator Walters. In his uh, lack of Senator truth, Walters, I, I require you to president. withdraw that reference to Senator Tate as hypocritical. Is hypocritical unparliamentary, Madam? It uh, most certainly is. About that, there is no dispute. Right. Please well, withdraw, I change, Senator. I, I will withdraw that, and I will put double standards in its place. Thank you, Senator. Well. Whoops. I would only say that Senator Tate showed dreadful double standards in saying that he did not vote against my bill when he had deliberately sought a pair to do so. And, as uh, my colleague says, he snuck off. But I get back to the, um, the theme of this whole debate, Madam Acting President. The government is so concerned that tobacco advertising will influence young people and others, influence them to take up smoking, that they are going to ban it. You agree with that? But you bet I do, because I think that does influence them. You bet I do, and it's about time you brought it in, and it's about time you brought it in. But be consistent, Minister. If you're going to show violence, if you're going to show sexual violence on television, don't tell me that you don't believe that that will also influence viewers, particularly young viewers, because it will. Because it will. And you can't have it both ways. So I look forward to the government waiting for our Senate Select Committee's report and not coming down arbitrarily in favour of producing R-rated videos on pay television. The question is, uh, the, the, the motion is that the uh, answer to the question be Senator Harrity. Uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, sorry. Uh, I'll be very brief, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise because I'm very surprised the government has not uh, taken the opportunity of, uh, of, um, uh, of responding, and particularly the minister, Senator, uh, Senator Richardson. Uh, I did Senator Richardson the courtesy of uh, uh, getting his, his uh, office phoned. Uh, indicating that I would be uh, seeking leave to take notice of uh, his response. Now, clearly, it's a question of whether what he said is true or whether it's untrue. Now, as I indicated, the possibility is that he is ign ignorant of the particular classifications. And if he's ignorant of the particular classifications, uh, then um, uh, uh, then uh, he should. Senator Harradine, do proceed. Clearly, um, uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, clearly, um, either he has, um, uh, he is ignorant of the matter, uh, or uh, it's a, an attempt to hoodwink the public over the issue of whether or not there is porn material in the R classification. And as I indicated, and I've just tried to get it searched out, but there are hundreds of equivalent R, uh, the, uh, R, R classified videos, which are the equivalent of X. They have the same title, the same theme, the same intent, 
uh, and the same content as the X material, which is uh, hardcore pornography, except that they are taken by another camera from a different angle. Or milliseconds uh, of uh, tape uh, are excised. Milliseconds. And as I indicated, it's the theme, uh, as we were advised in the Joint Select Committee, it's the theme as much as uh, the explicitness uh, that mediates in the minds of habitual viewers uh, a calloused and manipulative orientation towards women. Now this, these are quite serious matters and if the minister is not familiar uh, with uh, the material then he should get familiar with the material before he puts this proposal uh, to the caucus committee if he hasn't already done so. That is what I am appealing to the minister to do, to make sure that he understands uh, the uh, nature of the material before he makes those proposals. And as I said, I challenge anybody to ring up, uh, I challenge anybody here to ring up John Mark at the uh, uh, mature Media Group, Canberra's hardcore porn merchant, ring him up now and ask him whether he's going to make a bid uh, to, um, uh, to uh, deliver pay porn, uh, porn pay TV into the home environments of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Australian subscribers. He has said he will and I'm sure he's the most pleased man in Australia after the statement that has been made today by Senator Richardson. I hope Senator Richardson understands what we're saying. I hope he comes to a knowledge of the truth before it's too late, not only for him but particularly for the Australian people. The question is, the Senator take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe I'm without any instructions at all. The question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Minister. Ministerial statements. I beg your pardon. Are there any ministerial statements? Uh, Madam Knapp, Acting Deputy Chair, I seek leave to move a motion relating to Cambodia peacekeeping. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Madam Acting De Deputy President, I move the motion circulated to senators in the chamber and seek leave to incorporate my statement in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Hill. Uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, um, I wish to respond to the motion that's been moved to uh, take note of the statement, in particular the, uh, the terms of the resolution that have been put by the government before the chamber this afternoon. The debate obviously uh, is an important debate and the most serious matter, uh, that of uh, not only the government's assessment of the situation in Cambodia, but also its decision to increase Australian forces in Cambodia to a number of about, uh, about 500. We're pleased that the government has finally brought a statement uh, to the parliament on this issue, something that we've been uh, seeking of them for some five months. Madam Deputy President, as much as anybody, we want to see peace for the Cambodian people. They've suffered enormously, of course, under the Khmer Rouge policy of genocide. I remind you that during that horrible period, more than a million Cambodians were killed, or in other terms, over a, thought, a quarter of the total population. And from then they've continued to suffer during the, during the Civil War. Some 350,000 have been driven out of their homes and out of their country and live in the camps along the Thai border. According to the UNHCR, at least another 150,000 can be fairly described as internal refugees who have been forced to live their, leave their homes uh, and are living elsewhere temporarily within Cambodia. These people have lived for too long under, in, a, in misery uh, and in an environment of terror. In government and in opposition, we have constantly looked for ways to support the Cambodian people. 
We have supported the, the UMBRO, the border relief organisation of the UN, and the work that it has done on the border in the camps. We have helped uh, support the Cambodian people through support for the Red Cross, UNHCR, uh, NGOs in all possible ways. And we have also sought to try and find ways to help them find a peace. Obviously, our prefer preferred solution was to support the two non-communist uh, Khmer factions. And that was because we believe that the Cambodians not only deserve peace, but freedom also. In more recent years, we saw some potential uh, as the Hun Sen regime at least uh, somewhat uh, uh, liberalised and clearly offered a preferable alternative to the Khmer Rouge. We were offering, they were offering, uh, Madam Deputy Chairman, at least some order and stability, uh, notwithstanding their communist ideology, and we looked at the possibility of them perhaps joining with the two non-communist uh, uh, Khmer factions in some peaceful uh, solution. We always had uh, difficulties with any settlement proposals that, in, that would inflict the Khmer Rouge again upon the Cambodian people. We, in fact, as the uh, Senate would be aware, Madam Deputy President, advocated the international community prosecuting Pol Pot and the other leaders of that genocidal regime for genocide in the International Court of Justice. Uh, and we invited, for some years, we invited the Australian government to take a leadership role in that project, uh, which invitation wasn't taken up. We saw advantage in excluding the Khmer Rouge, giving them no international legitimacy at all. Madam Deputy President, uh, we recognise the difficulties inherent in our preferred solution, namely the strength of the Khmer Rouge military within Cambodia, the determination of its uh, principal backer, uh, China, that it not be deserted. Uh, and when it came to the crunch on several occasions, uh, the unwillingness of, in particular, the Sihanouk faction to isolate the Khmer Rouge, thus end the resistance coalition and potentially become the target of a more powerful adversary. But the downside of the alternative, any quadripartite solution, Madam Deputy President, a solution that incorporated the Khmer Rouge, was to embrace that horrible regime and to accept their good faith. It's not surprising that the Hun Sen government in Phnom Penh wouldn't accept that solution either. Thus, the international community, over a period of some time, uh, sought to develop an option. Uh, and we give credit to, uh, to Senator Evans uh, and the Australian government for providing uh, uh, commitment uh, and effort in providing in, in, in seeking a solution other than simply a quadripartite solution that wouldn't be accepted. And that alternative option or the development of the quadripartite option was to provide an enhanced United Nations role which would give some, uh, some support to the Khmer factions if they were in fact able to reach, uh, reach peace. Hun Sen was to have some security guarantee in the form of a large uh, UN peacekeeping force. Uh, the Khmer Rouge, and they had given a benefit under this, this scheme, would have the guarantee of not sacrificing their military advantage in a peace, by, and that would be given by the UN, assuming principal functions or at least supervisory functions uh, of the Cambodian government, and in giving them a place uh, within the Supreme National Council to be established in the run-up to free and fair elections. So the Khmer Rouge was dealt in by the international community, with Australia playing a lead role. And we saw, I regret to say, Madam Deputy President, the unedifying spectacle of the former Khmer Rouge interior minister who ran the torture chambers in the country receiving international endorsement. It's no wonder, and a seat on the SNC, and it's no wonder, Madam Deputy President, that we found that an unappealing prospect. And we've seen a settlement proposal develop that, despite a UN presence, really requires the goodwill of the Khmer Rouge to succeed. And on that basis, it's no wonder, Madam Deputy President, that we've remained sceptical. 
Nevertheless, we have acknowledged that it could work. The Khmer factions signed on the bottom line. The international community said they would support it. And obviously, despite our reservations, we said in principle that we would support it also, because, as I said at the outset, the Cambodians deserve every chance at peace. Senator Evans uh, often quotes me saying that I didn't believe the comprehensive settlement would work. And that was a comment I made in Cambodia some 18 months or so ago uh, when I was doing my bit to seek to persuade the Hun Sen government in Phnom Penh to join with the two non-communist factions in free and fair elections that would thus exclude the Khmer Rouge. Uh, what I argued, of course, was that if Hun Sen was prepared to show that initiative, which regrettably in the end he wasn't, uh, it, would, uh, it would engage and attract enormous international support. But it didn't go in that uh, direction, as I said, because although he spoke of holding an election, he wasn't prepared at that time to hold a democratic election. But what I said then uh, uh, still remains, uh, Madam Deputy President, to the extent that a comprehensive settlement is not just a signed document and evidence of international support. A comprehensive settlement is a peace and stability in which Cambodians can fairly determine their destiny, and that has yet to be achieved. The issue then is whether the path that has been chosen and that Australia is supporting by sending military forces will achieve that objective. And look at that for a moment, Madam Deputy President. We see continued fighting on the ground, principally by the Khmer Rouge, fighting that's been described in recent weeks as the most intense in the last year. We see a campaign of terror being conducted by the Khmer Rouge, their traditional methodology, in this instance of firing artillery rounds indiscriminately into villages. We see the Khmer Rouge intimidating refugees on the border, refugees which the United Nations, with our support, is seeking to relocate back into Cambodia. We see a settlement that has not excluded Pol Pot and his deputies from continuing their power and control over the Khmer Rouge forces. And when we say that, uh, Madam Deputy President, Senator Evans simply accuses us of carping. To work the UN plan must be realistic. Apart from our concern that the Khmer Rouge is not and will not genuinely participate in the peace process. The timetable for repatriation of refugees is simply impossible. The wet comes in about uh, two months and lasts until about October. 350,000 refugees were to be resettled before the end of the year. The UN this week is moving the first 600. It's supposed to increase to 10,000 a week, Madam Deputy President, which is just uh, obviously impossible. impossible. And that impossibility is already being acknowledged by this uh, somewhat quaint notion of moving the refugees from the camps in Thailand to new camps just across the border in Cambodia, from where they will be able to vote in the election that's planned as part of the process. Additionally, Madam Deputy President, the process of cantonment and disarming of the, in this environment is highly doubtful. We will be amazed if the Khmer Rouge, in practice, lay down 70 per cent of their arms and disband 70 per cent of their forces. Even Senator Evans last night acknowledges that they have at least two to three years of arms hidden away. They have wealth from the gem mines and the region, as we know, is sadly already flooded with weapons. But even under the Paris Agreement, it's still not a complete disarming. And although Senator Evans uh, uh, criticised us for arguing the other day that there should be an effort to increase the disarming to a full 100 per cent subsequent to his statement, I note that the Security Council has included it within their, in their resolution as the desired option, or more than the desired option, something that should be aimed at. And not surprisingly, because to imagine the, the what, 200,000 regular forces that are still in Cambodia and 250,000 irregulars, imagine 30 per cent of those, even under this scheme, maintaining their arms and maintaining their combat uh, readiness is a most uncomfortable environment. 
Furthermore, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, we see little prospect of Hun Sen, particularly that he has now reached some uh, more comfortable relationship with Prince Sihanouk, passing to the UN the supervisory functions of government, that is, of the five uh, key portfolios of foreign affairs, defence, communications, um, interior, and, uh, and one other, um, which was the, the, the plan, the plan that we're seeking to, uh, to put into effect. It was interesting that when Hun Sen wasn't so many months ago in this country, he said to us upon questions that he had no intention of passing over those functions, of giving up those functions. So in this environment, Madam Deputy President, is it a reality to see a free and fair election next May? And we doubt that it is so. We're concerned also that despite the rhetoric of the international community, there's been very little forthcoming. The process of establishing UNTAC has been incredibly slow. Australia and some others, notably France and Indonesia, have kept the process going by developing the notion of a phased deployment, hopefully locking in the international community. But from what we learnt last night, only 35 million of the initial 200 million has in fact been committed. So that is in fact 35 million of the total estimated cost of $1.9 billion that's been committed. Of the 40-odd countries that have made a commitment for an initial force, we understand from Senator Evans last night that that is a force of only 4,000. But the Indonesians have provided an infantry battalion of about 800, the Malaysians a similar number, and of course under this statement Australia will be providing 500. Adding those together, Madam Deputy President, you'll realise that the others won't be providing many at all. And that initial 4,000 is out of the projected force, the documented intended force, of some 15,000. Bearing in mind that this was to be an 18-month project, Madam Deputy President, to end about the middle of next year, we don't see in these figures great determination on the part of the international community. Australia is clearly a driving force in this commitment, uh, and you know, we, we commend, as I said, the leadership aspect that Australia has been prepared to show. But the question is whether the process is realistic. And we're still concerned about the lack of information that's put before us, even in relation to the Australian force. We'll be sending 500 military communicators, we are told, but we are not told specifically what they will do. Last night, Senator Evans said that they would build some form of Cambodian telecom. We should have been told, I would suggest, Madam Deputy President, in this statement, exactly what would be their functions and where they will be deployed. Presumably, they will be attached to the infantry, in the first instance to the, to the Malaysian and Indonesian battalions, but we weren't told that also. And as I said last night, Madam Deputy President, it seems strange to me to have some 500 communicators for 1,600 troops. We were told in this statement for the first time that we will be sending 10 police officers, but we're not told what their functions will be. We are not told what countries have committed forces and the nature of the forces that they've committed. We are not told specifically for how long the Australians will be deployed. If we are right and the UN time assessments are unrealistic, it is likely that Australian forces will be locked in for a long time. We are given in this statement no frank assessment on the issue of the ongoing fighting and conditions on the ground. That we would have th thought would be the bare minimum that we could reasonably expect in this statement and that the Australian people could expect, Madam Deputy President. Senator Evans was, last week, dismissing the fighting that's occurring as simply skirmishes by warlords. But that doesn't seem to be the word that's coming out of Cambodia. Yet this, statement, yet this statement says, for the first time, that the Australian deployment will be only if conditions are right. Well, does that imply that conditions are not right at present? Is Senator Evans saying that this uh, situation of skirmishing warlords who happen to be using heavy artillery 
and firing into villages indiscriminately, as I mentioned a while ago, and destroying bridges and destroying roads, are they the conditions when it's not right to send the force? We don't understand, Madam Deputy President, why this wasn't explicitly dealt with in this uh, statement that's put before us today. We're given no details as to how the UN proposes to assume su uh, supervision of the functions of government in Cambodia that I mentioned a few moments ago. There is no analysis of the effect upon the process of a, break of a breakdown of the SNC procedure. I understand the SNC and its full uh, composition has only been able to meet once. I think it's tried to meet on six occasions, but it hasn't been able to completely for various different reasons. And yet this was a critical component part of the total package. What's the effect of that breakdown upon the, the package and the peace process as a whole? We are given no details of what role, if any, Australia will play in the demobilisation process. We are disappointed, Madam Deputy President, that there is no support in this document for the UN Security Council proposition of 100 per cent demobilisation, which I mentioned also a few moments ago. Regrettably, the statement doesn't tell the Australian people much at all about this major commitment. It is a major commitment, not only in terms of the forces that we are sending and the leadership role that we are assuming, but also in terms of the cost. We are told of $49 million that will be required from the defence vote and about, uh, um, well, I think about $35 million in Australian dollar terms, which will be our co compulsory contribution to UNTAC. $7.7 million in disaster relief. Uh, and, of course, the increased uh, aid vote. So a very large sum of Australian taxpayers' uh, dollars are being committed. I might say in passing, Madam Deputy President, that, uh, that we certainly offer our support to the bilateral aid vote, uh, and I want to take this opportunity to commend the uh, incredible work that the NGOs have done in Cambodia uh, over the, uh, the last 10 years or so when a bilateral program wasn't in place, uh, and I've had the opportunity to visit them and learn from them firsthand of, of their work. They clearly deserve our commendation and gratitude. The Australian government has not, the Australian government has not, uh, uh, well, I get the interjection, but if you read the paper, you'll see that we've said that we'll give priority to our region in aid, which is something that's more than you're prepared to do. The Australian government has not kept the public adequately informed as to the major commitment it is making. It should have put down a statement in this parliament at the time it assigned the first 50 odd men communicators to Cambodia. As I said at the outset, we have had to wait some five months for this promised statement and we still do not have as much detail as is desirable. The government has sought to take us for granted and expected a blanket endorsement in the same way that has taken the wider Australian community for granted. We hope that it will now keep the parliament better informed, and we believe we've got a right to expect that. In the event of any significant changes in the size of, the, of, of our force, in the costs, the mission goals, security assessments, timetable or other important details, we expect, and I believe reasonably expect, the government to inform the parliament. And, of course, we reserve the right to address such changes that might be made by the government from time to time. Nevertheless, despite our concerns and our reservations, which I believe are fairly put on the record, we are not going to let Australian forces go off without bipartisan support. We are not going to do what Labor once did. We know that they will perform in a way which will be of great credit to Australia, as they have in other peacekeeping missions in the past. We congratulate General Sanderson on his appointment as military commander. We are pleased that the government has finally stressed that our forces will not have an enforcement function. We have always said that the international community cannot make peace for the Khmer factions. Madam Deputy President, we hope that the process will work. As I said at the outset, too many Cambodians have suffered for too long. We, of course, therefore, will support the resolution. The Australian Democrats are pleased to support this motion, endorsing Australia's contribution to the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia. 
Our endorsement comes without qualification, despite our full recognition that there are dangers which will be encountered by Australian uh, personnel in Cambodia and that the successful completion by UNTAC of its mission cannot be guaranteed. This is an unusual occasion. We have several differences with the government and the opposition on matters of foreign policy, the Gulf War and self-determination for East Timor spring to mind, but this isn't one of them. The government's policy on Cambodia is one which we have come to fully support, notwithstanding some earlier reservations about the inclusion of the Khmer Rouge in the peace process. It's clear to us that the peace process, while necessarily an imperfect creature of compromise, gives real hope that the protect protracted and unparalleled suffering of the Cambodian people can be brought to an end in the foreseeable future. By contrast, until today's support by the opposition of this motion, which we congratulate them on, the Democrats have been disappointed by the stance taken by the opposition. This isn't to suggest that the concerns raised by Senator Hill are not valid, but rather that undue weight has been given them and the unfortunate tone in which they've been raised created the strong impression that the opposition had little enthusiasm for the United Nations' unprecedented efforts to achieve peace in Cambodia. There was a striking contrast between the opposition's reluctant attitude towards this operation and their wholehearted enthusiasm for the Gulf War. The Democrats regard the UN's work in Cambodia as a very large step towards a just and a peaceful new world order. It must be said, however, that it is a step which has been taken many years later than it should have been. The lack of interest by the world in general to mediate a just peace in Indochina from the 1950s until the 1980s has seen that region torn apart by the Vietnam War, the resultant destabilisation of Cambodia and the rise to power of the Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot in 1975. Throughout the reign of that despicable tyrant, the UN and the world continued to take no action, although Vietnam was punished when in 1979 it invaded Cambodia and ended the four years of terror which left perhaps a million people dead, perhaps more. It would be wrong to suggest that Vietnam's invasion was, was driven by an altruistic commitment to human rights. It most certainly was not. But the fact remains that it brought to a halt a campaign of genocide which, was, which matched any of the blackest periods in world history in its horror and its brutality. It's to the eternal shame of the wider international community that we all failed to help the Cambodian people when their plight became clear. Finally, in 1992, we are seeing belated, but this time concerted action. It's worth recalling that past members of the Australian Parliament readily supported the Vietnam War, during which the United States bombed Cambodia, precipitating instability and a power vacuum which was filled by Pol Pot. I would expect all Australians to feel some sense of historical moral responsibility to help right the wrongs done to the Cambodian people. Indeed, it's profoundly ironic that not much more than a year ago, most members of this parliament were straining at the leash to send Australian troops to the Gulf War. Surely the Cambodian situation vitally engages Australia's interests at least as much as Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Peace in Cambodia and an end to Vietnam's isolation hold the promise of democracy, improved human rights and economic development in a large part of our own region. Both the government and the opposition justified Australia's support for the Gulf War on the grounds that support for a strong United Nations was in our international interests, and it is. But the Gulf War was not a UN-controlled operation, while this Cambodian peace process actually is. The work of UNTAC is a real comp contribution to a new world order. It's an attempt to achieve justice and peace without the force of arms. It aims to protect human rights of all affected parties, not just a select group. It seeks to establish a functioning system of democracy. We can all take great pride in the important role which Australians will play in the work of UNTAC. The 65 communicators now in Cambodia and the 430 defence personnel, 10 police officers and other civilians who will follow are to be congratulated for their vital contribution to an important step forward in the contact of world affairs. In particular, we congratulate Lieutenant Colonel Sanderson on his appointment as UNTAC military commander and Mr Michael Maley is UNTAC's Deputy Electoral Commissioner. We offer our best wishes to them and to their families, and we all know that the families suffer just as much as those who are out in the field in these situations. And we strongly endorse the part of this motion which looks forward to their safe return. As I've already said, while the Democrats regard UNTAC as having a good chance of succeeding, we aren't blind to the dangers and the possibility of failure, and we never have been. This is due in no small measure to the realistic and rational assessments that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has made of the merits 
and the prospects of the priest post office. This was evidenced by the testimony of then Deputy Secretary of that department, Mr Michael Costello, to the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee in February last year. I quote Mr Costello replying to two of my questions. His first answer was, anyone who puts his hand over his heart and says, I trust Pol Pot, is probably not being all that wise. The question you have to ask is not whether you can trust these people, but whether the mechanisms, the institutions, the structures are such to give you a reasonable prospect that they will be implemented. And his second answer was, people ask, can you guarantee there will not be an outbreak of fighting? The answer is, of course I can't. What I can say is that I am absolutely certain that fighting will continue if nothing is done. And, of course, it's precisely such a renewed outbreak of fighting which has led to the opposition's recent doubts about this peace process. We believe that it is too early, however, to predict that the fighting will continue and escalate in a way that puts the process in serious doubt. There is every chance that UNTAC can mediate a re-imposition of this ceasefire. We will have to wait and see. The Democrats note and endorse the Prime Minister's categorical assurance that Australian personnel are being deployed in Cambodia to keep the peace and not to enforce it. We also note his statement that Australian and other UN forces would have to be withdrawn if the peace process collapses. That would of course be a great tragedy for the Cambodian people and I'm sure we all hope it doesn't happen. The Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade and officers of his department deserve much credit for the internationally recognised role they've played in developing the only viable solution to the Cambodian conflict. The Australian members of UNTAC can feel justly proud of their involvement in Cambodia. As Australians, we can be proud of this continuation of Australia's long and honourable record in United Nations peacekeeping. The Democrats fully endorse the Prime Minister's statement and we support the motion. Minister Evans. Madam Acting Deputy, on behalf of the government, uh, may I say that I welcome very much the support for this resolution that is now apparent from all corners of the Senate. May I say that I also welcome the uh, generally much more moderate and balanced and constructive tone of the opposition's contribution to this debate compared with some of the more insensitive and arguably opportunistic uh, statements of recent days. I say that certainly so far as uh, <coughs> Dr Hewson's uh, contribution, which I uh, heard most of, uh, but uh, less so so far as Senator Hill's contribution, uh, but I guess old habits die hard. Nonetheless, it is clear that there is a, a very strong understanding in the Australian community of the virtues of the settlement that's been reached, of the stakes that are involved in its carrying through to fruition, and of the utility and indeed necessity of Australia's involvement. I'm glad that the opposition has now come quite explicitly to appreciate all that and to make clear its support for this involvement and for the particular resolution before the parliament today. This is the biggest peacekeeping task that the United Nations uh, has ever attempted. It's obvious in that context, and given continuing uncertainties in a number of respects on the ground in Cambodia, that there should be a number of loose ends in the way in which the UNTAC operation has so far been described and in terms of the way in which it will proceed. I don't think there are as many as have been suggested uh, by the opposition in respect, uh, but may I say quickly that the government is perfectly happy to uh, consult with the opposition, to share with it the information uh, as it becomes available. And uh, certainly I'll do what I can now in this reply to uh, respond to some of the specific questions that have been uh, asked. Uh, there have been difficulties about uh, bringing on a full-scale parliamentary debate on this subject before this time, simply because of the time it's taken in New York uh, to get the operational plan uh, prepared and at a sufficiently uh, clear-cut uh, stage of implementation in terms of identifying the, uh, the tasks to be performed and who's being asked to do them and Australia's role in that respect. Uh, it's taken some time uh, for all that to occur to the point at which uh, we could make uh, meaningful decisions and, uh, and have a meaningful discussion. Um, but I think there is uh, quite a bit that we can now say. It's already said in the statement and I'll do my best to supplement that in some respects. As to the, uh, the kinds of um, 
uh, criticisms that have been uh, made, or concerns rather, that have been expressed. I think that might be a better way of putting it. Um, let me begin with the theme uh, repeated again today by Senator Hill about the role of the Khmer Rouge in this settlement. I am as conscious as anyone in the world of the appalling record of the Khmer Rouge. I certainly am not a naive uh, advocate uh, for the view that they uh, have now become converted intellectually or emotionally or in any other way to the uh, democratic process. I have been, however, uh, of the view for quite a considerable time that no settlement was ever going to be possible of the appallingly protracted uh, and disastrous situation in Cambodia unless it did involve, in some credible way, all parties active on the ground in Cambodia and didn't seek to um, exclude uh, one uh, altogether from that process, whatever the obvious attractions in doing so. The justification for that, as I've explained on innumerable occasions, is our belief that to crudely try and exclude the Khmer Rouge or anybody else from the process uh, would not have made possible a commitment to that settlement process by the relevant external powers whose support more than anything else was keeping the conflict going. More specifically, it would not have been possible to include China uh, in the settlement process uh, without a role uh, being found uh, in the way that the, the settlement process now sets it out uh, for all the parties on the ground. Not a role in the actual executive administration of the country. That was impossible to accept, but a role as potential participants in the future of that country uh, through the ballot box. The Khmer Rouge haven't, in our judgment, uh, necessarily changed their spots at all. Uh, we can make no judgment about that, and certainly I have no optimism, as I've said, on that score. What we can make a judgment about is that they have been effectively denied a continuation of external arms support, and they've very clearly have been denied any kind of external political support. And uh, as was said by Mr Costello in a passage quoted by Senator Byrne, what the settlement has been all about is creating the, the structures, the institutions, the processes to give us the best possible chance that that uh, settlement would be enabled to be put into place even with the best very grudging cooperation of one of the key internal players. If we have been wrong in our assessment that the Khmer Rouge was capable of being contained in this way and that the settlement uh, was only capable of uh, being achieved by the kinds of uh, approach I've described, then we haven't been alone in that misjudgment. It's been an error also uh, perpetrated, and adopted and endorsed uh, by all members of the Permanent Five, or the Security Council, the Security Council itself, the UN General Assembly as a whole, and certainly all uh, the key neighbouring Asian nations from Vietnam and Thailand to the other ASEANs uh, to Japan. Every one of those countries has come to accept over the course of the last few years that this kind of settlement strategy, the one on which we're now embarked, was the only game in town. No one doubts that even in the context of that settlement and with all the institutional processes that are being put into place that the Khmer Rouge will lack the capacity for mischief in the future. They will retain that capacity and depending on the degree of success of the demobilisation exercise and the location and destruction of arms caches exercises, uh, there may be some considerable residual capacity for mischief. But our judgment, again, I believe, a judgment shared by all the other countries that have participated in this process, is that that capacity for mischief is eminently containable. And certainly, again, that there is no alternative 
but to go down the course that has been mapped out. Much has been made in recent days as a demonstration of that kind of mischief that the Khmer Rouge can perpetrate of the situation around uh, Kompong Tom, where uh, fighting uh, has taken place of a kind which has given rise uh, to quite a degree of concern. However, let me say this about that situation in Kompong Tom, which has attracted so much uh, media attention and political discussion. At most, the fighting uh, involved was sporadic and low-level in character. Much more importantly, uh, despite uh, the concern that has been expressed about its continuation, all the available evidence is that that situation has now been brought back under control, that the military situation there has stabilised. General Sanderson, Lieutenant General Sanderson, made that reasonably clear that that was his expectation in an interview he did uh, uh, 24, 48 hours ago that was widely reported here in Australia. I'm now able to advise the, uh, the Senate on the basis of the latest information to hand this morning that uh, it's been uh, reported at the level of Mr Akashi, the Secretary General's representative, and Lieutenant General Sanderson, uh, who have just given a briefing uh, to the uh, P5 countries and others, including ourselves, in Phnom Penh, that there have been encouraging developments that should assuage the concern of the past few days. In particular, um, two uh, DK, in other words Khmer Rouge uh, liaison officers, have been taken by a UN helicopter to Kompong Tom, a meeting of factional liaison officers and members of the mixed military working group uh, has been held. On the mor yesterday morning, uh, 31st of March, CPAF, that's the, that's the SOC uh, Army, Cambodian People's Armed Forces, headquarters in Phnom Penh, uh, informed UNTAC that the NADK, that's the Khmer Rouge forces, on Route 12 and Route 6 had withdrawn uh, from those, uh, their positions on those roads, which they'd uh, previously cut off, and that a demining exercise by the CPAF had begun. Uh, some remaining uh, matters of detail had to be sorted out still, but it was proposed and expected that two companies and support elements from the Indonesian battalion now in the Phnom Penh area will be uh, deployed to Kompong Tom to start detailed uh, reconnaissance of the area. Um, so that particular situation uh, does now seem, as I've said, to be stabilised and back under control. And I guess we can go on expecting situations of this kind to occur from time to time. Um, it's not so much a matter of the Khmer Rouge or others of the, the factions attempting to win territory for territorial purposes uh, in, the, uh, in the skirmishing and manoeuvring that's going on. What's really behind this kind of fighting, as we assess it at the moment, is essentially uh, tactical manoeuvres intended more than anything else as uh, political statements to the Cambodian people rather than as uh, demonstrations of intent to resile from, to walk away from uh, the process. Um, and as such, if that is a correct uh, assessment or interpretation of what's going on, I guess we, uh, we can unhappily expect a few more such political statements to occur, but maybe rather less as... Well, as um, maybe rather less, um, as more and more UNTAC troops arrive on the scene, uh, able to be deployed, uh, and as the confidence building uh, that's associated with their presence in the country uh, takes hold. And that's certainly, I know, the hope of Lieutenant General Sanderson and the military authorities. So far as the concern that's been expressed about insufficient detail in the UN plan, uh, it is the case that in most of the uh, public statements, including the Prime Minister's statement, uh, we haven't uh, spelt that out in, uh, in great detail. But I do remind the Senate, and I remind Senator Hill in particular, that there's an enormous amount of detail spelt out in the report of the Secretary-General on Cambodia, uh, which is a public document of the Security Council dated the 19th of February. And 
I, I table this document, if I may, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, will do so at the conclusion of the speech in order that it's available for more convenient reference uh, by uh, honourable senators. The um, document in question is a 43-page one, um, which does explain in a great deal of detail uh, the present operational plan and indeed all the, uh, the seven different components of the UN operation that are in process of being put in place. Those uh, components, in summary, are as follows in the order in which they appear in this document. Uh, first, um, the human rights component, which involves uh, edu both education and oversight and the establishment of a human rights office as part of the civilian administration in Phnom Penh. Uh, secondly, there's the electoral component, which will involve this hugely complex uh, function of registration of voters and the, the conduct of the election itself. Once the uh, demobilisation is complete and the repatriation, or the return of refugees is, uh, is complete. Uh, thirdly, and uh, of course most immediately relevant, the military component, which has itself uh, four main subcomponents in terms of the particular roles that are to be played, namely uh, verification of the withdrawal of foreign forces, uh, secondly um, supervision of the ceasefire and related uh, measures, uh, which in turn involves a number of uh, separate uh, operations, regroupment, cantonment of some 200,000 military personnel, disarming of some 450,000 personnel, including the militias as well as the military, and demobilisation of at least 70 per cent, to quote the settlement, uh, of the military, but of course hopefully uh, a full 100 per cent. And let me make clear, because Senator Hill uh, made this point, uh, that we certainly hope, and I know the military authorities on the ground in Phnom Penh certainly hope, uh, that a greater degree of demobilisation than 70 per cent will in practice be able to be achieved, even if it wasn't able to be negotiated in the settlement text. Now, the third main function of the military component will be uh, weapons control, which involves uh, monitoring uh, the cessation of overseas or sorry, of external military uh, support in terms of weapons supply, uh, the location and confiscation of arms caches and the storing uh, of arms. And the fourth function is uh, assisting with mine clearance. Uh, that was the military component. The next component is civil administration, which, as the Prime Minister's uh, statement says, picking up the language of the, uh, of the um, text of the Secretary-General's report, uh, is designed essentially to do uh, everything necessary to secure a neutral environment conducive to and I quote this, quote, ensure a neutral political environment conducive to free and fair general elections, close quote. The precise content of that civilian administration role and how it will work out in practice in terms of looking over the shoulder of the different elements of the civilian administration in Phnom Penh is still in the process of being worked out. It's impossible to be precise about it at this stage, but the task itself has been defined in reasonably clear terms, at least uh, so far as the general principles of it are concerned. Then there's, uh, fifthly, the, sorry, fifthly, yes, the police component, uh, which will involve some 3,600 uh, police monitors on the Secretary-General's plan, um, to which Australia will be making a small contribution, as was announced today. Then, uh, uh, sixthly, there's the repatriation uh, component, uh, which involves, of course, primarily the UNHCR and the Red Cross working with NGOs to secure the repatriation of some uh, 350,000 people living on the Thai-Cambodian border. And finally, there's the rehabilitation uh, component, uh, which will uh, require a massive uh, aid effort by the international community, uh, the first manifestation of which will be uh, an inaugural meeting of uh, the International Conference on the Reconstruction of Cambodia, or ICORG, uh, which is planned for uh, Japan in June, and in which context Australia's uh, bilateral aid contribution announced today um, will have a part to play. The particular role to be played by the Australian forces um, was the subject of, uh, of query by um, 
Senator Hill. Of course, it's outlined in general terms in the statement. There's not an enormous amount more I can add uh, to what is in the statement, except to say this. On page 22 of the um, Secretary-General's report, the role of the signals unit is described in these terms, and I quote, a total of 582 all ranks would be deployed throughout the mission area. This unit would be responsible for the establishment of the force communication net, including ground to air communications. In addition, in, a, in coordination with civilian communications staff, the unit would assist with the provision of communications to the civilian components of UNTAC. End of quote. That's the context in which uh, I was referring last night uh, to uh, the Australians uh, being involved in, in a civilian role as well. And I was also making the obvious point that in the absence of any telecommunications infrastructure, uh, it's essentially going to be a matter for the armed forces signalers to create an equivalent. Uh, at least in uh, very uh, outline shape uh, of, a, of a telecom system uh, for the, the country. It's a huge job. It's in that context that the numbers we're talking about should be seen. It's not a matter of talking about uh, 582 uh, communicators in the context of just another uh, two or three or 4,000 people deployed. Remember that we're talking about a military component under this operational plan of 15,900 uh, in total. Uh, involving uh, uh, many different uh, operational roles, including an infantry element of some 10,200, uh, with 12 uh, battalions of roughly 850 people each. So it's in the context of, of an operation of this huge scale uh, that this particular logistic uh, support role has been identified and will be carried out by Australia. The deployment of the Australian troops will be a matter uh, for the military commander on the ground, who happens, of course, to be an Australian, uh, Lieutenant General Sanderson, but wearing a United Nations hat, not an Australian one. Uh, if it's not a matter of uh, defining uh, with the kind of precision that we needed to in the Gulf uh, conflict, uh, rules of engagement and the circumstances for the exercise of independent discretion and so on, because in the Gulf conflict, uh, the Australian uh, component of the forces was acting as, a, as an independent agency, in effect, although in coordination, of course, uh, with the other forces they're, they're concerned. Here it's a rather different uh, operation where the Australians are fully integrated into a UN uh, military exercise and are subject to UN command. Uh, of course, it's always capable for the Australian government uh, to make the decision that uh, it's unhappy about the way something is developing uh, on the ground and to, and to make the decision to withdraw the, the forces uh, thus engaged. Uh, but essentially, their deployment will be a matter for the, uh, the UNTAC force commander. The context uh, in which that deployment will occur has been unequivocally made clear by uh, Lieutenant General Sanderson. Uh, as a peacekeeping role, not a peace enforcement role. And I don't honestly think there's room for any further confusion about uh, these particular kinds of identified roles. Peace enforcement does involve something analogous to the Gulf War situation, where you're going into a manifestly hostile situation, uh, separating forces at war, exercising uh, military force. Peacekeeping. Uh, as that concept is now well understood, involves not any of that, but simply the monitoring, monitoring supervision and verification of, uh, of agreements already reached. Some ambiguity about the further expression peacemaking. Peacemaking is essentially used, or usually used, in the context of preventive diplomacy uh, or the kind of diplomacy that, uh, that was involved in, in actually crafting and bedding down uh, the settlements agreements signed in Paris. But there's a looser sense in which you can talk about peacemaking as being an ongoing task, and you can talk about the various UNTAC uh, components having, in a sense, an ongoing peacemaking role to the extent that their presence on the ground uh, will involve confidence building, uh, will happily uh, involve the negotiation or the resolution of local uh, disagreements and difficulties, the renegotiation of ceasefire terms, things of this kind that we've seen uh, already happening in, uh, in Kompong Tom. In an extended sense, uh, that does involve, I suppose, 
a degree of peacemaking, but the basic peacemaking has been done with the settlement agreements. What's necessary simply is to ensure that those agreements work themselves out. If the situation should deteriorate uh, to the point where there's a major conflict erupts uh, between the, uh, the various uh, Cambodian armed forces, uh, then it won't be the job of the UN forces to, uh, to endeavour to separate them, and it will become a matter for judgment by the international community as to how the situation is handled there on in, but in the worst case scenario it would involve, of course, the UN and the international community walking away completely uh, from the situation on the ground. That would be a desperately unhappy outcome, but that's the logic of this kind of role that has been uh, identified. Finally, so far as the, uh, the commitment of other countries uh, is concerned, which is the, the subject of a further uh, expression of concern by uh, Senator Hill, also by Dr Hewson and the other place, uh, let me say just this. We are in the early stages right now of seeing the, um, the acceptance of the invitation to supply components uh, of UNTAC and the deployment of those components. Uh, there are Indonesian and, I understand, Malaysian uh, battalions on the ground as well as the existing uh, UNIMIC. Uh, contingent. What I'm able to say, as I said last night in the Estimates Committee, <coughs> is that on the information that's uh, come to us just last night and again confirmed this morning uh, from New York, uh, there will be um, a further three infantry battalions employed very quickly uh, from three other countries uh, within the next uh, three weeks, along with a field ambulance unit, um, a number of police officers, a number of military observers, an engineering unit, uh, another logistics unit, some helicopters. And some, uh, and some naval personnel uh, with an expected total, taking into account those uh, already there, of 4,000 troops on the ground by the third week of, uh, of April. And of course, that's just the preliminary rapid deployment. There'll be much more uh, deployment uh, continuing to uh, occur over the period ahead. Everyone acknowledges that it's tremendously important to get as many people as possible on the ground before the uh, dry season. Uh, is overtaken uh, by the wet, and certainly it's uh, everyone's hope and expectation uh, that there'll be many more troops than just those 4,000 uh, on the ground before the wet. But it was important to, uh, to get very quickly uh, some people on the ground. So far as the uh, contributions, and, and uh, may I say that uh, in my calculations about 20 countries are now involved, taking into account those functions I've just described. Um, and no doubt there'll be many more uh, before the, uh, the process is complete. That's just in the military operation. Uh, there will unquestionably be other countries as well involved in the, uh, the electoral function and other aspects of civilian organisation as well as in the, uh, the policing function, which is going to be very important. The um, question was raised also about other countries and their uh, commitment uh, to paying the costs of this operation, which are very large. $1.9 billion is the estimate uh, for the 18-month period, uh, and uh, Australia's contribution as a proportion of that has been spelt out. Uh, it is the case that, um, to my knowledge, there, uh, there hasn't been a substantial number of contributions yet actually made, uh, even to the initial $200 million um, advance amount that's been formally agreed. Uh, one wouldn't expect contributions to be yet uh, being paid uh, for the larger uh, UNTAC assessed costs, uh, simply because um, that hasn't yet been finalised, hasn't been the subject of final formal decision. Uh, when it is, there's an obligation on countries to pay their assessed contribution within, I think, 30 days after that, and we can expect to see a rapid influx of money. One piece of good news in this respect I'm able to report as a result of a cable just uh, a few minutes ago of hours ago uh, from Washington is that the House of Representatives uh, Senate uh, yesterday uh, voted uh, very strongly in favour of a uh, uh, $270 million appropriation for um, peacekeeping dues, uh, the largest proportion of which we understand uh, will be set aside for the US share of UNTAC expenses. Well, that's only the House of Representatives who got the Senate to go. That was expected uh, within the last few hours or the next 24 hours. If it gets mixed up with uh, housing settlement money in Israel, God knows what will happen. But the hope is that um, the money will be uh, steadily coming through. So the pieces, what I'm trying to say is that the pieces are falling into place. I mean, I can understand um, some anxiety being uh, expressed on various bits and pieces of the, the total operation. 
But um, I do ask um, parliamentarians and the Australian public uh, to just be a little bit patient because of the extraordinary uh, complexity of the task. Can I just uh, say this, quoting finally the, uh, the Secretary General's report about all this. On the opening page, uh, the following words appear by way of introduction to all the information which then follows. I quote, it should be noted, however, that in spite of the efforts made by these various survey missions, the information obtained cannot be regarded as complete and current assessments regarding priorities and deployment may prove to be inaccurate as circumstances in Cambodia change. The specific recommendations contained in the present report may therefore need to be re-examined in the light of experience once UNTAC is in place." Unquote. So the, the urge for absolute certainty in terms of who is going to be deployed where, um, from which countries, at what cost, uh, is just a misplaced urge at this stage. It is a step-by-step -step exercise. We've done very well indeed in getting the first steps uh, in place. There are many more to go. I haven't uh, sought, the government hasn't sought to underestimate finally the risks that are associated uh, with this exercise. Australian troops, as will everyone else in Cambodia on the ground in civilian or military roles, face risks. Face risks from disease, face risks from mines and face risks also from the possibility of crossfire in the event uh, that military situations do deteriorate. In that environment, it is crucial that everyone acknowledge the legitimacy, the validity of the task on which we are all embarked. It's absolutely crucial that everyone in Cambodia that's working for peace, including very, very talented and skilled and devoted uh, members of the Australian Defence Forces, it's crucial that they and everyone else feel they have the support uh, of the Australian community and the Australian Parliament. I think that support has been essentially forthcoming uh, today uh, from members of the opposition, the Democrats, and I would expect from Senator Haradine. I thank them all uh, for that. Senator Jurek, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, um, it was most unfortunate that uh, Senator Evans uh, accepted the support uh, at the beginning of his speech uh, of the opposition and of the Democrats um, to, for the Prime Minister's statement on the, which he was, to which he was speaking here on the Cambodian peacekeeping. Uh, with some very churlish remarks about the opposition and, in particular, the leader of the opposition, Senator Hill. He uh, attempted to repair that uh, somewhat at the end of his speech, uh, but uh, I think it was a pity that he set a, uh, uh, a tone in his uh, response which was not at all justified by the support which the opposition uh, is giving to the uh, extended motion uh, which has been moved by Senator Ray in this place and which does clearly and the opposition clearly supports uh, the uh, affirmations there of support uh, in the parliament for Australia's participation in the, post in the uh, Cambodian peacekeeping and uh, the participation of the Australian Defence Force in particular uh, as having a most important role. Senator uh, Evans uh, has, throughout this uh, debate on Australia's role and contribution to peacekeeping in Cambodia, uh, has always expected uh, the opposition uh, to give him a blank cheque and a pat on the back. And uh, I hope now that uh, he's received uh, a pat on the back from uh, the Leader of the Opposition, Dr Houston in particular, in another place, and from Senator Hill here, uh, that he will now feel a little bit better. But nevertheless, we have not been prepared to give him a black che blank cheque, and nor will we give him a back blank cheque today. The fact is that uh, this operation that is uh, proposed and which has been the subject of great deal of discussion in the United Nations and throughout the world uh, is recognised in the statement itself as the most ambitious, the most comprehensive, uh, the most costly 
and I would think without doubt the most dangerous peacekeeping operation which the United Nations has ever undertaken. And it's under, been undertaking it in one of the most uh, notoriously difficult uh, and uh, unstable and, in, in, uh, and indeed uh, most dangerous place in the world, and which has been now for uh, at least uh, two or more decades. So it was not, uh, it's not surprising that uh, the opposition, and indeed anyone, would wish to be satisfied that there were conditions uh, had been reached where a proper peacekeeping operation, albeit one of great uh, complexity and uh, danger, but could in fact as a proper peacekeeping peaking operation be undertaken. Now uh, this is not a, uh, by any means a pedantic concern of the oppositions. It's one which uh, the Prime Minister in his statement which the, uh, Senator Evans, in answer to questions yesterday, Senator, uh, uh, or the day before yesterday, Senator Ray, in answer to a question yesterday, have all emphasised the, uh, the nature of a peacekeeping operation as distinct from a peace enforcing or imposing operation. And that has gone to the heart of the opposition's concerns, when, uh, which we have been expressing, but largely by uh, Senator Hill over the time in which this uh, operation has been debated and uh, has now been set up. Now, I notice in the, uh, the Prime Minister's statement, which is uh, tabled here this afternoon by Senator Ray, it states that uh, the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia, or what we now uh, will refer to as UNTAC, will have a peacekeeping role which is described as supervising, monitoring and verifying the ceasefire, partial demobilisation of, of armed forces, and bear in mind the nature of those armed forces in Cambodia, and the cessation of external military assistance. Now that's the military role of UNTAC and I want to uh, address myself to that in the remarks of, uh, that I am making in this debate. Uh, Senator Evans has indicated it has many other, UNTAC has many other roles, and they are important roles, but I, uh, I think we're really focusing today on the, on the military role, because we are here supporting the government's decision to um, send uh, an Australian contingent, uh, 495 members of the Australian Defence Force, to uh, form what is called a Force Communications Unit the role of which has now uh, thankfully been spelt out uh, with uh, some more detail by Senator Evans in the speech he has just made. Now uh, that role, as described, uh, cannot be carried out by the Australian uh, forces. It can't be carried out by any of the United Nations military forces in Cambodia, Cambodia unless there are the circumstances present in that country uh, which enable that uh, role to be performed. And it's precisely because of the concerns about the nature of the conditions in Cambodia uh, in recent months, or indeed in recent years, and what was to be the particular, what could be done in a peacekeeping role uh, in the circumstances as they have been and as they uh, uh, may be up to the present time. And if anyone <coughs> still has any doubts about um, the, the uh, justification for concern in these matters, one only has to look at the first page of the Prime Minister's statement, where he says, and I quote, if conditions are right in Cambodia, the government expects that the main Australian contingent will begin deploying during this month. The government is still saying today, if the conditions are right in Cambodia. Now that's all that, that is what the opposition has been wanting to be satisfied about for months and months and months. We have had Senator Evans um, 
uh, talking incessantly here and in all around the world uh, about the uh, settlement in Cambodia, uh, in, uh, in which he has played a prominent and leading role, and that's been acknowledged. As I said, I hope he now feels better that Dr. Houston has actually acknowledged it in his, uh, his speech in another place this afternoon. If that's all he's been worried about, well, he's, uh, he's, been, uh, he's been given uh, that acknowledgement. But that is, not the, that is not the question. The question is whether or not it is possible to uh, mount a peacekeeping operation of this complexity, of this size, uh, in the circumstances as they are in Cambodia. And it may be that uh, it may be that the latest information that is coming forward from uh, Cambodia and from the United Nations um, uh, commander there, Lieutenant General Sanderson, who is, of course, a distinguished uh, Australian soldier, and I uh, might um, take the opportunity of congratulating him personally on his appointment and on his promotion to Lieutenant General. But, uh, and we have, of course, every confidence in him. Uh, but uh, we need to be assured, and have needed to be assured, as indeed does the government to be assured, that the conditions are right in Cambodia. And it's clear that the government cannot say, even today, in its statement today, which, for which we've been waiting, what, five months or something of that sort, uh, that the conditions are right and that the Australian the main Australian contingent, which is 400 and uh, there will be another 430 um, signallers or communicators, as they now seem to be known as, uh, will be on their way to Cambodia. It's not said today that they are going. It's only saying uh, that if the conditions are right, they will be going before the end of this month. Now, we hope that the conditions will be right and that they uh, will be able to uh, get started on this uh, most important task, uh, for which, of course, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the greatest uh, respect for them and our uh, uh, confidence that they will perform this task with their usual uh, professional competence. There is no doubt, no worries whatever, on the score of the, um, of the uh, ability of uh, our uh, members of our defence force uh, to play the role that is expected for them. It is the question only of what is, what is the, uh, the conditions there and are they suitable uh, for this role to be played. Uh, we are, of course, uh, ha have been all along uh, in support of the, the whole peace process and uh, it is certainly now looking uh, promising that that process will, uh, will uh, be able to be brought into effect. Nevertheless, one must, must have uh, great concerns about the enormity of the task in the time frame that is being laid down here, that is intended there will be um, this whole peace uh, demobilisation of these forces, the establishment of the, of the, uh, the Yontak uh, as a uh, virtually a government of, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Cambodia, the uh, conditions, uh, the establishment of the election, uh, conditions for an election and the administration for an election, the repatriations of uh, hundreds of thousands of Cambodians uh, back to the Cambodia from the border camps and so on. It's an enormous task and all that is uh, aimed to be achieved. Uh, and, and, and to, to uh, be established for elections in May next year, May 1993. Now, uh, that is the sort of, uh, those are the, uh, the sort of concerns that um, we have had. Now, addressing myself specifically to the military role, I've already indicated what it is, and Senator Evans has also spelt it out uh, uh, better in his, his speech today, and he has um, uh, provided some answers to a number of to questions I would have been wanting to ask had he not done so, because they're not really clearly spelled out in this statement. But uh, let us just have a look at the task that this um, United Nations uh, peacekeeping force is going to have to uh, perform. 
Yeah, in, in this period of 12 months, or perhaps no necessity be required to be uh, performed in less than the 12 months, but they have to demobilise, or as I understand it, disarm uh, something like 450,000 uh, Cambodian soldiers uh, representing the various factions. They have got to be um, brought into what is called a cantonment situation, whereby they can be uh, disarmed. If that's got to be done throughout, uh, presumably as much as uh, uh, possible, will have to be done during the wet season, which you'll provide with great difficulties, in a country which is infested with mines and the other role, as Senator Evans has said today, there's been to, uh, to seek out and to seize and, um, uh, take a, and certainly take away from the factions uh, uh, caches of arms, which are no doubt very extensive throughout the country. So it is a, uh, an enormous role and uh, it is one uh, which I think is going to be um, required. Uh, and test to the extreme the forces that are going to be available. Now, Senator Evans has admitted today that there's only going to be about 4,000 uh, members of the UNTAC military uh, mission in place by the end of April this year, and maybe that, uh, that won't be achieved as soon as that. But the estimate is that, that what is required is 15,900 military personnel uh, together with um, 3,500 civilian police and uh, another 3,000 or more civilian administrators. But uh, the uh, number that is to be in place by the end of this month, as Senator Evans has told us today, is very, very far short of the 16,000. It's only, in fact, a quarter of the size of the, um, the military uh, component of UNTAC. Now, uh, the Australians, uh, if, they, if the conditions are right and if they do get into Cambodia, as everybody is uh, hoping it will be possible uh, within this, the end of this month, Senator Evans has indicated that they will there be establishing the communications for that um, and up to that number of 16,000 um, or perhaps 10,000 or so troops in the field, but a total of 16,000 in Cambodia, uh, that the, the role will be wider than that because it will have a role of providing uh, communications for uh, vital civilian administration as well, which of course will be uh, most important from the point of view of establish, establishing the conditions whereby elections can be held in Cambodia and uh, a stable administration put in place. So it will be a very uh, important role for those, uh, those members of the Australian Defence Force. They won't, they won't all be serving uh, with um, the, the military personnel that have been provided by, apparently, as Senator Evans says, up to 20 other countries, although, as I said, there's still a lot of ifs and buts about where those numbers will come from. And, uh, what countries and how, in fact, will they all be there in due time? But nevertheless, assuming this all goes according to plan, the members of the, Aust of the ADF in Cambodia will be exposed to um, a, a great many dangers. And uh, one matter of concern is that they may be uh, not fully protected in some of the circumstances in which they will be serving. I don't think there's any doubt that, that must be recognised. But uh, it's a matter which I think the government should uh, be addressing a little more seriously than it seems to be uh, doing. Uh, the uh, government has, says it has, although it hasn't assessed uh, any casualty rate, according to the Minister of Defence in answer to a question yesterday, which is rather an astonishing admission to, for, to be made by the Minister of Defence, nevertheless the government is... A, is uh, uh, is, a, is certainly recognising a variety of uh, dangerous situations which they, which they will be uh, operating. And I think it is certainly up to the government to ensure 
that uh, the maximum protection in the circumstances will be given uh, to those members of the Australian forces. Now, I think um, Senator Evans has, uh, has uh, as I said, uh, spelled out um, in much more detail than so far has been given and was given in the Prime Minister's statement in relation to that particular concern of the oppositions, but we still have, for the reasons I've just mentioned, uh, continuing concerns about their safety and uh, about the uh, hazardous nature of the role that they are going to, that they're asked to perform. As far as the military situation itself is concerned in Cambodia, the statement that we have before us recognises uh, the, uh, the doubts and difficulties that still remain. It, uh, it spells those out uh, uh, in relation to the recent fighting in Kompong Tom province. And it goes on to say, and this is a very key statement in the statement of the Prime Ministers, Implement implementation of the peace plan may well prove more difficult than its negotiation. There are bound to be further setbacks. And indeed, there certainly, uh, on, on the track record of the Khmer Rouge, there is certainly likely to be more setbacks without any doubt whatever. I mean, they're not, we're not talking about here about ordinary uh, guerrillas, uh, fighters. We're talking about a well organised and uh, well equipped military organisation which has already created uh, the mayhem throughout Cambodia uh, for now um, two decades or more, and who are still showing signs of their, their, uh, their past, uh, as uh, recently as uh, the last few days. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is a dangerous force, and uh, it's no good hiding from that fact. So uh, the situation is such that uh, it may well be, it may well arise that um, a peacekeeping role is not going to be possible. And that is where the real uh, uh, sharp point of concern must be. Uh, who is going to decide that? And what will be the actual circumstances in which uh, uh, will be critical in deciding that. And uh, although it is, it is a relief to hear the government uh, commit themselves very firmly in this statement um, that uh, if in fact it is, <laughs> it is no longer possible to keep peace in Cambodia, the Australian and other United Nations forces will have to be withdrawn. Now, another matter of concern we have had, and, and indeed still have, despite what Senator Evans has said, is what control will the Australian government have over the making of that decision uh, if, in fact, uh, it comes to that? And I think we've, realistically we must face the fact that that may well be the case, despite all the hopes that we have, despite uh, the uh, optimism that um, uh, I think Senator Evans is perhaps uh, has more than most most other people. Nevertheless, uh, that may well we may well face that. Now, as I understand from Senator Evans, now that decision, in fact, will be uh, will be made uh, by UNTAC, and in, I suppose in many the most influential in that respect will be. The, uh, commander, the military commander there, Lieutenant General Sanderson. Now, I think we're, we're very fortunate indeed that we have a distinguished Australian soldier there commanding the their, their force that will give us all and the soldiers themselves no doubt more confidence that uh, there will be uh, very, very careful consideration given uh, to their situation. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a responsibility which must be assumed at all times, retained at all times, by the government itself. And even though there isn't going to be any rules of engagement in the ordinary sense and the command structure 
uh, maintained in, in, uh, over the Australian contingent in Cambodia, as occurred in the Gulf War or in a similar operation as that. Uh, nevertheless, the Australian government has got the responsibility, and it will always have the responsibility, and it will have to, it will have to recognise that responsibility to ensure that the Australian uh, uh, contingent in Cambodia is not being used beyond the role which everyone so clearly acknowledges is a peacekeeping role and a peacekeeping role only. Now that uh, is not a satisfactory situation as um, uh, I think as Senator Evans outlined it, uh, unless, unless the government does continue to watch that very closely and there will be very difficult decisions to make uh, in uh, whether or not the borderline uh, has been uh, stepped over uh, in circumstances which, uh, as they uh, are likely to occur uh, from time to time in Cambodia. So, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, despite the statement today, which uh, um, has been made by the Prime Minister, despite the fuller explanations uh, and uh, which have, a, would, uh, uh, I think, address uh, a number of our concerns, uh, this remains a continuing uh, situation of, uh, of doubt and difficulty and certainly a very fluid uh, and fast uh, changing scene. And it's one that uh, we expect the government, as Senator Evans, as uh, Mr. E uh, Dr. Houston has pointed out, as Senator Hill has pointed out, we expect that the government will take uh, the opposition fully into its uh, confidence when, uh, at all times, when, uh, particularly when these problems uh, may arise. And uh, we will be consulted, and indeed this parliament will be consulted if there is any suggestion that the Australian role, or indeed the UNTAC role, is, uh, is changing in Cambodia, uh, whether it be uh, by force of, uh, of circumstances or by policy decisions or whatever it may be. But this is, this is not a, uh, a one-off debate today. This is not a, a one-off decision we're making. It's going to be requiring by the government uh, and uh, it will require us on behalf of the opposition and, and in the parliament to maintain a constant vigilance uh, about the situation and that uh, the concerns that have been debated today about the, the military situation in Cambodia, about the role that the peacekeeping forces can play there and successfully play there is an ongoing worry and responsibility which we all have to share and bear. Now, I'm pleased the government has uh, gone uh, a, lo a long way in the statement in, uh, in addressing those concerns. I can't say that they have been alleviated by the government, but at least the government uh, has uh, made it clear that they understand them and they share them. And I think that's a big step forward as far as the uh, political de debate in this country is concerned. And it is for those reasons the opposition is supporting the government, is supporting its motion, it is not proposing any, any amendments to it. Uh, and uh, in particular, of course, we want to give the uh, fullest support and uh, understanding and encouragement uh, to the members of the Australian Defence Forces who are shouldering the really difficult burden of this uh, very important duty, not only to Australia, not only to Cambodia, but I think also uh, to uh, the cause of peace in our, in our region. Uh, Senator Loosley. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. It's a privilege to rise to support this comprehensive statement delivered by the Prime Minister in the House of Representatives and by 
Senator Ray in the Senate this afternoon. It represents a culmination of a number of years of Australian initiative and skill in diplomacy. And it reflects, again, an emerging Australian capacity to play a role in our region and in international relations in a broader sense. And Mr Acting Deputy President, it's refreshing to see a degree of bipartisanship returning to this debate. As I've said on a number of occasions before in the Senate, effective foreign policy, effective defence policy and effective trade policy really can only evolve on a bipartisan basis. But having said that, could I say that there was no doubt during the time of the public debate on our Cambodian involvement, on the Cambodian initiative, on the Cambodian peace process, that Australian opinion overwhelmingly supported the endeavours of the government. And there is no doubt in my mind that the Australian people at large, from the very beginning of the peace process, endorsed the involvement of Australian officials, endorsed the initiative taken by Senator Evans, and in particular, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Australian electorate endorses the role to be taken by our armed forces in Cambodia in the pursuit of peace. And there is no doubt also in my mind that the Australian people at large acknowledged the extraordinary ability of the ADF in peacekeeping roles. That's been demonstrated now time and time again over the decades of our UN involvement. To look at the Cambodian circumstance, Mr Acting Deputy President, it's important to begin at the point of recognising that this was the worst civil war in Asia since the Chinese Civil War of the 1940s. It was for a period of nearly two decades a particularly brutal, indeed gruesome, conflict. All civil wars are bloody. All civil wars are terribly divisive. The Cambodian Civil War was absolutely murderous in its intensity and it proved to be catastrophic in its consequences, not only for that unhappy country but for the region at large, involving a border conflict with Thailand and then later an outright war between the Khmer Rouge and the Republic of Vietnam. Having said that, it's important also to note that here this evening, in the context of the Prime Minister's statement, we are endeavouring to deal with the consequences of that civil war and doing so as a government, as a parliament, in a deliberate and effective way. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government never sought, either from the opposition or from the Australian people, a blank cheque in this regard. We did expect that all Australians would rise to the challenge that's before the country and before the ADF, and it's now apparent that the challenge has been met. Mr Acting Deputy President, every peacekeeping initiative in which the Australian Armed Forces have been involved has been extremely dangerous. There's no doubt about that. During the course of the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade's review of our peacekeeping operations, we were told personally and directly by officers of the ADF who had served in peacekeeping missions just how dangerous the task had proved to be. And that was especially true, Mr Acting Deputy President, of the role of the ADF in the Iran-Iraq peacekeeping role, where, for example, some of our officers separated large contingents of Iraqi and Iranian military personnel armed with heavy weapons and separated only by a few metres of mine-strewn territory. 
At times, some of our personnel showed quite astonishing courage in performing the task, in keeping those forces separate and in avoiding a further eruption in a war, of course, that had lasted the best part of a decade. So all peacekeeping initiatives are dangerous. The Cambodian venture is dangerous. There's no doubt about that. But compare and contrast it with the Yugoslav involvement, where the United Nations Protective Force is about to be deployed in that strife-torn country, to place matters in perspective. As Senator Jones asked the other day in a question to Senator Evans, there is every chance that the civil war in Yugoslavia will erupt again. That's an unfortunate truth that confronts us. Nonetheless, the United Nations has a role to play in that country, just as the United Nations has a role to play now in Cambodia. And if I could quote Mr Ian Harris, the executive director of CARE, in a recent statement, this venture does represent our last chance for peace in Cambodia. If this initiative breaks down, we are going to see a return to circumstances that plagued Cambodia for the best part of a decade. Now, it's particularly satisfying to note, Mr Acting Deputy President, that an Australian, an outstanding Australian officer in Lieutenant General Sanderson, has command of the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia. That's particularly satisfying. It's well earned and it's a mark of international respect, not only for Lieutenant Colonel Sanderson in the personal, but for our armed forces in the broad, given the role that we've played in a range of peacekeeping missions right across the globe. It's also satisfying to note the cooperative nature of the venture, with troops being committed from a number of countries, including New Zealand, already. It's also very satisfying to note, Mr Acting Deputy President, the fact that Mr Michael Maley of the Australian Electoral Commission will act as the Deputy Electoral Commissioner for UNTAC. Could I pay tribute to Mr Maley for his performance in Namibia and for the performance generally of the Australian Electoral Commission in different circumstances, in very difficult political circumstances in a range of countries over recent years, in building or rebuilding an electoral framework. There is no doubt that one of the key elements in the successful conclusion of the negotiations, which has really led to the formation of UNTAC, was the fact that external assistance to the armed forces, to the factions in Cambodia, has come to an end. And in that, the cessation of Chinese assistance, Chinese military assistance to the Khmer Rouge is a central fact on which the peace process pivots. There is no doubt that the Khmer Rouge have an absolutely bloody and intolerable history. There is no doubt also that they can, can continue to create mischief for some time to come as apparently they're about doing in the Kompong Tom province at the moment. But there is no doubt also that that capacity over time comes to a halt. And the successful conclusion of a peacekeeping mission and of general elections in Cambodia hastens that end. Could I say that uh, Dr Hewson in the House of Representatives this afternoon earned more than a few points with the very reasonable approach that he took to the Prime Minister's statement and with his remarks bordering on the generous about Senator Evans. There is no doubt, though, Mr Acting Deputy President, that Senator Evans' performance on Cambodia has been outstanding. There is no doubt also that the Australian Parliament should be proud of the role taken by the Foreign Minister and his officers just as we are proud of the role of our armed forces personnel in Cambodia now and for the future. None of us, Mr Acting Deputy President, should be under any illusions about the magnitude of the task that confronts the United Nations in Cambodia. The UN is embarked upon nothing less than the rebuilding of a Com Cambodian political infrastructure. The UN is embarked upon nothing less than building 
a new government of Cambodia for the Cambodian people for the future based upon their own decisions through the ballot box. And the United Nations, of course, Mr Acting Deputy President, has also embarked upon a process by which Cambodia can be readmitted as a full member with all rights in the international community of nations. It's also pleasing to note in the Prime Minister's statement, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the multidisciplinary approach that's being taken by the United Nations is reflected in the determination of the Australian government to make substantial sums of aid available to Cambodia. As Mr Caron, the Minister for Trade and Overseas Development, has made clear through the allocation of some $49 million Australian in development assistance. There is no doubt that if a new world order is emerging, then Cambodia is really a very great test of that order. And when I use the expression new world order, I'm talking about a system of international relations which is based upon the principles embodied in the Charter of the United Nations. Cambodia is a very early and very great test of that new system of conflict resolution and rebuilding. To compare and contrast the Cambodian situation with that which exists in Yugoslavia is instructive. There is no doubt in my mind that in both circumstances there are likely to be setbacks, there are likely to be challenges to the authority of the United Nations, there are likely to be dilemmas that confront us. There's no doubt in my mind that in both circumstances the agencies of the United Nations will prove equal to the task. And I speak, Madam Acting Deputy President, as a member of a political party that fought, as Senator Balkus knows only too well, for the authority of the United Nations to prevail since the inception of that body in San Francisco in 1945 at the end of the Second World War. The UN demonstrated its worth just recently in the Gulf conflict. I believe it will demonstrate its worth in, the, in bringing to an end the Yugoslav civil war and in bringing to a successful conclusion the peacekeeping mission in Cambodia. Madam Acting Deputy President, the circumstances which have led to the Prime Ministerial statement delivered in the House of Representatives today are those of careful deliberation. There has been an ongoing public debate about our involvement in Cambodia, but as I've mentioned previously, there's no doubt where Australian public opinion resides on this matter. Australians have confidence in our capacity to build a peaceful settlement, to find a police peaceful solution, and Australians have confidence in the capabilities of our military in the peacekeeping role. And that has led to the commitment of Australia to Cambodia. But there's no doubt either, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the successful evolution of an enduring peace depends very largely on the Cambodian people themselves, not upon the, the factions, not upon the different military groupings, but upon the Cambodian people themselves. They have suffered greatly. They have suffered terrible injury. But there appears to be no reason to doubt their desire and their determination to make deliberate decisions through the instrument of the ballot box in the very near future. And when that happens, I believe we are well on the way, Madam Acting Deputy President, to achieving an enduring and just peace for Cambodia and for its people. Could I say that, uh, in particular, I endorse the Prime Minister's remarks about the pride with which Australian Defence Force units can be viewed for having played instrumental roles in peacekeeping operations in the Sinai, in Iran and Iraq, in the Western Sahara and, most recently, of course, in Namibia. That same remark can also be made about officers of the AFP in Cyprus. What we all want to see this evening as we debate the Prime Minister's statement, in my view, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President, 
is an identical conclusion. We are looking to the future of Cambodia and to the region. That really is the vital concern. We are aiming to achieve an enduring peace, an enduring stability in Cambodia and in the region, enduring democracy and enduring progress for Cambodia and for its people. And in that, I am very proud to be part of a government that took the initiatives that led to the Prime Minister's statement being delivered in the parliament today. And I conclude by saying it's refreshing to see bipartisanship return to the debate. Senator Newman. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. While I rise to support the statement on Cambodian peacekeeping and the motion before the parliament, I am disappointed about two aspects of the debate. First of all, I am disappointed by claims by government members, which we have just heard again from Senator Loosley, about a past so-called lack of bipartisanship on this issue. As he would know full well, this is not the truth. Secondly, I am disappointed at the lack of detail on the military deployment aspects in, this, in the statement. But let it be quite clear about this so-called lack of bipartisanship. There has not been any failure of bipartisan on this issue. There have been genuinely held and expressed concerns about the timing and the propriety of the deployment while offensives, the offensive continues. There has been no lack of bipartisanship. What the government means by that allegation is that an opposition has no right to, quiz, to question the wisdom of this government. Now that claim, I re, of, of course, I reject, and I reject it utterly. Turning now to my second disappointment, that is the lack of detail on what is essentially a military operation. I don't quibble with the foreign affairs imprint on the document. Obviously, it needs uh, to be there. But I do resent the lack of information on the involvement and the deployment of our force. Senators Hill and Durack have detailed some of the matters we would have expected to, to have seen included in the statement, so I don't intend to repeat them this evening. Senator Ray's involvement in this document seems to have extended merely to tabling the document in the Senate. As the wife of an infantryman who was seen off to war in Vietnam by a parliament which did lack bipartisan support for the involvement, I believe that it's extremely important that it be put firmly on the record that these 500, 495 servicemen and women have the strong support and confidence of the federal opposition. We have, however, expressed our concern not at their abilities, not at their professionalism in the face of danger, but at the lack of information on the current situation in Cambodia over the past weeks. We have been kept in the dark by the government while the much vaunted peace process has been wobbling. Reports from Cambodia have been very disturbing. We believe that our forces are there as peacekeepers, not as foreign participants in a civil war. We have been concerned that their introduction may be premature. Indeed, even the government in the statement indicates that that might be the case. And I quote, the statement says, if conditions are right in Cambodia, the government expects that the main Australian contingent will begin deploying during this month. Clearly, there still is the possibility of delay, and I would hope that uh, the government will be putting the, the safety of our troops first before any need to rush in to be uh, uh, one of the leaders uh, of deploying UN peacekeepers to Cambodia. There's no prize for, being, for winning if, uh, if you take substantial casualties. One can't help wondering what would have been the role of the main force of our troops if they had already been deployed up country when the current hostilities had broken out. Now, the statement refers to the recent fighting in Kampon Tom province. When my colleague, the leader of the National Party, Mr Tim Fisher, visited Cambodia in the new year, he visited that area and at that time rocket firing from five to seven kilometres away was clearly heard. He visited the various factions, he had some opportunity to visit our aid workers and projects and he saw our contingent in Phnom Penh. I also hoped to visit our troops in Cambodia during July, just as I visited the first contingent of our peacekeepers in Namibia several years ago. They brought honour on our defence force, as I'm sure will, be, will the Cambodian force. They will be leaving families at home who will worry and wait as we did when our men went to Vietnam 
in the, early, in the 60s and the early 70s. I've already visited the wife of one of our peacekeepers in my home state of Tasmania. And I say to those families, you will not be forgotten. While I hope and trust that the Defence Force and the Federal Government will spring to your aid if you need help over the next year, I also promise that any help which I, as the Shadow Minister for Defence Science and Personnel, can give, I will gladly give. Turning again to the military aspects of the deployment, I must emphasise a matter which has not been spelled out, but which must be given attention. And I, I refer to the rules of engagement. What will the arrangements be for changes in the military situation, whereby our personnel may need to take action to defend themselves? Who will determine when the rules of engagement are to change? What will the involvement of the Australian Government be in such decisions? What likelihood of delay will there be? And the reason for asking these is only too clear, because um, when our experience in the Gulf War was that our naval commanders were waiting for commands back in Australia, waiting on the Department of Foreign Affairs, who had no understanding of the pressures of the situation, the time constraints and the lives of all men on board who needed to be protected. When the government states today that it does not underestimate the need to take every prudent precaution to protect our troops, it must recognise that the working relationships between the United Nations, the Departments of Foreign Affairs and Defence and Lieutenant General Sanderson could be very critical to the protection of our troops. I have every confidence in General Sanderson, an extremely capable officer with a strong moral fibre. But the UN is a very bureaucratic and slow-moving organisation and problems occurred in Namibia for our force because of that bureaucracy. While Defence assessed the possible casualties in Namibia as likely to be between 2 and 3 per cent prior to their deployment, one can only assume in the absence of such information from the government that that assessment must be at least as great for Cambodia. The same problems exist of unmapped minefields and armed men still engaging in sporadic firefights. The assessment, fortunately, was over-pessimistic in Namibia, and I trust that it will not be correct for Cambodia. I do direct the government's attention to the value of sending some of our infantry to work with our specialist troops on these United Nations peacekeeping deployments. The certainty of the safety of our specialist troops would be enhanced, and of value also would be the experience gained by our very professional infantry who to date have had minimal opportunity to get peacekeeping experience. I understand that the United Nations prefers to ask for um, infantry uh, units from, from other countries and specialist units from countries such as Australia, but I do urge the Australian Government to look at this question more closely. Now, the opposition does support this deployment of our troops. It also supports the motion of the Government and the statement that was before us today. We wish our troops well, confident in their ability and proud of their professionalism. We look forward to hearing of their service and to welcoming them safely home. Senator Schott. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the resolution and the statement from uh, the government. Uh, it's a very proud moment uh, to speak to this resolution as one who's had a long interest in seeking a peace solution, uh, a peaceful solution for Cambodia. I've spoken before on many occasions in this chamber and I've asked many questions about Cambodia. I've had the opportunity to visit Cambodia twice in 1988 and again in 1990. And I only hope that in the coming year or years, uh, particularly during the UN peacekeeping role, that uh, many members of the Australian Parliament uh, can also visit Cambodia and see what terrible uh, events have, uh, un have occurred in that country uh, in, in over the last few years and uh, lend their support and commitment to the Cambodian people in seeking a peaceful solution. I don't know uh, what has been the longest war of the 20th century, but I suspect the fighting that's been going on in Cambodia in one form or another uh, since 1942 or 41 means that Cambodia has probably been the longest war of the 20th century. 
in, in something like its 50th year. There was the war, there was first of all the fighting in the Second World War, there was the fighting against the French for uh, getting Cambodian independence. Once that was achieved, there was the beginning of the insurgency by the Khmer Rouge during the late 50s and the 60s. Then there was the involvement of the Vietnamese and the Americans along the borders of Cambodia as a result of the Vietnam War. Then there was the uh, direct involvement uh, uh, of, the, of American intervention in, uh, in Cambodia. There was the coup in 1970, which led to a terrible uh, civil war uh, up till 1975, till the Khmer Rouge triumphed. Then there was the terrible period of the Khmer Rouge, uh, in which there wasn't much fighting, there was just slaughter of their own people. Then there was the Vietnamese intervention in 1979 to get rid of the Pol Pot government. And then throughout the 80s, there was again civil war as the various uh, factions, the Khmer Rouge, the Sihanouk faction and the Son San faction fought against the uh, Hun Sen, uh, against the uh, government installed in, uh, in, in uh, Phnom Penh by the Vietnamese. So I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that Cambodia has been the longest war of the 20th century. The untold suffering through now th at least three generations of Cambodians has been, uh, has been appalling. But today we are talking about Australia's involvement as part of the UN peacekeeping force. And at long last, there may be more than just a small glimmer of light that the Cambodian people, the ordinary people, will, through this process, lead to a free election next year and have a government of their own free choice and the fighting will stop. And I have to say that uh, Australia should be very proud of the role it has played in reaching that settlement. And I, uh, I believe that uh, uh, for many, many years to come, Australia's role in uh, Cambodia will rank as one of our finest foreign affairs policy uh, achievements, which will stand us in good stead for all the countries of Southeast Asia, that we were the honest broker, we were the ones without a vested interest, but were honestly there trying to get peace to this poor, unfortunate country. Uh, who had suffered 50 years of fighting, much of it imposed on it by others. I think in uh, uh, recognition uh, of Australia's role, we must pay tribute to others, other countries. It's been mentioned in the statement by the Prime Minister that Senator Evans, the present Foreign Minister, and the previous Foreign Minister, Mr Hayden, should be given particular credit for the role that they've played in the 80s, and I certainly endorse that. I think. Uh, one should remember that in the mid-80s, when Bill Hayden first started, he was condemned, both within this country and elsewhere, as, uh, as being unrealistic in the proposals he put forward. But uh, he, followed by Senator Evans, who produced the Red Book, the comprehensive plan for the UN involvement and a peace settlement, which the UNP5 uh, overwhelmingly adopted as their own plan, uh, means that Senator Evans has a very honoured place, not only in the history of this country, but in the history of Southeast Asia. I think he certainly deserves the nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize, but it's a nomination that I think he would quite welcome to, I think, share with a number of other major players. I think that Ali Alatas, the Foreign Minister for Indonesia, should be given special credit for the role he played in chairing the Jakarta meetings, many of them ending in deadlock, but he kept going back calling further meetings, and his assistance in that process can't be, uh, uh, can't be ignored. I also think the former Prime Minister of Thailand, Chattachai, must be given considerable credit for leading uh, a number of the Southeast Asian countries out of their st uh, sterile uh, policy about Cambodia. I think when he invited Hun Sen, the, the Prime Minister of uh, Cambodia, to Bangkok, in uh, 1989, that was the psychological breakthrough that was needed in relations between the ASEAN countries and, the, uh, uh, and Vietnam and Cambodia. I also think the French, as co-chairman of the peace conference in Paris, must also be given particular credit. I'd also like to pay a particular uh, credit uh, to Hun Sen, the present Prime Minister 
uh, of Phnom Penh or the Phnom Penh government. Again and again, it was Hun Sen who made compromise to, with the other three factions who were fighting him uh, and his government that led to the comprehensive settlement. I have no doubt that if Hun Sen had been like most leaders who have some sort of power and refused to compromise, we wouldn't be where we are today. And it's remarkable for a man who received little formal education, was at one stage recruited into the Khmer Rouge but fled when he saw the evils of their rule in the late 70s, that uh, he first of all when he first of all became foreign minister in the early 80s of the Phnom Penh government and then prime minister. He continued to grow and is now a man of considerable political stature and uh, I believe he also deserves uh, an equivalent nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize with the other people I have mentioned. So I think there's much credit to be given to many uh, and of course it's very pleasing that Senator Evans in particular from Australia is one of those who's been internationally nominated. We now have the UN going in with a peacekeeping force that may in the end total 15,000 soldiers, several hundred administrators to run the country to the holding of free elections in May next year. The biggest UN involvement in any country uh, directly, a cost of $2 billion, of which our, assessed, uh, our assessment will be probably in excess of $30 million. But of course, our direct role of providing, as the statement shows, several hundred soldiers, uh, mainly communications uh, soldiers because of the, our expertise in that area, but we've also announced that we're providing a senior electoral official to prepare for the, early, uh, prepare for the elections next year. We'll also be providing other officials uh, as required through the UN. So Australia's role in that country will be significant as part of the UN involvement. But I would also like to take this opportunity to place on record the appreciation Australia should make to a number of others, Australian citizens who have contributed over the years to getting a peace settlement in, uh, in Cambodia. Others have already mentioned the now important role that Major General, uh, Lieutenant General Sanderson will play as the uh, uh, Chief Military Officer of the UN Peacekeeping Force. I agree with other speakers who say there is no more um, commanding soldier, soldier with intellect that can take on that job. And Australia is very well served by having such an officer available as uh, Lieutenant General Sanderson. Mention has been made of Russell Stewart, Colonel Russell Stewart, already wounded uh, in carrying out his duties in uh, Cambodia. I first met Russell Stewart some two years ago after he'd made several visits to Cambodia um, as part of initial inquiries about the situation in the country. And I have to say about Russell Stewart, he is a uh, soldier of considerable initiative. Uh, the way he assessed the situation in the country, often making reports that disagreed with much of the uh, propaganda put out by other countries about the true situation. He stuck to his guns and he's been proven, uh, he's been proven right in his assessment uh, and how a peacekeeping operation could work. Uh, I think Russell Stewart is deserving of special commendation for the work he has already put in in getting a peace Peace or peacekeeping force into operation in Cambodia. I'd like to mention three particular Australians who I don't think uh, are well known in this country, though they are very well known in Cambodia. One of them is uh, Jennifer Ashington. Jennifer was the one who founded the, United, uh, the Australian non-government office, non-government off, uh, aid office in Phnom Penh in the mid-80s. She served there for nearly three years in effect, the de facto ambassador for Australia, uh, but running the distribution of Australia's aid into that country. Uh, Jennifer did a sterling job under considerable difficulties, uh, and uh, I first met her there in 1988. I, I note, it should be noted that recently she was employed, appointed by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to, uh, to, uh, to uh, oversee the return of the 300,000 refugees from the Thai border back into Cambodia. And that is a mark uh, of, her of the assessment others have made about her capability. And uh, 
Uh, I, we all wish Jennifer very well for the work that she has done and the work she will be doing in the future. Lyndall McLean, who was uh, Jennifer's successor in the NGO office in uh, Phnom Penh, former, uh, who took leave from the Foreign Affairs Department and is now back in Phnom Penh as the political councillor in our reopened embassy. Lyndall was, a, uh, Lyndall was an outstanding officer, both within the department and in her job with the NGO office. Uh, she did much to educate many of us uh, about the need for a peace, uh, about a peace, a, 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 a peace settlement uh, for Cambodia. Dedicated and passionate, as, as, as was uh, similar to Jennifer, uh, Lyndall deserves full credit from all Australians for the work that she has already done and obviously she will continue to do. Another person uh, who represents uh, Catholic Relief in uh, Phnom Penh, Ernesta Carpini, a Belgian uh, by birth but has represented Australian uh, NGO interests in Phnom Penh through all the 1980s, uh, has uh, uh, played a, st a major role in representing not only uh, the interests of Australian Catholic Relief, but also of Australia, and uh, a passionate supporter of, a, of peace, getting a peace settlement for Cambodia. I believe that uh, those three women in particular are the sort of people who do Australia proud anywhere in the world, and hopefully one day they will get the recognition in Australia for, an appro for appropriate awards. I uh, just want to conclude uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, uh, President, on saying that this statement today indicates that Australia has had a major foreign policy success in its, in its, in its initiatives in Cambodia. There is still a long way to go. There will still be many uh, twists and turns. There will still be many disappointments. And unfortunately, I suspect there will still be many people killed in Cambodia if not deliberately, accidentally, because of the mines and so on that have been left as a result of the long war. But there can be no doubt this has been a major policy achievement of the present government. I think it uh, will stand us in good stead for many years to come. I also take note of many speak speakers' concern that some Australians